Section 36 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Emperor Conrad II, Part 1, by Austin Lane Poole. With the death of Henry II, the Saxon dynasty in the male line became extinct. Nevertheless, under the Ottos, the hereditary principle had become so firmly rooted, the Teutonic theory of election so nearly forgotten, that the descendants of Otto the Great in the female branch were alone regarded as suitable successors to the Emperor Henry II. The choice of the princes was practically limited to the two Conrads, the great-grandsons of the first Otto's daughter, Lutgard, and Conrad of Lorraine. Both were grandsons of Otto, Duke of Carinthia, the future emperor through the eldest son, Henry, who died young, the other, known as Conrad the Younger, through the third son, also named Conrad, who had succeeded his father in the Duchy of Carinthia. This younger Conrad did not inherit the dukedom, which was granted on his father's death in 1011 to Adalbero of Eppenstein, but he acquired nevertheless the greater part of the family estates in Franconia. In wealth and territorial position, he was stronger than his elder cousin. Moreover, since he had adopted the attitude of Henry II in matters of ecclesiastical politics, he could safely rely on the support of the reforming party in the church, which, particularly in Lorraine, carried considerable weight under the guidance of Archbishop Pilgrim of Cologne. An orphan with a meagre inheritance, Brought up by the famous canonist Boichard of Worms, Conrad the Elder had little to recommend him beyond seniority and personal character. Footnote. His father died while he was still a child, and his mother married again and took no further interest in the child of her first husband. End of footnote. On late and unreliable authority, it is asserted that the late emperor designated him as his successor. Footnote. Sigebert, Chronicon Monumenta Germaniae Historica Scriptores, Volume 6, page 356. Hugh of Flavini, Chronicon Volume 2, page 16. Monumenta Germania Historica Scriptores, Volume 8, page 392. It is accepted as historical by Ant, Dival Konrad der Zweite, Dissertation Göttingen, 1861, Maurenbrecher, Königswalen, and others. Breslau, from the silence of contemporaries and the unreliability of the evidence, is led to the conclusion that no such designation was made. Jarlbücher, Konrad II, Volume 1, page 9 and following. Also in Hirsch, Jarlbücher, Heinrich II, Volume 3, page 356, following. Hartung, Studien zur Geschichte Konrads II, attempts to prove that the younger Conrad was designated by Henry II, but see Breslau, Jahrbücher, Exkurs, Volume 2, page 342 and following. End footnote. And though it is reasonable to suppose that Henry II should make some recommendation with regard to the succession, it is at least remarkable that he should select a man whose views, both in ecclesiastical and secular politics, were diametrically opposed to his own. Yet this very fact of his antagonism to the reforming movement induced Aribo, Archbishop of Mainz, and the bulk of the episcopate, jealous and suspicious of the progress of Cluniac ideas in Germany, to throw the whole weight of their influence in support of his candidature. The election took place on the Rhine between Mainz and Wurms on 4th of September, 1024. Footnote. The exact spot is generally said to be Kamba on the right bank of the river near Oppenheim. Schädel, die Königstühle by Mainz und die Wahl Konrads der Zweite, Programm Mainz, 1896, believes the place of election to have been on the left bank near Lörzweiler. With Vipo, Chapter 2, we can leave it De vocabulo et situ loci plenius dicere topographis. Anyhow, sis et citra renum castra locabant. Vipo, reference previously cited. End of footnote. Before it took place, the elder Conrad had a meeting with his cousin and apparently induced him to withdraw from the contest. Conrad the Elder, left in undisputed possession of the field, for the party of his late rival, the Lorrainers, rather than give him their votes, had retired from the assembly. 
was elected unanimously and received from the hands of a widowed empress cunigunda the royal insignia committed by her husband to her care the election was a popular one princes and people spiritual and secular thronged to mainz to attend the coronation festival if charles the great himself had been alive and present writes conrad's enthusiastic biographer the rejoicing could not have been exceeded footnote vipo scriptores rerum germanicarum edited breslau 1915 see also the editor's preface to this edition vipo is the main authority for the reign probably a burgundian by birth he held the office of chaplain to the king and was an eyewitness of many of the events he records End of footnote. The ceremony of coronation was performed on 8th of September by Aribo in the Cathedral of Mainz and was followed by the customary state banquet and by the taking of the oath of fealty by the bishops, nobles, and even, we are told, by other freemen of distinction. One incident marred the general serenity of a proceedings. Conrad's marriage in 1017 with Gisela, the widow successively of Bruno of Brunswick and of Ernest II of Swabia, being within the prohibited degrees was not sanctioned by the church aribo denied her the crown and it was only after an interval of some days that archbishop pilgrim of cologne desirous of making his peace with the king he had opposed offered to perform the ceremony in his cathedral at cologne footnote so breslau volume one pages thirty five to thirty seven and excourse volume three page three hundred and fifty one following the account of helmann of reichenau ten twenty four in breslau's edition of vipo page ninety four other authorities accept the account of the quedlinburg annals that gisela was subsequently crowned by aribo at the intercession of the princes annales quedlinburgensis ten twenty four monumenta germaniae Historica Scriptores, Volume 3, page 90. End of footnote. The princes of Lorraine, among them Gozello and Dietrich, the dukes of the lower and upper provinces, Reginald V, the powerful Count of Hainaut, and the greater number of the bishops had, as we have seen, resisted Conrad's election, and after the event had denied him recognition. The bishops adopted this attitude on account of Conrad's lack of sympathy with the movement of reform in the church. When, however, their leader, the Archbishop of Cologne, made his peace with the king, and when Odilo of Cluny, who had, it seems, been present at the election and had been the recipient of Conrad's first charter, a confirmation of certain lands in Alsace to the Cluniac monastery of Payerne, exerted his influence in Conrad's interest, the bishops were prevailed upon to make their submission. Conrad was therefore able to make his royal progress through Lorraine unhindered. It was customary for a newly elected king to travel through his kingdom, dispensing justice, settling disputes, ordering peace. Within a year of his coronation, he was back in Mainz at the end of August 1025, Conrad had visited the more important towns of the five great duchies of his kingdom. On his journey through Saxony, two significant events occurred. He received the recognition of the Saxon princes and gave a decision against Aribo of Mainz showing thereby that he was not to be swayed from the path of justice even in the interests of the foremost prelate of germany before conrad's election the saxon princes under their duke bernard had assembled at verla and there decided on a course of action similar to that which they had pursued on the occasion of the election of henry the second in ten o two they had it seems absented themselves from the electoral council with the object of making their acceptance of the result dependent upon conditions they required the king to acknowledge the peculiarly independent position the ancient and barbaric law of the saxons they met him at minden where he was keeping his christmas court their condition was proposed and accepted and their homage hitherto deferred was duly performed to their now recognized sovereign footnote this interpretation of the rather confused evidence is breslau's volume one page twelve and note seven compare also his edition of vipo scriptores rerum germanicarum nineteen fifteen page eleven note one and a footnote since the time of otto the third the jurisdiction over the rich nunnery of gandersheim had been the cause of a fierce dispute between the bishops of hildesheim and the archbishops of mainz 
it had been one of the reasons for the breach between Aribo and the late emperor, who had in 1022 decided in favour of the Hildesheim claim. While Conrad remained in Saxony, the matter was brought up before him. The outlook was ominous for Bishop Godehald. Conrad was not likely to give cause for a quarrel with the powerful archbishop to whom he owed his crown and whom he had already favoured by conferring on him the archchancellorship of Italy in addition to the archchancellorship of Germany, which he had previously held. Moreover, the influential abbess Sophia, the daughter of the emperor Otto II, was known to favour the claims of Aribo. On the other hand, Conrad could not lightly reverse a decision made by his predecessor only two years before, and he may also have felt some resentment towards Aribo for the latter's refusal to crown his queen. Postponements and compromises were tried in vain. At last, in March 1025, at a sparsely attended synod held at Grona, a provisional judgment was given in favour of the Bishop of Hildesheim. The decision was confirmed two years later at a more representative gathering at Frankfurt, but it was not until 1030, a year before his death, that Aribo had a meeting with his opponent at Melseburg and finally renounced his claims which, according to the biographer of Godehard, he confessed that he had raised partly in ignorance, partly out of malice. The rebellion which disturbed the opening years of the new reign is closely connected with the question of a Burgundian succession and with a revolt in Lombardy. Rudolf III, the childless king of Burgundy, had in 1016 recognised his nephew, the Emperor Henry II, as the heir to his throne. He maintained, however, and probably with justice, that with the emperor's death, the compact became void. Conrad, on the other hand, took a different view of the case. The session, he argued, was made not to the emperor, but to the empire, to which he had been duly elected. Against him stood a formidable row of descendants of Conrad the Peaceful in the female line, two of whom, Ernest, Duke of Swabia, whose mother Queen Gisela was the niece, and Odo, Count of Blois, whose mother Bertha was the sister of Rudolf, aspired to the inheritance. To make his intentions clear, Conrad, in June 1025, occupied Baal, which, though held by Henry II, actually lay within the confines of a Burgundian kingdom. As his presence was needed elsewhere, he left his wife Gisela, herself a niece of King Rudolf's, to bring the Burgundian question to a satisfactory issue. Footnote. The marriage connection with the Burgundian house constituted, Poupardin concludes, Conrad's title to be designated by Rudolf and to be chosen by the Burgundian princes, but brought with it no actual right of succession. Compare Poupardin, Le Royaume de Bourgogne, page 151. End of footnote. The success of her efforts is to be seen in the Burgundian's king's refusal to assist Ernest of Swabia in his second revolt, 1026, in his submissive attendance at the emperor's coronation at Rome, Easter 1027, and in his recognition at Mutens near Baal, later in the same year, of Conrad's title to succeed to his kingdom. Ernest, whose hopes in Burgundy were shattered by the occupation of Baal, decided to oppose Conrad with arms. He allied himself with Count Welf, with the still disaffected Dukes of Lorraine, and with Conrad the Younger, who, Having heard no more of the proffered rewards by which his cousin had secured his withdrawal from the electoral contest, had openly shown his resentment at Augsburg in the previous April. Footnote. Conrad the Younger stood in the same relation to Rudolf III as did Ernest. His mother, Matilda, was Rudolf's niece. He appears, however, to have raised no claim to the throne of Burgundy. Compare Poupardin, see previous citation. End of footnote. In France, Odo of Blois and Champagne was interested in the downfall of Conrad. In Italy, the trend of events moved in the same direction. There, the Lombards, taking advantage of the death of Henry II, rose in revolt against the imperial domination. The men of Pavia, mindful of the recent destruction of their city at the hands of the late emperor, burnt the royal palace. The North Italian princes, in defiance of Conrad, offered their crown first to King Robert of France, then, on his refusal, to William V, Duke of Aquitaine, who accepted it for his son. The Duke's only hope of success in the dangerous enterprise he had undertaken lay in keeping Conrad engaged in his own kingdom. 
With this object, he set about organizing the opposition in Lorraine, France, and Burgundy. He met Robert of France and Odo of Champagne at Tours, and the French king agreed to carry a campaign into Germany. The combination, so formidable in appearance, dissolved into nothing. Robert was prevented by the affairs of his own kingdom from taking the field against Conrad. Odo, engaged in a fierce feud with Fulk of Anjou, was powerless. William of Aquitaine, on visiting Italy, found the situation there less favourable than he had been led to expect, and thereupon gave up the project. The Dukes of Lorraine, no longer able to count on foreign aid, made their submission to the Emperor at Aix-la-Chapelle, Christmas 1025. After the collapse of the alliance, continued resistance on the part of Ernest was useless. At Augsburg, early in the next year, through the mediation of the Queen, his mother, he was reconciled with Conrad, who, to keep him from further mischief, insisted on his accompanying him on the Italian campaign upon which he was about to embark. It was a wise precaution, and Conrad would have been better advised had he retained his ambitious stepson in his camp. Instead, he dispatched him to Germany to suppress the disorders which had arisen there in his absence. Welf, obdurate in his disobedience, had attacked and plundered the lands and cities of Bruno, Bishop of Augsburg, the brother of the Emperor Henry II, the guardian of the young King Henry III, and the administrator of Germany during the king's absence in Italy. Ernest, back among his old fellow conspirators and acting, no doubt, on the advice of his evil genius, Count Werner of Kyburg, instead of suppressing the rebellious Welf, joined with him in rebellion. Footnote. The attitude of the younger Conrad in this rebellion is ambiguous. Vipo, circa 19, says of him, Nec fidus imperatori, nec tamen multum noxius illi. His submission and condemnation to a short term of imprisonment in 1027, mentioned by Vipo, circa 21, proves his implication. End of footnote. The second revolt of Ernest was, however, as abortive as the first. He invaded Alsace, penetrated into Burgundy, but finding to his discomfiture in Rudolf not an ally but an enemy, he was compelled to make a hasty retreat to Zurich, whence he occupied himself in making plundering raids upon the rich abbeys of Reichenau and St. Gall. Conrad's return soon ended the affair. Ernest and Welf answered the imperial summons to Ulm, July 1027, not, however, a suppliance for the emperor's mercy, but supported by an armed following, with the intention either of dictating their own terms or failing that of fighting their way to safety. The duke had miscalculated his resources. At an interview with his vassals, he discovered his mistake. They were prepared, they said, to follow him as their oath required against any man except the emperor, but loyalty to the emperor took precedence to loyalty to the duke. Ernest had no choice but to throw himself on Conrad's mercy. He was deprived of his duchy and imprisoned in the castle of Gibichenstein near Halle. Welf was condemned to imprisonment to make reparation to the Bishop of Augsburg and to the loss of a countship in the neighbourhood of Brixen. Ernest, after less than a year's captivity, was forgiven and reinstated in his dukedom. But the course of events of 1026 was repeated in 1030. Ordered by the emperor to execute the ban against Count Werner, who had persisted in rebellion, he disobeyed and was, by the judgment of the princes, once more deprived of his dukedom and placed under the ban of the empire, at Ingelheim, Easter 1030. After a vain attempt to persuade Odo of Champagne to join him, he and Werner withdrew into the Black Forest, where, making the strong castle of Falkenstein their headquarters, they lived for a time the life of bandits. At last, in August, the two rebels fell in a fierce encounter with the emperor's troops under Count Manigold. The rebellions of Ernest, dictated not by any dissatisfaction at Conrad's rule, but rather by personal motives and rival ambitions, never assumed dangerous proportions. The fact that even the nobility of Swabia, with few exceptions, refused to follow their duke is significant of the strength and popularity of Conrad's government. The loyalty of Germany as a whole was never shaken. Duke Ernest, a little undeservedly perhaps, has become the hero of legend and romance. He has often been compared with Ludolf of Swabia, the popular and ambitious son of Otto the Great. The parallel is scarcely a fair one. 
Theodolf rebelled but once and with juster cause, and after his defeat he lived loyally and died fighting his father's battles in Italy. Ernest, though twice forgiven, lived and died a rebel. In September 1032, Rudolf III ended a weak and inglorious reign. Conrad had been solemnly recognized as heir by the late king at Muttenz five years before and had been entrusted with the royal insignia, the crown and the lance of St. Maurice. Some of the Burgundian nobles had even already taken the oath of allegiance to the German king, but the majority both of the ecclesiastical and secular lords, especially in the Romance-speaking district of the south, stood opposed to him. His powerful rival, Odo, Count of Blois and Champagne, had at first the advantage, for Conrad at the critical moment was busily occupied with the affairs of Poland, and when, after the submission of the Polish Duke Mesco, he hastened to Strasbourg, he found a large part of Burgundy already in the hands of the enemy, Christmas 1032. In spite of the severity of the weather, which was sufficiently remarkable to supply the theme of a poem of a hundred stanzas from a pen of Vipo, the emperor decided to make a winter campaign into Burgundy. He marched on Bâle and proceeded to Payerne, where he was formally elected and crowned by his partisans, but the indescribable sufferings of his troops from the cold prevented his further progress, and he withdrew to Zurich. In the spring, before resuming operations in Burgundy, he entered into negotiations with the French king Henry I, which resulted in a meeting of the two at Deville on the Meuse. What actually took place there is not recorded, but it seems clear that an alliance against Odo was formed between them. Again, the affairs of Poland prevented Conrad from completing his task, and on his return thence he found that his adversary had penetrated the German frontier and plundered the districts of Lorraine in the neighbourhood of Toul. Conrad retaliated with the raid into Count Odo's territory and brought him to submission. The latter renounced his claims, agreed to evacuate the occupied district, and to make reparation for the damage caused by his incursion into Lorraine. The matter was not, however, so easily settled. Not only did Odo not evacuate the occupied parts of Burgundy, nor make satisfaction for the harm he had perpetrated in Lorraine, but he even had the audacity to repeat his performance in that country. Conrad determined on a decisive effort. Burgundy was attacked on two sides. His Italian allies, Marquis Boniface of Tuscany and Archbishop Aribert of Milan, under the guidance of Count Humbert of Maurienne, led their troops across the great St. Bernard, and following the Rhone Valley, made their junction with the Emperor, operating from the north, at Geneva. Little resistance was encountered by either army. At Geneva, Conrad was again solemnly recognized as king, and received the submission of the greater number of Odo's adherents. The town of Marat alone held out defiantly. Attacked by the German and Italian forces in conjunction, it was taken by assault and demolished. With it were destroyed the last hopes of Conrad's adversaries. They submitted, and Burgundy, furnishing the emperor with his fourth crown, became an undisputed and integral part of the imperial dominions. If Burgundy was never a source of much strength or financial profit to the empire, its inclusion was by no means without its value. Its geographical position as a barrier between France and Italy, and as commanding the western passes of the Alps, made it an acquisition of the first importance. In the last year of his reign, Conrad visited his new kingdom. A solemn and well-attended gathering of ecclesiastical and secular nobles assembled at Soleur, and for three days deliberated over the means of establishing peace and organized government in a land which for many a year had known nothing but lawlessness and anarchy. End of section 36section 37 of the cambridge medieval history volume 3 germany and the western empire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by ted leinhart the cambridge medieval history volume 3 germany and the western empire the emperor conrad the second part 2 by Austin Lane Poole. The Eastern Frontier 
During the years 1030 to 1035, Conrad was chiefly occupied with the restless state of the eastern frontier of his kingdom. It is a dreary story of rebellion, ineffective campaigns, fratricidal wars. Poland, Hungary, Bohemia, the Wendish lands to the northeast demanded in turn the emperor's attention. Boleslav Chobry had, during the previous reign, been assiduously building up a strong position for himself in Poland. In the Peace of Bautzen, 1018, he had been the chief gainer at the expense of the empire. On the death of Henry II, he had taken a further step and boldly assumed the title of king. Conrad was neither strong enough nor at liberty to deal at once with this presumptuous duke, but while at Merseburg in February 1025, he took the wise precaution of securing the loyalty of the neighboring Slavonic tribes of the Liutici and the Obatrites. In the summer, Boleslav died. His younger son, Mesko, having successfully driven his elder brother Otto Bezprim to Russia, or perhaps Hungary, assumed the kingship and the policy of his father. By 1028, his aggressions had become intolerable. The eastern parts of Saxony were raided and plundered. The bishopric of Zeitz suffered so severely that it had to be removed to the better fortified Naumburg, a town of Eckhard of Meissen, near the junction of the Unstrut and the Saal. The Liutizi, helplessly at the mercy of the tyrannical Mesco, pleaded for German assistance. Conrad assembled an army beyond the Elbe, but the campaign was a complete failure. The troops were scattered and worn out by long marches through forests and swamps. Bautzen was besieged, but not captured, and the emperor, despairing of making any headway, withdrew to Saxony. The only success was achieved by Conrad's ally, Bratislav, the son of the Duke of Bohemia, who managed to recover Moravia from the Poles. The death of Thietmar, Margrave of the East Mark, January 1030, was the occasion for another and more serious incursion on the part of the Polish prince, united this time with a band of disloyal Saxons. In the region between the Elbe and the Saal, a hundred villages are said to have been destroyed by fire, more than 9,000 men and women taken into captivity. The enemy were only beaten off by the courage and resource of Count Dietrich of Wetten. Conrad was unable to take the matter in hand, for he was engaged in a war with Stephen of Hungary. The relations between the latter country and the empire had been growing yearly more strained. Werner, Bishop of Strasbourg, Conrad's ambassador to Constantinople in 1027, had been denied a passage through Hungary and was compelled to take the more hazardous route by sea. The Bavarian nobles, no doubt, gave ample provocation for this hostile attitude by their attempts to extend their possessions across the Fischa, the boundary at that time between Germany and Hungary. According to one account, the actual cause for quarrel arose through the emperor's refusal to grant, at the request of King Stephen, the dukedom of Bavaria to his son Henry. He was the nephew of the emperor Henry II, whose sister Gisela had married Stephen of Hungary. In 1030, Conrad took the field against him. This, like the Polish campaign, was a miserable disaster. Conrad did no more than ravage the border country as far as the Rab and retired with an army imperiled by famine, while the Hungarians pursued the retreating Germans and captured Vienna, which celebrated city is now for the first time mentioned under this name. Bratislav, who had gained the only success in the Polish campaign of the previous year, was again conspicuous for his services to the empire. He defeated the Hungarians and devastated their country as far as the town of Gran. The young King Henry, who as Duke of Bavaria was closely concerned with the affairs of Hungary, was entrusted with the settlement of the quarrel with King Stephen. By the cession of a small tract of country lying between the Fischa and the Lytha, he secured, in the spring of 1031, peace and the restoration of Vienna. Conrad, relieved of danger from Hungary, was at liberty to cope effectively with the troublesome Duke of Poland. 
Allied with Mesco's banished brother Otto, Conrad organized a combined attack. While he advanced from the west, Otto Bezprim and his protector Yaroslav, prince of Kiev, were to attack from the east. Mesco, thus threatened from two sides, soon gave way and agreed to the terms stipulated by the emperor. He was required to surrender the border territory which his father had acquired by the Treaty of Bautzen, 1018, the prisoners and booty captured in the raids upon Saxony, and also the upper and lower Lausitz, which were attached respectively to the Meisen and the East Marks. Poland was thus once more confined within the limits of the old duchy, as it was before the ascendancy of Boleslav Trobry. The attack of Bezprim had not synchronized with that of the German troops. It took place after this peace had been concluded. He too, however, was successful. He drove Mesco from the throne, of which he himself took possession, and by recognizing the overlordship of the emperor, was himself recognized as the lawful duke of Poland. His reign, characterized by the most brutal savagery, was cut short in the next year, 1032, by assassination, engineered in part by the enemies he had made in his own circle, in part by the intrigues of the brother he had expelled. Mesco promptly returned from Bohemia, where he had taken refuge with Duke Udelrich. In spite of his apparent willingness to enter into friendly relations with the emperor, we hear of a renewed outbreak of war before the end of the year. But Conrad was anxious to rid himself of the vexatious business and to be free to make good his claim to the Burgundian crown. He therefore received the duke's submission at Merseburg, 1033, and allowed him to retain his dukedom, subject to his feudal superiority and reduced in extent by a strip of territory on the western frontier, which was annexed to the east mark. The power of Poland was crushed. On Mesco's death in 1034, the country relapsed into an almost chronic state of civil war in which Conrad, wearied with Polish affairs, was careful not to involve himself. In the meanwhile, difficulties had been growing up in the neighboring country of Bohemia. Udelrich, for some years past, had shown insubordination to his feudal lord. In 1031, he had refused his help for the Polish campaign. Summoned to the Diet of Merseburg, July 1033, to answer for his conduct, he had defiantly remained absent. Conrad was too busily engaged with Odo, his rival to the Burgundian throne, to deal himself with his disobedient vassal. He entrusted the task, therefore, to his son Henry, now a promising youth of sixteen years. His confidence was not misplaced, for a single campaign in the summer brought the duke to subjection. At a court held at Verben, he was condemned, banished, and deprived of his lands. His brother, the old Duke Jeremir, was dragged from his prison at Utrecht, where he had languished for more than twenty years, to be set again over the Duchy of Bohemia. The arrangement was, however, not a permanent one. Udo Rich was pardoned at Ratisbonne, April 1034, but not content with the partial restoration of his duchy. He seized and blinded his hapless brother. His misdeeds brought a speedy retribution. He died the same year, choked or perhaps poisoned while eating his dinner. Jeremir was disinclined a third time to undertake the title and duties which had brought him only misfortune. At his wish, Bratislav, who had in the whole deserved well of Conrad, received the dukedom as a fief of the empire. Further north, a feud had broken out between the Saxon and the Wendish tribe, the Leotizi, which gave rise to mutual incursions and plundering. At the request of both parties, the emperor permitted the issue to be determined by the judgment of God in the form of a duel. Unluckily, the Christian champion fell wounded to the sword of the pagan. The decision was accepted by the emperor, and the winds, so elated by their success, would have forthwith attacked their Saxon opponents had not they been constrained by oath to keep the peace and been menaced by the establishment at Verben 
of a fortress strongly garrisoned by a body of Saxon knights. But the peace was soon broken, the fortress soon captured, and two expeditions across the Elbe, 1035 and 1036, were necessary before the Liutizi were reduced to obedience. In the first, Conrad was seldom able to bring the enemy to an open fight. They retreated before him into the impenetrable swamps and forests, while the Germans burnt their cities, devastated their lands. We have a picture from Wipo of the emperor standing oftentimes thigh deep in the morass, fighting himself and encouraging his men to battle. The punishment meted out to the prisoners captured in this exploit leaves an indelible stain on the otherwise upright character of the emperor. In their heathen fanaticism, they had sacrilegiously mutilated the figure of Christ on a crucifix. Conrad avenged the outrage in like fashion. Drawn up before the cross they had dishonored, their eyes put out, their hands and feet hacked off, they were left to die miserably. The second attack, of which the details are not recorded, appears to have been decisive. The Wends submitted and had to pay the penalty for their revolt at the price of an increased tribute. The wisdom of Conrad's diplomacy is perhaps most evident in his relations with his powerful northern neighbor Canute, King of England, Denmark, and in 1030, Norway. Had Conrad permitted the hostility which had existed under his predecessor to continue, he would have found in Canute a formidable opponent, always ready to disturb the stability of the imperial authority on the northeastern border of Germany. His policy towards Poland, Bohemia, and more especially the Wendish country across the Elbe could scarcely have met with so large a measure of success. The rulers of Poland and Denmark were closely related, both countries were at enmity with Germany. An alliance between them seemed natural and inevitable. Thus, Conrad lost no time in bringing about, through the mediation of Unwan, Archbishop of Bremen, friendly relations with Canute, 1025. This alliance was drawn closer some ten years later by the marriage of their children, Henry and Gunhild, and by the cession to the Danish king of the March and the town of Schleswig. Though the German frontier was thereby brought back to the Eider, the gain outweighed the loss. Canute was zealous for the advancement of the Christian religion. He kept in close touch with the metropolitans of Bremen, Unwan, and his successors, and promoted their efforts towards the conversion of the heathen. From Germany, he drew churchmen to fill high positions in his English kingdom, as, for instance, Duduco, Bishop of Wells, and Wichmann, abbot of Ramsey. Unfortunately, this powerful and useful ally of the empire survived the Treaty of 1035 but a few months. He died in November of the same year, and the Danish ascendancy soon crumbled away under the rule of his successors. End of section 37. Section 38 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Emperor Conrad II. Part 3 by Austin Lane Poole Italy under Conrad II We have already noticed how the death of the Emperor Henry II had been the signal in Italy for a general revolt against the imperial authority. For this movement, which found its expression in the burning of the royal palace at Pavia and in the offer of the Lombard crown to a French prince, the great noble families of North Italy, the Otbertines, the Alaramids, the Marcuses of Tuscany and of Turin were mainly responsible. On the other hand, the bishops under Aribert, the powerful Archbishop of Milan, stood by Conrad. Indeed, Aribert, with several other bishops, presenting himself before the new king at Constance, June 1025, assured him of his loyalty, 
of his willingness to crown him king of Italy and of the warm reception that awaited him when he should set foot across the Alps. Other Italian lords appeared a little later at Zurich to perform their homage. Encouraged by these manifestations of loyalty and by the collapse of the attempt of the lay aristocracy to raise a French prince to the throne, Conrad made his plans for an Italian expedition in the ensuing spring. By the route through the Brenner and Verona, in March he reached Milan, where, since Pavia, the old Lombard capital and place of coronation, was still in revolt, he was crowned by Aribert in the Cathedral of St. Ambrose. The Pavis, fearful of the result of their boldness, had sought pardon from Conrad at Constance, but their refusal to rebuild the palace they had destroyed prevented a reconciliation. Conrad punished them by a wholesale devastation of the surrounding country, and leaving part of his army to complete the subjection of the rebellious city, he passed eastward through Piacenza and Cremona to Ravenna. Here his stay was marked by a scene of the wildest uproar. The citizens rose against the German soldiers with the hope that by force of numbers they might succeed in driving them from the town. Their hope was vain. The imperial troops soon gained the upper hand, and Conrad descended from his bedchamber to stop the slaughter of the defeated and defenseless burghers. The incident, related by Wipo, of the German knight who lost his leg in the riot is characteristic of the king's generosity. He ordered the leather gaiters of the wounded warrior to be filled with coin by way of compensation for the loss of his limb. The heat of the Italian summer drove Conrad northward to pass some two months in the cooler and more healthy atmosphere of the Alpine valleys. The autumn and winter were spent in reducing to submission the powerful houses of the northwest and of Tuscany. This accomplished, Conrad could proceed unhindered to Rome. The coronation of Conrad and his wife Gisela at the hands of Pope John the Nineteenth took place on Easter Day, 26 March 1027, at St. Peter's, in the presence of two kings, Canute and Rodolph and a vast gathering of German and Italian princes and bishops. Seldom during the early Middle Ages was an imperial or papal election altogether free from riot and bloodshed. Conrad's was no exception. A trivial dispute over an ox hide converted a brilliant and festive scene into a tumultuous street fight between the Romans and the foreigners. A synod was held shortly after at the Lateran, in which two disputes were brought up for decision. The one, a question of precedence between the archbishops of Milan and Ravenna, was settled in favor of the former. In the other, the long-standing quarrel between the patriarchs of Aquileia and Grado, the former triumphed. The see of Grado was made subject to the patriarch of Aquileia, and the Venetians were thereby deprived of their ecclesiastical independence. In South Italy, Conrad accepted the existing state of things without involving himself further in the complexity of Greek and Lombard politics. He contented himself merely with the homage of the princes of Capua, Benevento, and Salerno. By the summer, he was once again in Germany. In a little more than a year, the emperor had succeeded in winning the obedience of the north, the recognition of the south, of Italy, a position with which he might reasonably rest satisfied. An interval of ten years divides the two expeditions of Conrad across the Alps, and the second was made at the request of the Italians themselves. But he had motives of his own for intervention in the affairs of Italy in 1036. His policy had been to strengthen German influence in two ways. First, by the appointment of German clergy to vacant Italian bishoprics, and secondly, by encouraging the intermarriage of the German and Italian princely houses. So Gebhard of Eichstätt received the archbishopric of Ravenna, while the majority of the suffragan sees in the province of Aquileia, and not a few in Tuscany, were filled with Germans. The success of the latter policy is exemplified by the marriages of Azo of the Otbertine family with the Welfic heiress Cunegunda, of Hermann of Swabia with Adelaide of the House of Turin, of Boniface of Tuscany with Beatrix, the daughter of Duke Frederick of Upper Lorraine. 
Such a policy ran counter to the ambition of the Archbishop of Milan, who for his part strove to exercise an overlordship in Lombardy, and it was said disposed of the whole kingdom at his nod. Such a man must be suppressed if Conrad was to maintain his authority in Italy. The immediate situation, however, which precipitated the emperor's expedition was due to the feud which had arisen between the smaller and greater tenants, the Valvasores and the Capitani. While the hereditary principle was in practice secured to the latter, it was denied by them to the former. It was customary for the Italian nobles to have houses and possessions in the neighboring town where they lived for some part of the year. A dispute of this kind thus affected the towns no less than the country. In Milan, one of the Vavasors was deprived of his fief by the domineering archbishop. It was sufficient to kindle the sparks of revolution into a blaze. Negotiations failed to pacify the incensed knights, who were thereupon driven from their city by the combined force of the Capitani and the Burgers. The Milanese Vavasors, joined by their social equals from the surrounding districts, after a hard fight and heavy losses, defeated their opponents in the Campo Malo between Milan and Lodi. It was at this stage that both parties sought the mediation of the emperor. Conrad had watched with interest the turn of events in Italy, and certainly as early as July 1036 decided to visit Italy for the second time. The appeal of the opposing parties, therefore, came very opportunely. If Italy hungers for law, I will satisfy her, he remarked on receiving the news. He crossed the Brenner in December, spent Christmas at Verona, and reached Milan early in the new year. On the day following his arrival, a popular rising occurred, which was imputed, not without some reason, to the instigation of Erebert. Lacking confidence in his strength to deal with the situation in the stronghold of his enemies, Conrad decided that all questions of difference should be determined at a diet to be held at Pavia in March. Here, numerous complaints were brought against the arrogant archbishop, foremost amongst his accusers being Hugh, a member of the Otbertine family, who held the countship of Milan. The emperor demanded redress. The archbishop defiantly refused to comply. Conrad, judging his conduct treasonable, took the high-handed measure of thrusting him into prison under the custody of Popo, patriarch of Aquileia, and Conrad, duke of Corinthia. Popo, however, was not sufficiently watchful of his important prisoner and suffered for his negligence the displeasure of the emperor. A certain monk, Albizo by name, had been allowed to share with his lord the hardships of prison. Through his agency, escape was effected. One night, while the faithful Albizo feigned sleep in the bed of the archbishop, the sheets drawn close over his head to prevent recognition, Erebert, in the harmless guise of a monk, passed safely through his jailers, mounted a horse waiting in readiness, and rode in haste to Milan where he was welcomed with enthusiasm by the patriotic burghers. With reinforcements brought by his son from Germany, Conrad besieged Milan, but without much success. It amounted only to some indecisive fighting, the storming of a few strongholds, the devastation of the surrounding country. But if the siege of Milan produced little military result, it drew forth the most important constitutional act of the reign, one of the most famous documents of feudal law, the Edict of 28 May 1037. This celebrated decree solved the question at issue between the greater and the smaller vassals. As in Germany, Conrad had shown himself in sympathy with the small tenants. So in Italy, he now secured to them and to their successors the possession of their lands against unjust and arbitrary eviction by their lords. No vassal of a bishop, abbot, abbess, marcus, count, or of anyone holding an imperial or ecclesiastical fief shall be deprived of it without certain and proved guilt, except according to the constitution of our ancestors and by the judgment of his peers. The next two clauses deal with the rights of appeal against the verdict of the peers. In the case of the greater vassals, the hearing may be brought before the emperor himself, 
in the case of the smaller, either before the overlords or before the emperor's missi for determination. Then the succession of the fief is secured to the son, to the grandson by a son, or these failing, to the brother. Alienation or exchange without the tenant's consent is prohibited. The emperor's right to the fodrum, as it was taken by our ancestors, is affirmed. Finally, a penalty of a hundred pounds of gold to be paid half to the imperial treasury, half to the injured party, is enjoined for disobedience. By these concessions, the emperor bound to his interest the strongest and most numerous military class in North Italy, and at the same time struck a blow at the dangerously powerful position of the Lombard Episcopate. The heat of the summer prevented any serious campaigning for some months. The siege of Milan was raised, the army dispersed. The emperor, however, did not relinquish his efforts to overthrow the Archbishop of Milan. In spite of the remonstrances of his son and many others, he took the unprecedented step of deposing Aribert without reference to an ecclesiastical synod. The papacy was weak and submissive. John the Nineteenth had allowed himself to be inscribed in a document among the fidelis of the emperor. He was now dead, 1033, and his nephew, a bad man certainly, but not so bad as he is painted in the scurrilous party literature of the succeeding generation, young perhaps, but not the mere boy of twelve he is usually accounted, was raised to the pontificate under the name of Benedict the Ninth. He, no doubt, cared little for the duties incumbent on his office. At all events, when he visited the emperor at Cremona, he made no protest against the uncanonical action of Conrad. Aribert retaliated by organizing a conspiracy with Conrad's enemy and late rival for the throne of Burgundy, Odo of Blois. But it soon collapsed. After two incursions into Lorraine, Odo was defeated and killed at Bar on 15 November 1037 by Duke Gozello. The three Lombard bishops of Vercelli, Cremona, and Piacenza, who were implicated, were banished to Germany. Towards the end of the year, Conrad again took the field, this time with the object of ordering the affairs of the southern principalities. On his march southward, the burghers of Parma revolted and were punished by the destruction of their city, Christmas. At Spello, the emperor had another interview with the pope, who now imposed the sentence of excommunication on the Archbishop of Milan, Easter 1038. It was probably also on this occasion that a constant source of confusion and trouble in the Roman courts was removed. This was the indiscriminate use of Lombard and Roman law, which gave rise to endless disputes between Lombard and Roman judges. The emperor's edict now established that in Rome and Roman territory, all cases should be determined according to Roman law. Conrad made the initial mistake in 1024 of liberating, at the request of Guimar, Prince of Salerno, Pandulf, Pandulf IV of Capua, the Wolf of the Abruzzi, as Amy of Monte Cassino calls him, who had been captured in Henry II's campaign of 1022 and since been held a close prisoner. This act led to the recrudescence of Byzantine power in South Italy, for Pandolf kept on friendly terms with the Greek government. The Catapan Bohannes at once set to work to put his valuable ally in possession of his old principality, and in this he was assisted by Guimar of Salerno, who with lavish grants bought the support of some Norman adventurers under Ranulf. This formidable combination made their first task the capture of Capua. The town fell after a siege of 18 months. Paldolf V of Taino surrendered, and Paldolf IV was restored. This was the situation that Conrad was forced to recognize on his first Italian expedition in April 1027. But Paldolf was not content with the mere recovery of his former possessions. On the death of Guimar, the only effective rival to his power, he sought to extend his frontiers at the expense of his neighbors. He captured Naples by treachery and drove out its duke, Sergius IV. The latter was restored two years later by the aid of the Norman bands of Ranulf, 
In reward for this service, Ranu was invested with the territory of Aversa, 1030, the nucleus of the Norman power in South Italy, which was to be in the succeeding centuries one of the most important factors in the history of Europe. Ranulf, a skillful but entirely unscrupulous ruler, soon deserted his benefactor and allied himself with Paldolf, who was now at the height of his power. The latter's rule, however, became daily more intolerable, and a body of malcontents, joined soon by the renegade Ranulf, taking advantage of a quarrel between Paldolf and Guimar IV of Salerno, decided to appeal for the intervention of the emperors of the East and the West. No response came from Constantinople. Conrad, however, already in Italy, accepted the invitation. Seemingly at Troia, the emperor entered into negotiations with Paldolf, ordered him to restore the property of the Abbey of Monte Cassino, which he had seized, and to release the prisoners he had captured. Paldolf, on his part, sent his wife and son to ask for peace, offering 300 pounds of gold in two payments, and his son and daughter as hostages. The terms were accepted, the first half of the indemnity paid, then the son escaped. Paldolf changed his attitude, refused to carry out the rest of his bargain, and withdrew to the castle of St. Agatha. Conrad, in the meantime, entered Capua without resistance and invested Guimar with the principality. Capua and Salerno were thus once more united in one hand as they had been under Paldolf Ironhead in the days of Otto II. At the same time, Conrad officially recognized the new Norman colony at Aversa as a fief of the Prince of Salerno. His work in the south completed, the emperor returned northward. On the march, the troops suffered severely from the heat. Pestilence broke out in the camp, and many, among them Queen Gunhild and Hermann, Duke of Swabia, perished. Conrad himself was overcome with sickness. Under these circumstances, it was impossible to renew the siege of Milan. Leaving, therefore, injunctions with the Italian princes to make an annual devastation of the Milanese territory, the emperor made his way back to Germany. Conrad never recovered his strength. At Nimegen in February 1039, he was overcome by a more severe attack of the gout. In May, he was well enough to be removed to Utrecht, where he celebrated the Whitsun Festival. But he grew rapidly worse and died the following day, 4 June. His embalmed body was borne through Mayans and Worms to Spears, the favorite city of the Salian emperors, and was buried in the crypt of its cathedral church. Conrad, once he had gained the mastery in his kingdom, was determined to secure the inheritance to his son. He was not only the first, but by a definite policy the founder of the Salian dynasty. So at Augsburg in 1026, he designated his youthful son Henry, a boy of nine years old, as his successor. His choice was approved by the princes, and the child was duly crowned at Aix-la-Chapel in 1028. The theory of hereditary succession seems to have been a guiding principle in the policy of Conrad II. He had suffered himself from the absence of it, for his uncle, the younger brother of his father, had acquired the Corinthian dukedom of his grandfather, and on his death it had passed out of the family altogether to the total disregard not only of his own claims, but also of those of his cousin, the younger Conrad, the son of the late duke. Adelbiru of Eppenstein must, in his eyes, have been looked upon as an interloper. Personal wrongs doubtless biased his judgment when the Duke of Corinthia was charged with treasonable designs at the Diet of Bamberg in 1035. Adelborough was deposed and sentenced to the loss of his fiefs. The court witnessed a strange scene before the verdict was obtained, the ascent of the young King Henry as Duke of Bavaria, was deemed necessary, and this the latter steadfastly refused to give. He was bound, he afterwards explained, by an oath to Attleborough taken at the instance of his tutor, Bishop Egelbert of Friesing. Entreaties and threats availed nothing. The son was obdurate, and the emperor was so incensed with passion that he fell senseless to the floor. 
When he recovered consciousness, he again approached his son, humbled himself at his feet, and finally, by this somewhat undignified act, gained his end. But the successor to the fallen duke was well chosen. It was the emperor's cousin, Conrad, who thus, at this late hour, stepped into the dukedom of his father, 1036. It was not his aim, however, as sometimes has been suggested, to crush the ducal power. In one instance, indeed, he greatly strengthened it. A powerful lord was required in the vulnerable borderland of Lorraine. It was a wise step to reunite the two provinces on the death of Frederick, 1033, in the hands of Gozello. In the case of Swabia, the hereditary principle prevailed. The rebellious Ernest, who fell in the fight in the Black Forest, had no direct heir. Snappish whelps seldom have puppies, Conrad remarked on receiving the news of his death, but he had a brother, and that brother succeeded. When the hereditary line failed, Conrad followed the policy of Otto the Great of drawing the dukedoms into his own family. In this way, his son Henry acquired Bavaria after the death of Henry of Luxembourg, 1026, and Swabia on the death of Hermann in Italy, 1038. In Italy, as we have seen, he definitely established by a legislative act the principle of hereditary fiefs for the smaller and greater vassals alike. There is no such decree for Germany. None, at least, has come down to us. Yet there are indications which suggest that the emperor, perhaps by legal decision in the courts, perhaps by the acceptance of what was becoming a common usage, sanctioned, indeed encouraged, the growing tendency. Instances multiply of sons succeeding father without question or dispute. Families become so firmly established in their possessions that they frequently adopt the name of one of their castles. Weepo remarks that Conrad won the hearts of the vassals because he would not suffer their heirs to be deprived of the ancient fiefs of their forebears. Too much weight may not be placed on this statement, but it is certain that Conrad could rely in a marked degree upon the loyalty of the local nobles. In the revolt of Ernest, the nobility of Swabia supported not their duke, but their king. Adalbero, after his deposition, found himself unable to raise his late subjects to rebellion. Such loyalty was unusual in the earlier Middle Ages, and it seems a natural conclusion that these knights of Swabia and Corinthia had reason to stand by Conrad. From this rank of society, the emperor reinforced that body of officials, the ministeriales, who later came to play so important a part at the courts of the Salian emperors. Conrad's gallant and faithful friend and advisor, Werner, who lost his life in the riot at Rome, which followed the imperial coronation, and who earned the honor of a grave beside the Emperor Otto II at St. Peter's, is perhaps the first, as he is a typical representative of this influential class. Conrad II is usually depicted as the illiterate layman, the complete antithesis to the saintly Henry who preceded him. Undoubtedly, he sought from the outset of his reign to emancipate himself from the overweening power of the church. He decided questions relating to the church on his own authority, often without reference to a church synod. He kept a firm hold on episcopal elections. He appointed his bishops and expected a handsome gratuity from the man of his choice. From Udorich, elected to the See of Basel in 1025, we are frankly told that the king and queen received an immense sum of money. Wipo adds that the king was afterwards smitten with repentance and swore an oath never again to take money for a bishopric or abbacy, an oath which he almost succeeded in keeping. In truth, the oath weighed but lightly on his conscience and affected his practice not at all. If, however, he did nothing to promote, he did little to hinder reform. More than one of his charters bestows lands on Cluniac houses, and by including the Kingdom of Burgundy, a stronghold of the reforming movement in the empire, he insensibly advanced a cause with which he was out of sympathy. The leaders of the reforming party, Richard, abbot of St. Vaughan at Verdun, and Papo, abbot of Stablo, Stavelot, made steady of slow progress in their work, 
which met with the sympathetic encouragement of the Empress Gisela. The ruins of the picturesque Benedictine Abbey of Limburg and the magnificent Cathedral of Spears remind us that the thoughts of Conrad, who once at least is described as most pious, sometimes rose above things merely temporal. Conrad, above all, realized the importance of increasing the material resources on which the empire depended. By careful administration, he increased the revenue from the crown lands. He revoked gifts made to the church by his two generous predecessors and allocated to himself domain lands which had fallen into the hands of the dukes. The reign of Conrad was a time of prosperity for Germany. He encouraged the small beginnings of municipal activity by grants of mint and market rights. The peace was better kept. To Conrad, the cause of justice came first among the functions of royalty. A story is told of how the coronation procession was interrupted by the complaints of a peasant, a widow, and an orphan, and how Conrad, without hesitation and in spite of the remonstrances of his companions, delayed the ceremony in order to award justice to the plaintiffs. Stern, inexorable justice is a strong trait in his character. This strong, capable, efficient ruler did much for his country. The allurements of Italy, the mysteries of empire, had led his predecessors to neglect the true interests of Germany. It is to his credit that he restored the strength of the German monarchy and increased enormously the personal influence and authority of the crown. He prepared the way for his son, under whom the Holy Roman Empire reached the apogee of its greatness. End of section 38. Section 39 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Emperor Henry III, Part 1, by Caroline M. Riley. The reign of Henry III is the summit of the older German imperialism. The path uphill had been made by the persevering energy of the Saxon kings and emperors. Under Henry's successors, the empire rushed, though with glory, into ruin. Henry himself, sane, just, and religious, has the approval of reason, but could never have raised the white-hot zeal and the fiercer hatred which burned round the Hornstaufen. His father and mother were among those rare men and women who wrest from circumstances their utmost profit. Conrad, trained by adversity, attempting nothing vaguely or rashly, almost invariably attained his object and left the East Frankish Empire stronger within and without than ever before. His education of his son in statecraft was thorough and strenuous. Very early he made him a sharer in his power, and then showed neither mistrust nor jealousy, even when faced by markedly independent action. Henry, for his part, though he judged adversely some of his father's conduct, honoured him and kept his memory in affection. Henry's mother, Gisela, of the blood of Charlemagne of the royal house of Burgundy and heiress of Swabia, used fortune as Conrad used adversity. To power and wealth she added great beauty, force of character and mind. Her influence is seen in the fervorance of learning and of the writing of chronicles. It was to her that Henry owed his love of books, and she made of her son the most learned of kings. Gisela's share in public affairs during her husband's reign was considerable, even taking into account the important part habitually assigned to the emperor's consort. Under Henry III, the part of the empress, mother, or consort in the empire begins to dwindle, and there are indications of misunderstandings later between her and Henry. The chronicler Hermann of Reichenau speaks of Gisela dying, disappointed by the sayings of soothsayers, who had foretold that she should survive her son. Conspicuous in Henry's early circle was his Burgundian tutor, Vipo, the biographer of Conrad and the staunch admirer of Gisela. According to Vipo, a king's first business is to keep the law, among the influences which were brought to bear upon Henry in his youth, that of Vipo cannot be overlooked. 
Henry was a boy of seven when, at Kempen in 1024, Conrad was elected king. In 1026, Conrad, before setting out on his coronation expedition into Italy, named Henry as his successor and gave him in charge to an acute and experienced statesman, Bishop Bruno of Augsburg, brother of the late emperor and cousin to the Empress Gisela. The energy with which Bruno held views different from those of his brother had, in the last reign, led him into conspiracy and exile. With the same independence in church matters, he, alone in the Mainz province, had taken no part in the collective action of the bishops against Benedict VIII. From such a guardian, Henry was bound to receive a real political education. Under his care, Henry attended his father's coronation in Rome. Three months later, Conrad, in accordance with his policy of the absorption of the old national duchies, gave to Henry the Duchy of Bavaria, vacated by the death of Henry of Luxembourg. Then, on Easter Day 1028, in the old royal Frankish city of Aix-la-Chapelle, Henry, after unanimous election by the princes and acclamation by clergy and people, was at the age of eleven crowned king by Pilgrim of Cologne. In the inscription Space Imperii on a leaden seal of Henry's in 1028, Steindorf sees an indication that this election at X implied the election to the empire. He draws attention also to the title King, used of Henry before his imperial coronation in the Acts, emanating from the imperial chancery in Italy, as well as in those purely German, and to the fact that Henry was never re-crowned as King of Italy. He argues, therefore, that contemporaries regarded the act of Aix-la-Chapelle as binding the whole of Conrad's dominions, and as a matter of fact, this cannot be doubted. On the death of Bishop Bruno in April 1029, Henry, whose place as its duke was in Bavaria, was placed in charge of a Bavarian, Bishop Egelbert of Freising. Egelbert had, in the early years of Henry II's reign, taken active part in public affairs, but of late he had devoted himself chiefly to provincial and ecclesiastical duties. Under him, Henry played his first part as independent ruler, basing his actions on motives of justice rather than on those of policy. Conrad, in 1030, had led an unsuccessful expedition into Hungary. He was planning a new expedition when Henry, still a child, taking counsel with the Bavarian princes but not with his father, received the envoys of St. Stephen and granted peace. Acting with wisdom and justice, says Vipo, towards a king who, though unjustly attacked, was the first to seek reconciliation. In 1031, Henry was present with his father in the decisive campaign against the Poles. In 1032, Rudolf of Burgundy died after a long and feeble rule. Conrad, though he snatched a coronation, had still to fight for his new kingdom against the Nationalist and Romance Party supporting Odo II, Eudis of Champagne, and throughout 1032 the imperial diplomas point to Henry's presence with his father, in company with the Empress and Bishop Egelbert. In the following years, Henry was deputed to act against the Slavs of the Northeast and against Bratislav of Bohemia. In these, his first independent campaigns, he succeeded in restoring order. In August 1034, Conrad was fully recognised as king by the Burgundian magnates, and in this recognition the younger king was included. Henry had already in the previous year come fully of age, the guardianship of Bishop Egelbert being brought to an end with grants of land in recognition of his services. The deposition in 1035 of Duke Adalbero of Carinthia led to a curious scene between father and son. In the south, the deposition was regarded as an autocratic act, Hermann of Reichenau curtly notes that Adalbero, having lost the imperial favour, was deprived likewise of his duchy. And Bishop Egelbert won a promise from his late ward that he would not consent to any act of injustice against the duke. The princes accordingly refused to agree to the deposition without Henry's consent, which Henry withheld in spite of prayers and threats from Conrad. The emperor was overcome and finally born unconscious from the hall. On his recovery, he knelt before Henry and begged him to withdraw his refusal. Henry, of course, yielded, and the brunt of the imperial anger fell on Bishop Egelbert. In 1036, at Nijmegen, Henry wedded Cunigunda, or Gunhild, daughter of Knut, 
a wedding which secured to Denmark for over 800 years the Kiel district of Schleswig. The bride was delicate and still a child, grateful for sweets as for kindness. In England, songs were long sung of her and of the gifts showered on her by the English people. Her bridal festivities were held in June in Charlemagne's palace at Nijmegen, and on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, June 29th, she was crowned queen. Conrad was soon after called to Italy by the rising of the Vavassars against the great lords. Henry was summoned to help, and with him went Cunigunda and Gisela. In August 1038, on the march of the Germans homeward, camp and court were pitched near the shores of the Adriatic. Here a great sickness attacked the host. Among the victims was Queen Cunigunda, whose death, on the threshold of life, roused pity throughout the empire. Her only daughter, Beatrice, was later made by her father, abbess of the royal abbey of Quedlingburg, near Gosla. Another victim of the pestilence was Henry's half-brother, Hermann, Gisela's second son. His duchy of Swabia devolved on Henry, already Duke of Bavaria. To these two duchies and his German kingship was added in 1038 the kingship of Burgundy. Then, in the spring of 1039, Conrad died at Utrecht. The position of public affairs at Henry's accession to sole rule was roughly this. There had been added to the empire a kingdom, Burgundy, for the most part non-German, geographically distinct, yet most useful if the German king was to retain his hold upon Italy. The imperial power in Italy had been made a reality, and an important first step had been taken here towards incorporating the hitherto elusive south and towards absorbing the newcomers, the Normans. On the northeastern frontiers of the empire, both March and Mission were suffering from long neglect. Poland had been divided and weakened, and turned from aggression to an equally dangerous anarchy. Bohemia had recently slipped into hostility. Hungary was tranquil, but scarcely friendly. In the north, the Danish alliance tended to stability. In the duchies of Germany itself, Lorraine was indeed growing overpowerful, but Bavaria, Swabia, and, a few months later, Carinthia, were held by the crown. Saxony was quiescent, though scarcely loyal. In Germany as a whole, the people and the mass of fighting landowners looked to the crown for protection and security. The church, as under Henry II, was a state department and the main support of the throne. Over this realm, Henry, in the summer of 1039, assumed full sway. As German, Italian and Burgundian king, Duke of Swabia and of Bavaria, and Imperator in Spe. The salient policy of concentrating the tribal duchies in the hands of the sovereign was at its height. In his father's funeral train, bearing the coffin in city after city, from church porch to altar, and finally at spires, from the altar to the tomb, Henry the Pious inaugurated his reign. A young man in his twenty-second or twenty-third year, head and shoulders taller than his subjects, the temper of his mind is seen in his sending away cold and empty the jugglers and jesters who swarmed to Ingelheim for the wedding festivities of his second bride, Agnès of Poitou, and in his words to Abbot Hugh of Cluny that only in solitude and far from the business of the world could men really commune with God. The re-establishment of the German kingship after the disintegration caused by the attacks of Northmen and Magyars had been a gradual and difficult process. For the moulding of a real unity, not even yet attained, there was need of the king's repeated presence and direct action in all parts of the realm. What Norman and Plantagenet rulers were to do later in England by means of their royal commissioners, judges and justices, the German king had to do in person. Following in this the policy of his predecessors, Henry opened his reign with a systematic progress throughout his realm, a visitation accompanied by unceasing administrative activity. He had already, before leaving the Netherlands, received the homage of Gozello, Duke of Beauf Lorenz, of Gerard, the royalist-minded and most energetic Bishop of Cambrai, and of a deputation of Burgundian magnates who had been waiting on Conrad in Utrecht when death overcame him. He had passed with a funeral procession through Cologne, Mainz, Worms, and Spires. Immediately after the conclusion of the obsequies, he returned to Lower Lorraine, to Aix-la-Chapelle and Maastricht, where he remained some eight or nine days, dealing justice to the many who demanded it. 
Thence he went to Cologne, the city which competed with Mainz for precedence in Germany. It was already governed by Henry's lifelong and most trusted adviser, Archbishop Hermann, whose noble birth and strenuous activity contrast strongly with the comparative obscurity and the mildness of Bardo of Mainz. In the first days of September, accompanied by the Empress Gisela and Archbishop Hermann, Henry made his first visit as sole ruler to Saxony, of all the German lands the least readily bound to his throne and destined to play so fatal a part in the downfall of his heir. This weakness in the national bond Henry seems to have tried to remedy by personal ties. The obscure township of Goslar was to be transformed by his favour into a courtly city. Here in the wild district of the Hartz was Botfeld, where now and throughout his life Henry gave himself up at times to hunting, his only pleasure and relaxation from the toils of state. Near at hand was the Abbey of Quedlingburg, whose then abbess, the royal Adelaide, he distinguished as his spiritual mother, while her successors in turn were Henry's own two daughters, his eldest, Beatrice, niece of the confessor, and his youngest, Adelaide. Disquieting news reached Henry in Saxony of events in Bohemia, whose Duke Bratislav had, late in August, returned triumphantly to Prague, after a whirlwind campaign throughout the length and breadth of Poland, a land recently made vassal to the empire, the prince of which, Casimir, an exile in Germany, was the nephew of Hermann of Cologne. From Saxony, Henry passed through Thuringia towards Bohemia, and there consulted with Eckhard of Meissen, guardian of the marches against Bohemia, a veteran of staunchest loyalty, in whose wise counsels Henry placed unfailing confidence in spite of his unsuccess in war. There can be no doubt that Henry in Thuringia was at the head of an armed force, and that he meant war with Bohemia. But an embassy with hostages from Bratislav, together doubtless with the need for completing the visitation of the German duchies, determined him for the time to peace. So he dismissed his forces and turned south to Bavaria. From Bavaria, at the beginning of the new year, 1040, he moved to his mother's native duchy of Swabia, while after his departure, Peter of Hungary, ally of Bratislav, sent his Magyars raiding over the Bavarian borders. In Swabia, Henry visited, among other places, the famous monastery of Reichenau, the chief and most brilliant centre of learning in Germany, the home of Hermann, the noble cripple, whose genius was extolled throughout Germany, and to whose pen we owe a very large, if not the chief part, of our knowledge both of his times and of Henry himself, a knowledge but little tinged with enthusiasm or sympathy for the king. As he passed through Constance, Henry shows for a moment a touch of human sympathy as he visited in the Church of St. Mary the tomb of his unfortunate eldest brother, Ernest of Swabia. At Ulm, he summoned his first Fürstentag, the assembly of princes, bishops, and abbots from all parts of the realm. Here came, among others, Gunther, the German hermit of the Böhmerwald, no less notable than any of the great princes, and soon to render a signal service to his king and countrymen in distress. To Ulm there came also the first formal embassy from Italy to the new ruler. From Ulm Henry passed to the Rhine. He spent April at his palace at Ingelheim, where he received both a formal embassy from his Burgundian kingdom, and more important still, Archbishop Aribert of Milan, his father's stubborn opponent in Italy. Henry had never approved of Conrad's proceedings against him, and the siege of Milan, carried on by Italian princes at Conrad's command, had ceased automatically with Henry's accession. By receiving the explanation and the homage of the archbishop, Henry healed an open wound in the empire. Thus, auspiciously, with an act of justice and reconciliation, he opened the period of his lordship in Italy. Thus, too, closed his inaugural progress through the realm. During its course had died Henry's cousins, Conrad, Duke, and Adalbero, ex-Duke of Carinthia, after whom, as next heir, he succeeded automatically to the duchy. He was now, therefore, Duke of Swabia, Bavaria, and Carinthia. Of the five great duchies, only Lorraine and Saxony remained apart from the crown. The progress through the German lands completed, Henry was free to turn to the Bohemian campaign the necessity of which had been clearly shown by the raids of Bratislav's Hungarian ally. Two months more Henry spent, apparently peacefully and piously, after his own heart in both the Lorenz and in Alsace, at the ancient royal palaces of Nijmegen and Utrecht, 
at Liège, Metz, Nancy and Moyenvic, giving grants to churches, showing marked favour to the reforming ascetic monasteries, attending especially the consecration of the new minster at Stablo, under Popo, the pioneer and leader of monastic reform in Germany. Probably it was from Stablo, a scene of peaceful and pious magnificence, that Henry issued the summons for the army to assemble against Bohemia. In July 1040 at Goslar, he again met Eckhard of Meissen to formulate the plan of campaign. At Ratisbon, he joined his forces and proceeded to come at the entrance to the Bohemian Pass, by which he meant to attack, and on 13th August he broke camp for Bohemia. The expedition failed speedily and disastrously. His troops were ambushed, their leader slain. The mediation of the hermit Gunther and the promise to restore the Bohemian hostages, including Bratislav's son, alone rescued hundreds of German captives. Bratislav was left exultant master of the situation. Henry, silent and as it were dismissing Bohemia from his mind, retraced his steps through Bavaria. On 8th September, he filled up the newly vacant see of Bamberg by appointing Suiger, a Saxon, who was, a few years later, as Clement II, the first of the reforming German popes. Going north, he held an open court, dealing justice at Altstedt, and received there envoys from Yaroslav, Prince of Kiev. Then, at Münster, he met the princes, laid before them the Bohemian situation, and dismissed the Bohemian hostage prince to his own country. This year nature conspired with fortune against Germany. The rain fell, the rivers rose, destructive floods swept the countryside, many lost their lives. To crown all, grapes were scarce and the wine sour. But Henry's calm attention to other matters by no means meant submission to defeat. At Seligenstadt in the April of 1041, the princes again met to discuss active measures, and overtures from Bohemia were rejected. Fortune was veering, for Bratislav was now deprived of his Hungarian ally Peter, who lost his throne by a sudden insurrection and only saved his liberty by flight to Germany, where Henry received him kindly, forgetting for the sake of God the wrong towards himself. Bohemia, however, he did not forget, but pressed forward his preparations. At Aix in June 1041 he met the princes and bishops of the West, Gozello and Godfrey of Lorraine, Hermann of Cologne, Popo of Treves, Nitard of Liège. At Goslar and at Tileda, the royal seat in Thuringia, he concerted final measures with Eckhard of Meissen, and on 15th August, the anniversary of his previous expedition, he crossed the Bohemian frontier. By Michaelmas, he was back in Germany a victor. A fortnight later, Bratislav followed him to Ratisbon, and there did public homage and underwent public humiliation. Probably Peter also appeared there as a suppliant before Henry. Henceforth, Peter was Henry's client and Bratislav Henry's friend. Great was the joy in Germany at this Bohemian victory. With it, we can undoubtedly connect the Tetralogus of Henry's tutor Vipo, a chant of praise and exhortation to the fame-crowned king, who, after Christ, rules the world, the lover of justice, the giver of peace. It is in the midst of the turmoils and rejoicings of 1041 that the Augsburg Annals record, by his, Henry's, aid and diligence, very many excelled in the arts in building in all manner of learning. But in this same year misfortune after misfortune fell upon the land. There were storms and floods, everywhere the harvest failed and famine reigned, nor could Henry rest on his oars. The fall and flight of Peter of Hungary had increased rather than removed the Hungarian menace, even if it opened new vistas of extended power, while Burgundy, newly in peace, clamoured for attention lest this young peace should die. And although to the great Christmas gathering of princes round Henry at Strasbourg, 1041, there came envoys from Oboe of Hungary to know whether he might expect certain enmity or stable peace, it was to Burgundy that Henry first gave his attention. Since his appearance as Burgundian king in 1031, he had not again visited the country. He kept Christmas 1041 at Strasbourg amid a brilliant gathering of princes, and when immediately afterwards he entered Burgundy, it was at the head of armed vassals. We are told by Hermann of Reichenau, that the Burgundian nobles made submission, that many were brought to justice, that Henry entered Burgundy, ruled with vigour and justice, 
and safeguarded the public peace. Finally, Vipo tells us that he ruled Burgundy with magnificence. End of section 39「Section 40 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Emperor Henry III, Part 2, by Carolyn M. Riley. Some notion of the state of the land before Henry's arrival may be gathered by the history of the Archdiocese of Lyon. Here, Archbishop Burchard, characterized by Herman of Reichenau as, quote, Tyrannus et sacrilegius, ecclesiarum depredator, adulterque incestuosus, end quote, and moreover strongly anti-German, had been cast into prison in chains by Conrad in 1036. The city was then seized upon by a Count Gerard, who, desirous it would appear of playing at Lyon the part played by the patrician at Rome, thrust into the Sea of Lyon his son, a mere boy. This boy later secretly fled, and since then Lyon had contentedly lacked a bishop. The filling of the sea thus left vacant was one of Henry's first cares in Burgundy, at the recommendation of the Cluniac Helenard of Dion, who refused the sacred office for himself, it was given to a pious and learned French secular priest, Odoric Ulric, Archdeacon of Langre, that the peace and order enforced under Henry were after all but comparative may be judged from the murder of Odoric himself only a few years later. There was much to attract Henry and Burgundy, for side by side with its lawlessness and violence were the strivings for peace and holiness embodied in the Troigadei and in the austerity of Cluny and its monasteries. Henry's approbation of Cluniac ideals is evident, and throughout his whole life he shows real ardor, almost a passion in his striving to realize throughout the empire that peace founded on religion upon which the Troigadei, if in somewhat other fashion, strove to insist locally. After some six weeks in Burgundy, he must have heard at Basel on his way back of the havoc played among the Bavarians on the frontier a week earlier by the new King Obo of Hungary and his raiders. Henry, himself the absentee duke of the unfortunate duchy, at once handed it over, without waiting, as it would seem, for the formality of an election, as right was by the Bavarians, to Count Henry of Luxembourg, who was akin to the last Duke Henry of Bavaria, and nephew to the Empress Cunegunda, wife of Henry II. Trusting to the vigor of the new duke to protect Bavaria for the time being, Henry next, a few weeks later, summoned all the princes, including, of course, Eckhard of Meisen, to Cologne, there to decide upon further steps to be taken with regard to Hungary. They unanimously declared for war. Some four or five months elapsed before the expedition was launched, from Würzburg at Whitsuntide, Henry strengthened his hold on his Burgundian realm by dispatching Bishop Bruno to woo for him Agnes of Poitou. A few months he spent in comparative quiet, probably with his mother in Thuringia and Saxony. Then later, in August 1042, he entered Bavaria and started, early in September, on the Hungarian expedition. It was a success. Henry overcame not Obo himself, who retired to inaccessible fastnesses, but at least the western Magyars. He set up a new king, not Peter, but an unnamed cousin of his, and then returned fairly well satisfied to Germany. Directly his back was turned, Obo emerged from his fastness, and the reign of Henry's candidate came to an abrupt end. Yet a lesson against raiding had undoubtedly been given to the overdaring kinglet. The king spent the Christmas of 1042 at Goslar, whither in January came envoys from the princes of the northern peoples. Bratislav of Bohemia came in person, 
bearing and receiving gifts. The Russians, though they bore back to their distant lord far more magnificent presents than they could have offered, departed in chagrin, for Henry had rejected their offer of a Russian bride. Casimir of Poland also sent his envoys. They were not received, since he himself did not come in person. Lastly, Obo II, who had just ejected his second rival king, sent to propose peace. His messengers received an answer ominously evasive. Early in the following month, at Goslar, the empress mother died. That there had been some measure of alienation between Henry and Gisela is suggested by Wipo's exhortation to Henry to remember the sweetness of a mother's name, and by his recording in his Tetralogus the many benefits conferred by Gisela on her son, as well as by Hermann of Reichenau's acid comment. Yet there is no evidence that the alienation was serious. Henry's grants and charters on his mother's petition are numerous. In all probability, he spent with her the only long interval of comparative leisure, 1042, that he had enjoyed since his accession. She died whilst with him at Goslar. Soon after the funeral ceremonies were over, Henry had his first meeting with the King of France, Henry I. Its place and object are obscure, but probably it was on the frontier at Ivoire, and it may very well have been in connection with Henry's approaching marriage with Agnes of Poitou. The king's mind was now bent on the preparations for yet another Hungarian expedition. Twice Obo sought to evade the conflict. Obo did not, it is true, show much tact, if indeed he really desired peace. For in his second embassy, he demanded that Henry should himself swear to any terms agreed upon, instead of merely giving the oath in kingly fashion by proxy. This request was deemed an insult. The blow when it came was effective. Henry, in the space of four weeks, brought Obo to a promise of humble satisfaction, a satisfaction never made effectual, because the promises of Obo were not fulfilled. Far more important, and of solid and lasting advantage to Germany, was the restitution by Hungary of that territory on the Danube ceded to St. Stephen pro causa amicite in 1031. Since the frontier won by Henry remained until 1919 the frontier between German Austria and Hungary, it is worthwhile considering it in detail. The land ceded, or rather restored, was ex una parte Danube inter fiscaja et letacha ex altera autum inter strashten et ostia fiscaja usque in maraja. South of the Danube, that is to say, the Lytha replaced the Fischa as boundary as far south as the Corinthian march. North of the river, the old frontier line seems to have run from opposite the confluence of the Fischa with the Danube to a fortress on the Moravian border, Strashten or Trashten. This artificial frontier was now replaced by the river march. Thus, among other things, was secured permanently for Germany the famous Wienerwald. The realm was now at peace. Burgundy in order, Italy contented, in contrast to the early days of Conrad, with German overlordship, not one of the great princes or duchies of Germany a danger to the realm. The fame or the arms of the king had induced the princes on its borders to seek his friendship and acknowledge his superiority. Nothing remained to bar the public peace save private enmities. To private enemies, the king might, without danger to the commonwealth, offer reconciliation. On the day of indulgence at Constance in late October 1043, Henry from the pulpit announced to the assembled princes and bishops and to the whole of Germany that he renounced all idea of vengeance on any who had injured him and exhorted all his princes, nobles, and people in their turn to forget all private offenses. The appeal of the king was ordered to be made known throughout the whole land, and this day at Constance became known as the Day of Indulgence, or Day of Pardon. The object was to abolish violence and private war, and so far the attempt bears a strong resemblance to the contemporary Franco-Burgundian institution, the Truce of God, with which, however, it cannot be confounded, 
since although the ends were the same, the means were only superficially alike. Since, however, the indulgence has sometimes been confused with, sometimes considered as deliberately rivaling, this troiga day, it is worthwhile to consider some relations and dissimilarities between the two movements. The truce of God endeavored to mitigate and limit violence by an appeal to Christian sentiment rather than to Christian principle. The Christian, under heavy church penalties, was to reverence certain days and times regarded as sacred by abstaining on them from all violence, not only in aggression, but even under provocation. This truce was created in France, the country where private feuds were most general and fiercest, and where therefore there was greatest need of it. Its birthplace was Aquitaine in the year of Henry's accession, and nowhere was it more eagerly adopted than in Burgundy, where religious zeal burnt whitest and private feuds were most universal and devastating. Now this truce of God was an addition made to the original proclamation of a peace of God, circa 980, which forbade private violence against non-combatants by oath and for a fixed time is contrary to Christian precept. Like most medieval legislation, both peace and truce were largely failures. Henry's indulgence struck at the root of the evil as they had not. The indulgence, it is true, was not so sweeping as would have been the peace of God, because no provision was made for the protection of non-combatants in case private war did arrive. The indulgence, being a pardon of actual enemies, could by its nature refer only to the present and the actual without a word as to the future, although Henry no doubt hoped that the one must entail the other. Another distinction between the Troiga Dei and the indulgence consists in the ecclesiastical character of the former. The truce was conceived by the church, proclaimed by the church, its breach punished by heavy ecclesiastical penalties. The indulgence was an example and exhortation from a Christian king to his subjects, compliance being in appearance voluntary, though royal displeasure might threaten him who refused it. But the distinction does not, as some have thought, imply any sort of opposition. Henry approved of the truce as churchmen approved of the indulgence. One adversary of the truce opposed it, indeed, on the ground that by it the church usurped a royal function. But this was the ultra-royalist Gerard of Cambrai, one of the few bishops who did not enjoy Henry's favor. On the other hand, the chief supporters of the truce in Burgundy were the bishops, firm imperialists. Only a year before Henry's visit to Burgundy, the bishops and archbishops of Arles, Avignon, Nice, Vienne, and Besancon had met Pope Benedict IX at Marseille and had in all probability obtained his approval for the measure promulgated by the Burgundian Synod at Montreal in 1041, extending the time of the truce to the whole of Lent in Advent. Cluny, whose ideal the king revered as the highest ideal of all monasticism, had, through Abbot Odilo, appealed on behalf of the Troiga Dei to all France and Italy. Within the French part of the empire, in the Diocese of Verdun, Henry's friend, the Abbot Richard of St. Vaughan, was a promoter and zealous supporter of the truce. To sum up, Henry knew the working of the truce. Its friends were his friends. Its aim was his aim. In the same spirit and with the same object, he took a different method, neither identical with nor antagonistic to the sister movement in the neighboring Latin kingdoms, but worked independently side by side with it in sympathy and harmony, although their provisions were different. Henry was not given to ardors, enthusiasms, and dreams. His endeavors to found a public peace on the free forgiveness of enemies shows a real belief in the practicability of basing public order on religion and self-restraint rather than on force. As little can Henry's indulgence be confused with Alain Frieden of a later date, which were in the nature of laws sanctioned by penalties, not a free forgiveness like Henry's pardon. This year, 1043, which had witnessed in its opening months the homage of the North, in the summer the defeat of Hungary, 
in the autumn, the proclamation of peace between Germans saw at its close the consummation of the policy by which Henry sought to link the South more closely with the empire. His first marriage had allied him with the northern power, whose friendship from that time on had been, and during Henry's lifetime continued to be, of great value to the empire. His second marriage should strengthen his bond with Italy and Burgundy, and some have thought prepare his way in France. From Constance the king journeyed to Besancon, and there amid a brilliant gathering of loyal or subdued Burgundian nobles wedded Agnes of Poitou. Agnes, that cause of tears to Germany, was a girl of about 18, dainty and intelligent, the descendant of Burgundian and Italian kings, daughter to one of the very greatest of the French king's vassals and stepdaughter to another. Her life so far had been spent at the court, first of Aquitaine during the lifetime of her father, Duke William the Pious, then of Anjou after the marriage of her mother Agnes with Geoffrey the Hammer, Martel. The learning and piety of the one home she exchanged for the superstition and violence of the other. For Geoffrey was certainly superstitious, most certainly violent, and constantly engaged in endeavors generally successful to increase his territory and his power at the expense of his neighbors or of his suzerain, the French king. He and William of Normandy were by far the strongest of the French princes contemporary with Henry, so much the strongest that a great German historian has seen in the alliance by marriage of Henry with the House of Anjou a possible preparation for the undermining of the French throne and the addition of France to the empire. The marriage was held in strong disapproval by some of the stricter churchmen on account of the relationship between Henry and Agnes, which, although distant, fell within the degrees of kinship which, by church law, barred marriage. Abbot Siegfried of the Reformed Monastery at Gores wrote very shortly before to his friend Abbot Popo of Stablo, who possessed the confidence and respect of Henry, urging him even at the eleventh hour and at risk of a possible loss of the king's favor to do all that he possibly could to prevent it. Neither Popo nor Bishop Bruno of Toul, later Pope Leo IX, to whom Siegfried addresses still more severe reproaches, nor Henry himself paid much heed to these representations. The marriage plans went on without let or hindrance. Twenty-eight bishops were present at the ceremony at Besancon. Not only the consanguinity of Agnes with a king, but also her nationality aroused misgivings in the mind of this German monk. He cannot suppress his anxiety lest the old-time German sobriety shown in dress, arms, and horse trappings should now disappear. Even now, says he, the honest customs of German forefathers are despised by men who imitate those whom they know to be enemies. We do not know how Agnes viewed the alleged follies and fripperies of her nation, thus invaded against by this somewhat acid German saint. She was pious, sharing to the full and encouraging her husband's devotion to Cluny. She favored learned men. Her character does not, however, emerge clearly until after Henry's death. Then, in circumstances certainly of great difficulty, she was to show some unwisdom, failing either to govern the realm or to educate her son. After the coronation at Mayence and the wedding festivities at Ingelheim, Henry brought Agnes to spend Christmas in the ancient palace at Utrecht, where he now proclaimed for the north the indulgence already proclaimed in the south. So with the peace unheard of for many ages, a new year opened. But in the west, a tiny cloud was rising, which would overshadow the rest of the king's reign. For in April 1044, old Duke Gozolo of Lorraine died. Gozolo had eventually been staunch and faithful and had done good service to Henry's house. But his duchy was over great, and the danger that might arise from this fact had been made manifest by his hesitation in accepting certainly the election of Conrad, and also, possibly, the undisputed succession of his son. The union of the two duchies of Upper and Lower Lorraine had been wrung by him from the necessities of the kings. Henry now determined to take this occasion again to separate them. 
of Gozolo's five sons, the eldest, Godfrey, had already, during his father's lifetime, been duke in Upper Lorraine and had deserved well of the empire. He now expected to succeed his father in the lower duchy. But Henry bestowed Lower Lorraine on the younger Gozolo, the coward, alleging a dying wish of the old dukes that his younger son might obtain part of the duchy. Godfrey thenceforth was a rebel, sometimes secretly, more often openly, imprisoned, set at liberty, deprived of his duchy, reinstalled, humbled to submission, but again revolting, always at heart a justified rebel. If, in spite of its seeming successes, Henry's reign must be pronounced a failure, to no one is the failure more due than to Godfrey of Lorraine. The beginning of the Lorraine trouble coincided with the recrudescence of that with Hungary. Obo, perhaps prevented by nationalist opposition, had not carried out his promises of satisfaction. There was also growing up in Hungary a party strongly opposed to him and favoring Germanization and German intervention. Preparations for another campaign had been going on strenuously in Germany. By the summer of 1044, they were complete. After a hasty visit to Nimegen, whither he had summoned Godfrey, and a fruitless attempt to reconcile the two brothers, Henry, with Peter in his train, set out for Hungary. With Hungarian refugees to guide him, he was, by 6th July, on the further bank of the Rab. There the small German army confronted a vast Hungarian host, among whom, however, disaffection was at work. In a battle where few Germans fell, this host was scattered, and Hungary was subordinated to Germany. By twos and threes, or by crowds, came Hungarian peasants and nobles, offering faith and subjection. At Stuhl Weissenberg, Peter was restored to his throne, a client king, and Henry, leaving a German garrison in the country, returned home. On the battlefield, the king had led a thanksgiving to heaven, and his German warriors, at his inspiration, had freely and exultingly forgiven their enemies. On his return in the churches of Bavaria, Henry, barefoot and in humble garment, again and again returned thanks for a victory which seemed nothing short of a miracle. It was now that Henry gave to the Hungarians, at the petition of the victorious party amongst them, the gift of Bavarian law, a Germanization all to the good. But Hungary was not being Germanized merely and alone by these subtle influences, by the inclination of its kings and the German party toward things German, nor by the adoption in Hungary of an ancient code of German law. After the Battle of the Rab, Hungary was definitely and formally in the position of vassal to Germany. Not only its king, but its nobles, too, swore fealty to Henry and his heirs. Peter formally accepted the crown as a grant for his lifetime, and Hungary was thenceforth to pay a regular yearly tribute. Obo had been captured in flight and beheaded by his rival. The victory over Hungary seemed even more complete than the victory over Bohemia. The difference in the duration of their effects was partly due to a fundamental difference in the character of the two vassal princes. While Bratislav, a strong man, held Bohemia firmly and giving his fealty to Henry, gave with it the fealty of Bohemia. Peter, subservient and cringing to his benefactor, let Hungary slip through his fingers. Within two years, he was a blinded captive in his twice-lost kingdom, and Hungary, freed from him, was freed too from vassalage. This summer saw the gathering of the western clouds. Godfrey of Lorraine had himself taken part in Henry's former Hungarian campaign, but deeply disappointed by the outcome of the meeting at Nemegen, had held himself aloof in stubborn disobedience from this last expedition. He now sent envoys to Henry, who declared himself ready to forget the duke's contumacy should he at the eleventh hour consent peaceably to the division of the duchies. But Godfrey would submit to no wrong, and having failed to move Henry, he began actively and secretly to engage in treason. And here at once becomes evident the peculiar danger to Germany of disaffection in Lorraine. For Lorraine was, in truth, not German as the other German lands were German, and the first ally made by Godfrey was Rex Carolingerum, Henry I of France. His other allies, 
the Burgundian nationalists of the Romance Party, were, like himself, of the oft-disputed Middle Kingdom. In his own duchy, he prepared for resistance by gaining from his vassals an oath of unlimited fealty for the space of three years to aid him against all men whatsoever. As yet, there had been no overt act of rebellion, but Henry had been given proof of Godfrey's plots, and in the autumn summoned him before a great assembly of the princes in Lower Lorraine itself at Aix-la Chapel. Godfrey could have defied the king and disobeyed the summons, but to do so would have been to acknowledge his guilt. He must have hoped that there was no evidence against him, or that the princes would sympathize with him in his wrongs. He came, was convicted, and condemned to the loss of all the lands, including the Duchy of Upper Lorraine and the County of Verdun, which he held in fief from the king. Godfrey now left Aix and broke into fierce and open rebellion. Arms were distributed to the cities and country people, cities were garrisoned, and the duke fell with fire and sword upon all within reach who were faithful to Henry. End of section 40. Section 41 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Emperor Henry III, Part 3, by Carolyn M. Riley. So ended the year that had seen Hungary subdued. Henry, however, did not yet foresee the stubborn nature of the danger that threatened from Lorraine. He spent Christmas 1044 at Spears, a place beloved by him. It is true that he summoned the princes to consultation over Godfrey's revolt. Yet after the feast was over, it was only the forces of the neighborhood that he led against the tyrant that threatened them. Even these forces he could not maintain because of the terrible famine in the land. He succeeded, after a short siege and with the help of siege engines, in taking and raising Godfrey's castle at Bockelheim, near Kreuznach. The seizure of other castles was entrusted to local nobles, while Henry himself, leaving sufficient men to protect his people against Godfrey's raids, departed to Burgundy. Here Godfrey's efforts had borne fruit in feuds which had broken out in the preceding year between imperialist and nationalist partisans. They ended in victory for the former, for Count Louis of Montbelliard, who had married Henry's foster sister, with a small force overcame Godfrey's ally, Prince Reynold, who was uncle of Henry's queen and son of Count Otto William, the former head of the anti-German party. When Henry now approached Burgundy, Reynold, along with the chief of his partisans, Count Gerald of Geneva, personally made submission to him. Thus died out the last flicker during Henry's life of Burgundian opposition to union with the empire. Henry took Burgundy on his way to Augsburg, where he arrived in February 1045, and whither he had summoned the Lombard magnates to discuss with them the affairs of Italy. He kept Easter at Goslar. Here, not wishing to set out for the east without taking steps to protect the west from Godfrey, he handed over to Otto, Count Palatine in Lower Lorraine, his mother's native duchy of Swabia, which he himself had held since 1038. Otto's mother had been the sister of Otto III. His family was widespread and illustrious. His aunt, Abbess Adelaide of Quedlinburg, and Gandersheim, and his brother, Archbishop Hermann of Cologne, who won for that see the right to crown the king of the Romans at Aix, were among Henry's truest friends. His sister, Richessa, had been daughter-in-law of Boleslav the Mighty. His nephew, her son, was Casimir, Duke of the Poles. Another nephew, Henry, succeeded Otto in the Palatinate, and within a year was regarded by some as a fit successor to the empire. Yet another nephew was Kuno, whom the king first raised to the Bavarian dukedom and afterwards disgraced. 
The youngest sister, Sophia, about this time succeeded her aunt as abbess of the important Abbey of Gandersheim. A niece, Theophano, was abbess of Essen. Otto himself had been one of the chief of those in the disputed duchy whose loyalty to Henry had drawn upon themselves the vengeance of Godfrey at the beginning of the year. His appointment now to the duchy of Swabia, so long left without a special guardian and neighbor to Lorraine, recalls the appointment when trouble threatened from the Magyars of a duke to Bavaria, neighbor to Hungary. He ruled his new duchy, to which he was a stranger, with success and satisfaction to its people. Not, however, for long, for within two years he was dead. One more step Henry took for the protection of the West from Godfrey. For such, viewed in the double light of Henry's general policy of strengthening the local defense against Godfrey, rather than leading the forces of the empire against him, and of Godfrey's policy of winning the neighbors of Lorraine to his cause, must be considered the grant in this year of the march of Antwerp to Baldwin, son of Count Baldwin V of Flanders. The grant of Antwerp, however, instead of attaching Baldwin to the king's party, increased the power of a future ally of Godfrey's. Having thus spent the early months of 1045, from Christmas onwards, in local measures against Godfrey and his allies, Henry, after a short visit to Saxony, prepared to spend Pentecost with Peter of Hungary. On his way, he narrowly escaped death through the collapse of the floor of a banqueting room when his cousin Bishop Bruno of Würzburg was killed. Henry, notwithstanding this calamity, arrived punctually in Hungary, and on Whit Sunday in Stuhlweissenburg, in the banqueting hall of the palace, Peter surrendered the golden lance, which was the symbol of the sovereignty of Hungary. The kingdom was restored to him for his lifetime on his taking an oath of fidelity to Henry and to his heirs. This was confirmed by an oath of fidelity in the very same terms taken by the Hungarian nobles present. After the termination of the banquet, Peter presented to Henry a great weight of gold, which the king immediately distributed to those knights who had shared with him in the great victory of the preceding year. How far was this scene spontaneous, and how far prepared? The oath taken by the Hungarian nobles, without a dissentient, points to its being prepared, and if prepared, then most certainly not without the cooperation, most probably on the initiative of Henry. This is what Wipo has in mind when he says that Henry, having first conquered Hungary in a great and noble victory, later, with exceeding wisdom, confirmed it to himself and his successors. But Henry's victory, on which so much was grounded, was a success snatched by a brilliant chance. It could furnish no stable foundations for foreign sovereignty over a free nation. More than ever, Henry appeared as an all-conquering king, and in the West, even Godfrey, despairing of rebellion, determined to submit. During July, either at Cologne or at Aix-la-Chapelle or at Maastricht, he appeared humbly before the king, and in spite of his submission was sent in captivity to Gebischenstein, the German tower, a castle fortress in the dreary land by Magdeburg beyond the Saal, very different from his own homeland of Lorraine. And so the realm for a short time had quiet and peace. Godfrey was perhaps taken to his prison in the train of Henry himself, for while he had been schooling himself to the idea of peace, the further Slavs, growing restive, had troubled the borders of these Saxon marches on the Middle Elbe. Godfrey's submission perhaps decided theirs, and when Henry with an armed force entered Saxony from Lorraine, they too sent envoys and promised the tribute which Conrad had imposed on them. Henry spent the peaceful late summer and early autumn of 1045 in Saxony. For October, he had summoned the princes of the empire to a colloquy at Tribur. The princes had begun to assemble, and Henry himself had reached Frankfurt, when he fell ill of one of those mysterious and frequent illnesses which in the end proved fatal. As his weakness increased, the anxiety of the princes concerning the succession to the empire became manifest. 
Henry of Bavaria and Otto of Swabia, with bishops and other nobles, met together and agreed, in the event of the king's death, to elect as his successor Otto's nephew Henry, who had followed Otto in the Lorraine Palatinate and was likewise a nephew of the king's confidant, Archbishop Herman, and a grandson of Otto II. The king recovered. Happily for the schemers, he was not a tutor, but the occurrence must have deepened his regret when the child just at this time born to him proved to be another daughter. This eldest daughter of Henry and Agnes, Matilda, died in her fifteenth year as the bride of Rudolf of Swabia, the antagonist of her brother Henry IV. The year 1046 opened again, as so many before and after it, with misery to the country people. In Saxony there was widespread disease and death. Among others died the stout old Margrave Eckhart, who, wealthiest of Margraves, made his kinsman the king his heir. The king, after attending Eckhart's funeral, turned to the Netherlands, where Duke Godfrey's incapable younger brother, Gozello, Duke of Lower Lorraine, was dead. Here, too, Count Dietrich, Theodoric of Holland, was unlawfully laying hold on the land round Flushing, belonging to the vacant duchy. At Utrecht, where he celebrated Easter, Henry prepared one of his favorite river campaigns against Dietrich. Its success was complete, both the lands and the count falling into Henry's hands. Flushing was given in fief to the Bishop of Utrecht, and Henry, keeping Pentecost at Aix-la-Chapelle, determined to settle once for all the affairs of Lorraine. The means he used would appear to have been three, the conciliation of Godfrey, the strengthening of the bishops, and the grant of Lower Lorraine to a family powerful enough to hold it. At Aix, Godfrey, released from Gibbeschenstein, threw himself at Henry's feet, was pitied, and restored to his dukedom of Upper Lorraine. This transformation from landless captive to duke might have conciliated some, but Henry did not know his man. Duke Godfrey's hereditary county of Verdun was not restored, but granted to Richard, bishop of the city. Lower Lorraine was given to one of the hostile house of Luxembourg, Frederick, brother of Duke Henry of Bavaria, whose uncle Dietrich had long held the Lorraine bishopric of Metz. At the same assembly, there took place an event of importance for the North and in the history of Henry's own house, viz. the investiture of Adelbert, provost of Halberstadt, with the archbishopric of Bremen, the northern metropolis, which held ecclesiastical jurisdiction not only in the coast district of German Saxony, but in all the Scandinavian lands and over the Slavs of the Baltic. Adalbert of Bremen had all virtues and all gifts, save that he was of doubtful humility, humble only to the servants of God, to the poor and to pilgrims, but by no means so to princes nor to bishops, accusing one bishop of luxury, another of avarice. Even as a young man, he had been haughty and overbearing in countenance and speech. His father, Count Frederick, was of a stock of ancient nobility in Saxony and Franconia. His mother, Agnes, of the rising house of Weimar, had been brought up at Quedlingburg and valued learning. Adalbert quickly rivaled, or more than rivaled, Archbishop Hermann of Cologne in the counsels and confidence of the king. He made many an expedition with Caesar into Hungary, Italy, Slavonia, and Flanders. He might at Sutri have had from Henry the gift of the papacy, but that he saw greater possibilities in his northern sea. His close connection with the king caused him to be regarded with suspicion, indeed as a royal spy, by the great semi-loyal Duke of the North, the Saxon Bernard II. It was Adalbert who moved the bishop's seat from Bremen to Hamburg, fertile mother of nations, to recompense her long sorrows exposed to the assaults of pagan Slavs. But Henry was not only looking northwards. To this same congress he summoned to judgment one of the three great Italian prelates, Widger of Ravenna. He had, before his nomination by Henry to the sea, been a canon of Cologne, and although unconsecrated, had for two years inefficiently and cruelly wielded the episcopal staff. 
Wazo, the stalwart bishop of Liege, famous as an early canonist, was one of the Episcopal judges chosen, but without pronouncing on Widger's guilt, he significantly denied the right of Germans to try an Italian bishop and protested against the royal usurpation of papal jurisdiction. This trial is the first sign either of clash between royal and ecclesiastical claims or of Henry's preoccupation with Italy, where, while these things were doing, church corruption and reform were waging a louder and louder conflict. To Italy, Henry was now to pass. Before doing so, he once more visited Saxony and the north. At Quedlingburg, he invested his little eight-year-old daughter Beatrice in place of the dead abbess Adelaide, and at Merseburg, he held court in June, receiving the visits and gifts of the princes of the north and east, Bratislav of Bohemia, Casimir of Poland, and Zemuzil of the Pomeranians. By the festival of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin, 8 September 1046, he was at Augsburg, whither he had summoned bishops, lords, and knights to follow him to Italy. The news of the sudden downfall of Peter of Hungary grieved, but did not deter him. Crossing the Brenner Pass, he reviewed his army before the city of Verona. When Henry came to Italy, 1046, he came to a realm where among the cities of Romagna and the hills of Tuscany, a new age was coming into life. He had not visited Italy since he had accompanied his father in 1038, and now the state of things was greatly changed, while his own policy was different from his father's. Conrad had been at strife with Eribert, the great Archbishop of Milan, but Henry, before he left Germany, made it Engelheim, 1039, as the Milanese historian tells us, quote, a pact of peace with the Archbishop and was henceforth faithfully held in honor by him, end quote. But in 1045, when peace between the populace and nobles of Milan was hardly restored, Eribert died. Henry rejected the candidate put forward by the nobles and chose Guido, supported by the democracy. Politics were intertwined with church affairs, and Henry's dealings with the papacy were the beginning of that church reform, which gave Rome a line of reforming German popes and led to the pontificate of Gregory VII. The story of that progress will come before us later, and this side of the history is therefore here left out. But it was the evil state of Rome where the Tusculan Benedict IX, the Crescentian Sylvester III, and the reforming but simoniacal Gregory VI had all lately contested the papal throne and the situation was entangled. That chiefly called Henry into Italy. By the end of October, he was at Pavia, where he held a synod and dispensed justice to the layman. At Sutri, 20 December 1046, he held a second synod in which the papal situation was dealt with and the papal throne itself left vacant. Two days later, he entered Rome, where a third synod was held. No Roman priest was fit, we are told, to be made a pope, and after Adalbert of Bremen refused, Henry chose on Christmas Eve the Saxon Suijar of Bamberg, who after was elected by clergy and people and became Clement II. On Christmas Day, the new pope was consecrated and at once gave the imperial crown to Henry. Agnes was also crowned empress at the same time. Then, too, the Roman people made him patrician, the symbol of the patriciate, a plain gold circlet he often wore, and the office of undoubted but disputed importance gave the emperor peculiar power in Rome and the right to control every papal election, if not to nominate the pope himself. The new patrician was henceforth officially responsible for order in the city, so it was fitting that, a week after his coronation, he was at Frascati, the headquarters of the Counts of Tusculum, and that, before leaving for the south, he seized the fortresses of the Crescenti in the Campagna. At Christmas tide, Clement II held his first synod at Rome, and it was significant of the new era in church affairs that Simoniacs were excommunicated, and those knowingly ordained by Simoniacs, although without themselves paying a price, sentenced to a penance of forty days 
a leniency favored by Peter Damiani as against those who would have had them deprived. After this, the empress went northwards to Ravenna, while the emperor, along with the pope, set out for the south. At Capua, he was received by Guimar, recognized by Conrad as Prince of Salerno and also of Capua, from which city Paldolf, Pandulf, the fourth, had been driven out. But Henry restored Paldolf, a wily and wicked prince, formerly expelled for his insolence and evil deeds. Conrad had also recognized Guimar as overlord of the Norman counts of Aversa and of the Norman de Hautevilles in Calabria and Apulia. Now Ranulf of Aversa and Drogo de Hauteville of Apulia, as they went plundering and conquering from the Greeks, were recognized as holding directly from Henry himself. So at Benevento the gates were shut in the emperor's face and he had to stay outside. Thence he went to join the empress at Ravenna. Early in May he reached Verona and then left Italy. There was trouble in the south, but otherwise he left Italy in peace and obedience. In the middle of May he was again home in Germany, which during his eight months' absence had also been in quiet. End of section 41《セクション42 の Cambridge Medieval History、Volume 3、Germany and the Western Empire。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart。The Cambridge Medieval History、Volume 3、Germany and the Western Empire。The Emperor Henry III、Part 4。By Carolyn M. Riley. With Henry's return, he steps upon a downward path. The greatness of his reign is over. Troubles are incessant and sporadic. Success is scanty and small. During his absence, Henry I of France, with the approval of his great men and perhaps at the instigation of Godfrey of Lorraine, made a move towards claiming and seizing the duchies of Lorraine. When the unwanted calm was thus threatened, Oiseau of Liege wrote to the French king appealing to the ancient friendship between the realms and urging the blame he would incur if, almost like a thief, he came against unguarded lands. Henry I called his bishops to Reims, reproached them for letting a stranger advise him better than his native pastors, and turned to a more fitting warfare along with William of Normandy against the frequent rebel Geoffrey of Anjou. But in his duchy of Upper Lorraine, the pardoned Godfrey was nursing his wrongs. His son, a hostage with Henry, was now dead, and he also heard that his name had not been in the list of those with whom Henry, as St. Peter's in Rome, had declared himself reconciled. Godfrey found allies in the Netherlands, Baldwin of Flanders, his son, the Margrave of Antwerp, Dietrich, Count of Holland, and Hermann, Count of Mons, all united by kinship and each smarting under some private wrong. Dietrich wished to recover from the Bishop of Utrecht the land round Flushing, Godfrey to recover the county of Verdun from its bishop. It was almost a war of lay nobles against the bishops so useful to Henry in the kingdom. At the moment, Henry was busied in negotiations with Hungary and in giving a new duke to Corinthia. This was wealth son of the Swabian Count Welf, and as his mother was sister to Henry of Bavaria, related to the House of Luxembourg. Now, too, Henry filled up a group of bishoprics. A Swabian, Humphrey, formerly Chancellor for Italy, went as Archbishop to Ravenna. Guido, a relative of the Empress's, to Piacenza, a royal chaplain. Dietrich, Theodoric, Provost of Basel, to Verdun. Hermann, Provost of Spires, to Strasbourg, another chaplain, Dietrich Theodoric, Chancellor of Germany, Provost of Aix-la-Chapelle, to Constance, where he had been a canon. Metz and Treves, two sees important for Lorraine, were vacant. To the one, Henry appointed Adalbero, nephew of the late bishop. To the other, Henry, a royal chaplain and a Swabian. Henry, now at Metz, July 1047, 
was thus busy with ecclesiastical matters and the Hungarian negotiations when he was forced to notice the machinations of Godfrey. Adelbert of Bremen had become suspicious of the Billung Duke Bernard, doubly related to both Godfrey and Baldwin of Flanders. Much was at stake, so Henry quickly made terms with Andrew of Hungary, summoned the army intended for use against him to meet in September on the Lower Rhine, and then went northwards to visit Adelbert. Bernard had also dreaded Adelbert, and now, when the emperor both visited him and enriched him with lands in Frisia, formerly Godfrey's, his dread turned against Henry, too. Thietmar, Bernard's brother, was even accused by one of his own vassals, Arnold, of a design to seize the emperor, and killed in single combat. The feud had begun. Henry's power was threatened, and the succession was causing him further anxiety, so much so that his close friend, Hermann of Cologne, publicly prayed at Xanten, whither Henry had come, for the birth of an heir. September 1047. The emperor had begun the campaign by a move towards Flushing, but a disastrous attack from Hollanders at home in the marshes threw his army into confusion, and then the rebels took the field. Their blows were mostly aimed at the bishops, but one most tragic deed of damage was the destruction of Charlemagne's palace at Nimegen. Verdun they sacked and burnt. Even the churches perished. Oiseau of Liege stood forth to protect the poor and the churches. Godfrey, excommunicated and repentant, did public penance and magnificently restored the wrecked cathedral. In his own city, too, Oiseau stood a siege. With a cross in his unarmed hand, he led his citizens against the enemy, who soon made terms. On the return from Flushing expedition, Henry of Bavaria died. After a vacancy of 18 months, his duchy was given to Cuno, nephew of Hermann of Cologne. Early in October 1047, Pope Clement II died. Then in January 1048, Popo, abbot of Stablo, passed away the chief of monastic reformers in Germany, who had given other reforming abbots to countless monasteries, including the famous houses of St. Gall and Hersfeld. Against Godfrey, Henry held himself, as formerly against Bohemia, strangely inactive. To Upper Lorraine, Godfrey's twice-forfeited duchy, he nominated a certain Adelbert and left him to fight his own battles. Christmas 1047, Henry spent at Polda, where he received envoys from Rome seeking a new pope. After consultation with his bishops and nobles, he subrogated the German popo of Brixen, and to this choice the Romans agreed. Wazo of Liege, great canonist and stoutest of bishops, had been asked for advice and had urged the restoration of Gregory VI, now in exile in Germany and as he held, wrongly deposed. This was one of Wazo's last acts, for on 8 July he died. And the new pope also died on 9 August 1048. At Ulm in January, Henry held a Swabian diet and nominated to the duchy, which had been left vacant for four months, Otto of Schweinfurt, Margrave in the Nordgau, a Babenberg by birth and possibly nephew to Henry's own mother Gisela. Lorraine remained to be dealt with. In mid-October, the two Henrys of France and Germany met near Metz. France might easily have succored Godfrey, who, spreading slaughter of men and devastation of fields, the greatest imaginable, had slain his new rival, Adelbert. But ecclesiastical matters also pressed. At Christmas, the formal embassy from Rome came to speak of the vacant papal throne. They asked for Hollenard, Archbishop of Lyon, and formerly at Dion. This prelate, a strict reformer, had refused Lyon in 1041, and asked again to take it later. He refused unless he need swear no fealty to Henry. Most German bishops disliked this innovation, but Henry, on the advice of Bruno of Toul, Dietrich of Metz, and Wazo of Liege, consented. While Archbishop Hellenard had been much in Rome, where he was greatly beloved. But he hesitated long to take new and greater responsibilities, and in the end, Bruno of Toul became Pope, and as Leo IX began a new epoch in the Western Church. 
To Upper Lorraine, Henry had given a new duke, Gerard of Chatinois, who himself of Lorraine was brother or uncle of the slain Duke Adalbert and related to Henry and also to the Luxembourgers, while his wife was a Carolingian. He was also founder of a dynasty which ruled Lorraine until 1755. The bishops of Liege, Utrecht, and Metz, together with some lay nobles, had been preparing the way for a larger expedition. In the cold winter of 1048 to 1049, favored by the lengthy frost, they defeated and slew Count Dietrich, whose brother Florence followed him in Holland. Then came a greater stroke, and in this, too, bishops helped, for Adalbert of Bremen was Henry's right hand. He had already dexterously won over the Billungs, but an even greater triumph was the treaty he had brought about with Svein of Norway and Denmark, who had succeeded Magnus in 1047. Svein was in sympathy with the empire because of his missionary zeal, and now he brought to its aid his sea power as his fleet appeared off the Netherland coast. England, too, which was friendly since Cunegunda's marriage to Henry and had also seen Flanders under Baldwin become a refuge for its malcontents, kept more distant guard. Edward the Confessor lay at Sandwich with a multitude of ships until that Caesar had of Baldwin all that he would. Thus Baldwin was unable to eight burst on water. Another kind of aid was given when Leo the Ninth excommunicated Godfrey and Baldwin at Cologne, where Pope and Emperor kept the feast of St. Peter and St. Paul, 29 June. Godfrey was smitten with fear and leaving Baldwin in the lurch, surrendered. His life was left him, but liberty and lands he forfeited, for he merited no mercy because of his cruel deeds. He had claimed two duchies and governed one. He was now, for the second time, a landless captive. Then, when Henry systematically ravaged Baldwin's lands, he too gave in, came to terms, and gave hostages for his faith. So the desolating war was over, and there was again, for a short time, peace within the empire. Thus the emperor was free to watch with friendly eye the reforming work of the German pope as he held a synod at Reims, 3 October 1049. Here appeared not only French bishops in goodly numbers, but also English because of the friendliness of Edward with Henry. As the synod was to be Gallic, there also came to it the prelates of Treves, Metz, Verdun, Besançon, and Lyon. A fortnight later, Leo held a German synod at Mayence, attended by a throng of bishops and abbots from all parts of the kingdom. This inner peace Henry secured by outward guard. He urged the Bavarian princes and nobles to watch the Danube. He brought Casimir of Poland to a sworn friendship. Thus he could better face the threatening Hungarian war. Grievous sickness had again attacked him when the birth of an heir gave him a new and dynastic interest in the future. The young Henry was born on 11 November 1050 at Goslar, the scene of so many events in his life. In the autumn of this year, says the analyst of Altaish, the empress bore a son, and Hermann of Reichenau adds at last, even before his baptism, all the bishops and princes near at hand promised him faith and obedience. At Easter, the infant prince was baptized at Cologne, and Hugh of Cluny, who was again to be his sponsor at Canossa, was specially summoned to be his sponsor now. In this year, Henry completed his work at Goslar, which from a little mill and hunting box he made into so great a city. Besides the great new palace, he built a church and set up their canons regular to carry on its work. Two bishops, Benno of Osnabrück and Oslin of Hildesheim, were placed over the work of the new foundation, and soon, for ardor in learning and strictness and discipline, Goslar had no equal in the province. After the royal baptism, Henry, with greater hope for his realm, had started on the Hungarian campaign. But the king, Andrew, partly withstood and partly eluded him. The German army could only burn and ravage whole districts until hunger forced their return. Soon after, Adalbert of Austria made a compact with Andrew, and peace ensued. 
Lower Lorraine still called for Henry's care. Count Lambert of Louvain first gave trouble, and then Richeldus, heiress of Hainault and widow of Herman of Mons, by a marriage with Baldwin's son, the Margrave Baldwin of Antwerp, roused Henry's fear and local strife. Needed on the Hungarian frontier, Henry took a risky but generous step. He restored to Godfrey of Lorraine a former fief of his in the Diocese of Cologne and set him to guard the peace against Baldwin. From this summer of 1051 until his marriage with Beatrice of Tuscany in 1054, Godfrey was outwardly an obedient vassal. The earlier part of 1052 was marked mainly by ecclesiastical cares and appointments, and then by another Hungarian expedition. The siege of Pressburg was begun when Andrew induced Leo IX to act the mediator, for which purpose the Pope came to Ratisbon. Andrew had promised the Pope to give all satisfaction and tribute, but when Henry had raised the siege, he withdrew the promise. Leo, in just anger, excommunicated him, but Henry could not renew the campaign, which was his last against Hungary. He had other matters, and notably the Norman danger in Italy, to talk over with the Pope. From January 1052 to February 1053, Leo was in Germany. Henry sent off an army to help him in his Italian wars, and then quickly recalled it. Leo had to set out with a motley band of his own raising, some sent by their lords, some criminals, some adventurers, and most of them Swabians like himself. Events were moving towards the deposition of Kuno of Bavaria. Since Christmas 1052, he and Gebhardt, Bishop of Ratisbon, had been at daggers drawn. The enemies, thus breaking the peace, were summoned to Merseburg at Easter 1053. There, Kuno, for his violence against Gebhardt and dealing unjust judgments among the people, was deposed by the sentence of some of the princes. He took his punishment badly, and on returning to the south, he, like Godfrey, began to stir up cruel strife, sparing neither imperialist nor his own late duchy. Bavaria was visited, too, by a famine so sore that peasants fled the country and whole villages were left deserted. And, quote, in those days, both great men and lesser men of the realm, murmuring more and more against the emperor, were saying each to the other that, from the path of justice, peace, divine fear, and virtue of all kind, on which in the beginning he had set out, and in which from day to day he should have progressed, he had gradually turned aside to avarice and a certain carelessness, and had grown to be less than himself." End quote. But if the Diet at Merseburg saw Kuno turn to an enemy, it also saw Svein of Denmark made a friend. In the north, Adalbert's Parvula Bremen had become almost instar Rome. Adalbert's chance lay in the haphazard fashion of the conversion of the Scandinavian nations to Christianity. Before the days of Canute, Bremen had been the missionary center for the north, although it had not wrought its work as carefully as did the English missionaries under Knut. As Denmark grew more coherently Christian, Bremen began to lose control, and its loss of ecclesiastical prestige meant a loss of political influence to Germany. Whether the Danish bishops were consecrated at Rome or even at Bremen, they were autonomous. The older alliance between Conrad II and Knut had brought tranquility to the north in the earlier part of Henry's reign, and in 1049, Svein had sent his fleet to help Henry in the Flemish War. But between 1049 and 1052, the alliance was strained by Adalbert's assertion of his ecclesiastical authority. In 1049, Adalbert had obtained a bull from Leo IX, recognizing the authority of Bremen over the Scandinavian lands, and the Baltic Slavs up to the Peen. Anxious for peace, at first Svein had acquiesced, but when Adalbert reprimanded him for his moral laxity and his marriage with his kinswoman Gunhild, he threatened war. Yet prudence, or maybe religious scruples, won the day. Gunhild was sent home to Sweden, and king and bishop made friends, 1052. 
Thus, Sweyn was ready to renew the ancient friendship as useful to Henry against Baldwin as it was to Sweyn against Harold Hardrada. In 1052, a papal brief of Leo IX gave Adalbert wider and more definite power to the farthest north and west. Iceland, Greenland, the Orkneys, the Finns, Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians, the Baltic Slavs from the Egdor to the Peen, all were definitely put under the ecclesiastical headship of Bremen, as were, indeed, inclusively, all the nations of the north. The Slavs under Gudeskalk looked to Hamburg, Bremen, as to a mother. Denmark was submissive. Sweden, at first reluctant, was brought round by a change of kings in 1056. Norway fell in later. It is true that Svein made proposals, approved by Leo IX, for a Danish archbishopric, which would issue in a new national Danish church. Adelbert failed to carry out his large scheme of a northern patriarchate for Hamburg-Bremen, for which, he had he been able to count twelve suffragans, he could have pleaded the sanction of the pseudo-Isidore. Yet even so, he was himself papal legate in the north, and the greatness of Hamburg-Bremen under him is a feature of German history under Henry III. Early in 1053 at Tribur, an assembly of princes elected the young Henry king and promised him obedience on his father's death but conditionally, however, on his making a just ruler. Thither, too, came envoys from Hungary, peace with which was doubly welcome because of trouble raised by the ex-Duke Kuno in Bavaria and Corinthia. King Andrew, indeed, would have become a tributary vassal pledged to military service everywhere save in Italy, had not Kuno dissuaded him. Rebellions in Bavaria and Corinthia, intensified by Hungarian help, kept Henry busy for some months, but the Duchy of Bavaria was formally given to the young king under the vigorous guardianship of Gebhardt, Bishop of Eichstätt. In Corinthia, some quiet was gained by the appointment of Adelbero of Eppenstein, son of the former Duke Adelbero deposed by Conrad II and cousin to the emperor, to the bishopric of Bamberg, vacant through Hartwich's death. Early in 1054, Henry went northwards to Merseburg for Easter and then to Quidlingburg. Casimir of Poland was threatening trouble, but was pacified by the gift of Silesia, now taken from Bratislav, always a faithful ally. From Italy had come the news of the Norman victory over Leo IX at Civitate, 18 June 1053, which left the Pope an honored captive in Norman hands. Then, when he was eagerly looking for help from the emperors of both East and West, he died, having reached Rome. Henry, influenced by Gebhardt of Eichstätt, had been slow to help the great pope, but he was to make one more expedition to Italy, not because of Norman's successes, but because of a new move by his inveterate enemy, Godfrey of Lorraine. The exiled duke had married Beatrice, like himself from Upper Lorraine, foster sister of Henry, and widow of the late Marcus Boniface of Tuscany, whose lands she held. On the side of Flanders, the two Baldwins were in rebellion and attacking Episcopal territories, and so, after having the young Henry crowned at Aix-la-Chapelle, July 17, the emperor went to Maastricht. John of Arras had long coveted the castle of Cambrai, but was kept out by the bishops, first Gerard and then Lutpert. When Lutpert had gone to Reims for consecration, John seized the city, ejected the canons, and made himself at home in the bishop's palace. On his return, Lutpert found himself shut out not only from his bed but from his city. But Baldwin of Flanders led him home in triumph, and the angry John of Arras turned to the emperor for help. He offered to lead Henry to Flanders itself, if the emperor would induce Lutpert, a prelate of his own appointment, to recognize him as holder of the castle of Cambrai. This was the reason why Henry now took the offensive against Baldwin. He invaded Flanders, systematically ravaging it bit by bit. He got as far as Lille, and there the city forced him to halt. Siege and hunger made the citizens capitulate, and so the emperor could go home with glory, as we are told, but with little solid gain. 
John of Arras, despite Henry's appeal to the bishop, did not gain his longed-for castle. To the southeast, there were still Hungarian raids in Carinthia, and in Bavaria, Kuno was still ravaging. But the men of Austria, under their old margrave Adalbert of Babenberg, until his death in May 1055, successfully withstood him. Earlier in the year died Bratislav, who had, according to one account, regained Silesia from Casimir of Poland. Christmas was spent by Henry at Goslar. A little later at Radisbon, in another diet, Gebhardt of Eichstadt consented to become Pope, although earlier, when an embassy from Rome had asked for a pontiff, he had refused. His words to Caesar were significant. Lo, my whole self, body and soul, I devote to St. Peter, and though I know myself unworthy the holiness of such a seat, yet I obey your command. But on this condition, that you also render to St. Peter those things which rightfully are his. At the same diet, Henry invested Spitignev, son of Bratislav, formerly a hostage at his court with Bohemia, and received his homage. Then he passed to Italy, and by Easter was at Mantua. In North Italy, the emperor tried to introduce order by holding many royal courts, including one at Roncaglia, afterwards so famous, and by sending special missi to places needing them. His enemy Godfrey had fled before a rising of the plebs, and had naturally gone to join Baldwin of Flanders. Late in May, Henry was at Florence, where, along with Pope Victor II, he held a synod. Here, too, he met Beatrice and her daughter, the Countess Matilda. For her marriage to a public enemy, she was led captive to Germany, and with her went Matilda. Boniface, her son and heir to Tuscany, feared to come to Henry, and a few days later died. On his way homewards at Zurich, Henry betrothed his son Henry IV to Bertha, daughter of Otto of Savoy and of Adelaide, Countess of Turin, and widow of Hermann of Swabia, brother to the emperor. In Germany, Henry had to suppress a conspiracy in which Gebhardt of Radisbon, Kuno, Welf, and others were probably concerned. According to other accounts, it was their knights and not the princes themselves who conspired. But Kuno died of plague, and Welf, after deserting his comrades, also died. In Flanders, Baldwin, now joined by Godfrey, was besieging Antwerp, but was defeated. Death was now removing friends as well as foes, and the loss of Hermann of Cologne, February 1055, was a real blow to the emperor. His successor was Anno, a man not of noble birth, a pupil at Bomberg and provost at Goslar. At Ivoire, May 1056, the emperor met for the third time his namesake of France, and the matter of Lorraine made the meeting a stormy one, so much so that Henry of France challenged Henry of Germany to single combat. On this, the emperor withdrew in the dead of night. But in Germany itself, the disaffected were returning to obedience. Not only those who had conspired, but Godfrey himself made submission. On the northeast, the Liutizzi were again in arms, and even as Henry was turning northwards against them, a great defeat on the Havel and Elbe had made the matter serious, the more so as the Margrave William had been slain. To disaster was added famine, and when all this had to be faced, Henry was smitten with illness. Hastily he tried to ensure peace for his son. He compensated all whom he had wronged. He set free Beatrice and Matilda. All those at his court confirmed his son's succession, and the boy was commended to the special protection of the Pope, who was at the deathbed. Then, 5 October 1056, Henry died, and with him, said men afterwards, died order and justice. His heart was taken to its real and fitting home in Goslar, while his body rested beside Conrad's at Spires. The east and northeast throughout Henry's reign had called forth his full energy, and her story is in very large part the story of two men, the Slav Duke Godeskalk and the Bohemian Duke Bratislav. The Bohemian Duke was the illegitimate son of Duke Udorish. When still quite young, most beautiful of youths and boldest of heroes, 
He had shown energy in his reconquest of Moravia from the Poles and romance in his carrying off the Countess Judith, sister of the Franconian Margrave Otto the White of Schweinfurt of royal blood. Bratislav, fresh from his Moravian conquests, had fallen in love with the reported beauty of Judith, fairer than all other maidens beneath the sun, whose good father and excellent mother had confided her to the convent at Zunprod, Schweinfurt, to learn the Psalter. Bratislav, desiring her as bride, preferred action to asking, for he reflected on the innate arrogance of the Teutons and on the swollen pride with which they ever despised the Slav people and the Slav tongue. So he carried her off by night, on horseback, and lest the Germans should wreak vengeance on Bohemia, took her to Moravia. Bratislav could be as unswervingly faithful as he was audacious and vigorous. His friendship or enmity meant everything to Henry and Bohemia, much elsewhere. Yet, since he was naturally a man of strong ambitions, it was not friendship that he offered. He had begun his career as the ally of Conrad against the Poles and had held Moravia under the joint overlordship of his father and the emperor. But on his succession to Bohemia in 1037, his horizon was bright with promise. Poland had fallen from aggressive strength into disunion and civil war. The German rulers were absent in Italy. Bratislav saw his opportunity to take vengeance on Poland for old wrongs and to ensure Bohemia's permanent freedom from the empire. End of section 42. Section 43 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Emperor Henry III, Part 5, by Carolyn M. Riley. In unhappy Poland, Mesko, son of Boleslav the Mighty, had died in 1034, leaving a boy, Casimir, under the guardianship of his German mother, Rishessa. While Mesko lived, divisions had been fomented in Poland at last partitioned by the Emperor Conrad. Now, first the Duchess, and later on her son, when a man, were forced to fly before the violence of the Polish nobles. The Duke, says the Polish Chronicle, lest he should avenge his mother's injuries. Casimir wandered through Russia and Hungary, and finally reached Rychessa in Germany. Meanwhile, Poland was given over to chaos. Those were lords who should be slaves, says the same chronicle, and those slaves who should be lords. Women were raped, bishops and priests stoned to death. Upon the distracted country fell all its neighbors, including those three most ferocious of peoples, the Lithuanians, Pomeranians, and Prussians. Bratislav seized his chance. Sending the war signal round Bohemia, he fell like a sudden storm upon Poland, widowed of her prince. In the south, he took and burnt Krakow, rifling her of her ancient and precious treasures. Up to the north, he raged, raising towns and villages, carrying off Poles by hundreds into slavery. He finally ended his career of conquest and slaughter by solemnly transferring from their Polish shrine at Gneisen to Prague the bones of the martyred apostle Adalbert. While these things were happening, Henry became emperor. In the very year of his accession, he prepared an expedition against Bohemia, which did not mature. Hermann of Reichenau tells of envoys who came to Henry in the midst of his preparations for war bringing with them Bratislav's son as a hostage, and of a promise made by Bratislav that he himself would soon come to pay homage. This might well, for the time, seem sufficient. It was in the year 1040 that the first important expedition was launched against Bohemia. Bratislav's intentions were by this time quite clear, for he had, in the interval, 
not only demanded from Rome the erection of Prague into an archbishopric, a step which meant the severing of the ecclesiastical dependence of Bohemia upon Germany, but had also formed an alliance with Peter, the new king of Hungary, who had signalized the event by winter raids over the German frontiers. The wrongs of Poland and of Casimir, and the danger to Germany, were reasons amply justifying Henry's interventions. Preliminary negotiations probably consisted in Henry's ultimatum demanding reparation to Poland and the payment of the regular tribute to Germany. On Bratislav's refusal, the expedition was launched, but failed, August 1040. Henry, humiliated for the moment, was not defeated. He kept his grief deep in his heart, and the Bohemian overtures were rejected, as we have seen. Even before this refusal, the Bohemians and their ally, Peter of Hungary, were already raiding the frontier. In 1041, the German forces, which were very great, advanced more cautiously, and Henry, breaking his way into the country in the rear of its defending armies, found the countryside living as in the midst of peace. It was in August. For six weeks, the German forces lived at ease, the rich land supplying them plentifully with corn and cattle. Then, burning and destroying all that was left, and devastating far and wide, with the exception of two provinces which they left to their humbled foes, the armies towards the end of September moved to the trysting place above Prague. Meanwhile, Austrian knights, under the leadership of the young Babenberger prince Leopold, made a successful inroad from the south. Bratislav, unable to protect his land, made ineffectual overtures. Then he was deserted by his own people. The Archbishop of Prague, Severus, had been appointed by Udorich in regard for his skill in catering for the ducal table. This traitor now led a general desertion. The Bohemians promised Henry to deliver their duke bound into his hands. Bratislav, perforce, made an unqualified surrender. He renounced the royal title, so offensive to German ears. He promised full restitution to Poland. He gave his duchy into Henry's hands. In pledge of his faith, he sent his hostages, his own son, Spitignev, and the sons of five great Bohemian nobles. These, if Bratislav failed, Henry might put to any death he pleased. Henry at last accepted his submission. Bratislav himself built a way back to Bavaria for the booty-laden invaders, and a fortnight later he himself appeared at Ratisbon, and there before the king and assembled princes and many of his own chieftains, barefooted, more humiliated now than formerly he had been exalted, offered homage to Henry. His duchy was restored to him, with half the tribute remitted. He was moreover confirmed in the possession of Silesia, seized from the Poles, and then actually in his hands. His own splendid war horse, which Bratislav offered to Henry, with its saddle completely and marvelously wrought in gold and silver, was given in the Duke's presence to Leopold of Austria, the hero of the expedition. Once having sworn fealty, Bratislav maintained it loyally until the close of his life and his advice on military matters was of great service to Henry. The regrant of Breslau and the Silesian towns to Poland in 1054 was, however, a great strain even on his loyalty, and in spite of Henry's award, he recovered the lost cities for a time from Casimir by force of arms in the following year. Thence he would have proceeded to Hungary, but on his way he died. His successor, Spitignev, although his succession was ratified by Henry, plunged into a riot of animosity against everything German, expelling from Bohemian soil every man and woman of the hated nation, rich, poor, and pilgrim. Duke Casimir of Poland played throughout a less prominent part than his vigorous neighbor. Affairs at home kept him fully occupied, while his close early connection with Germany and the memory of the partition of Poland by Conrad would further deter him from any thought of imitating his father Mesko, who, like Boleslav, had claimed the title of king. Of his part in events between 1039 and 1041, we know little. 
With 500 horse, he went to Poland, where he was gladly received. He slowly recovered his land from foreigners and finally, 1047, overcame the last and greatest of the independent Polish chiefs, Mexislav of Masovia. He had secured the greater part of his inheritance. It remained to recover Silesia, seized by Bratislav in 1039 and confirmed to the Bohemian Duke by Henry. It is in 1050 that serious trouble first threatened. In this year, Casimir was definitely accused of usurping land granted by Henry to Bratislav, as well as of other unrecorded misdemeanors against the empire. Henry actually prepared an expedition against him, and war was averted only by the illness of the emperor and the alacrity and conciliatory spirit shown by Casimir. Coming to Goslar of his own free will, he exculpated himself on oath of the charge of aggression against Bohemia and consented to make the reparation demanded for the acts of which he was duly judged guilty by the princes. Thence he returned home with royal gifts. Strife, however, continued between Casimir and Bratislav, and at Whitsuntide 1054, both dukes were summoned before Henry at Kedlingburg. It is plain that in the meantime Casimir had made good his hold on Breslau, for the town and district are now confirmed to him by Henry, under condition, according to the Bohemian chronicler, of annual tribute to Bohemia. The dukes departed reconciled. In the following January, Bratislav died, having apparently again temporarily seized Silesia. Peace was eventually ratified between Poland and Bohemia by the marriage of Casimir's only daughter to Bratislav's successor. In spite of the wanderings of his youth and the long years spent in conflict, Casimir was a scholar. He is said to have addressed his troops in Latin verse and a friend of monks among whom he had been trained. That he was himself a monk at Cluny is a later legend. His last years were spent in the peaceful consolidation through church and state of what he had so hardly won. He died soon after Henry in 1058. The affairs of Hungary in the years 1040 to 1045 grouped themselves around King Peter, driven from his realm by the Magyar nobles and restored, but in vain, by Henry. His aid to Bratislav in the first years of Henry's reign had been prompted more by youthful insolence than by any fixed anti-German feeling. He was a Venetian on his father's side, and on succeeding his uncle St. Stephen in 1039, had promised him to maintain his widow Gisela, sister of Henry II, in her possessions. But after a year or so, he broke his faith, and she fell into poverty. This marks the time when, along with Bratislav, he began his raids into Germany. Two such raids, in 1039 and 1040, had been successful when a rebellion drove him from his realm into Germany. The new government was anti-German and inclined towards paganism, while the new king, Obo, was chosen from among the Magyar chiefs. Peter came, as we have seen, to Henry as a suppliant in August 1041. But Burgundian troubles forced Henry to put Hungary aside, and Obo himself began hostilities. Never before did Hungary carry off so great a booty from the Duchy of Bavaria as now, although a gallant resistance was offered by the Margrave Alderbert of Babenberg, founder of the Austrian house, and his warlike son Leopold. At Easter 1042, Obo was crowned as king. The puppet king, set up by Henry in his first counter-expedition, 1042, was at once expelled, but in 1043, as we saw, Henry obtained solid gain. The land from the Austrian territory to the Letha and March was by far the most lasting result of all his Hungarian campaigns. The boundary thus fixed remained, but the Hungarian crown could not be brought into any real dependence. A third expedition, 1044, restored Peter as a vassal, but by autumn 1046 he had fallen to disappear in prison amid the depths of Hungary. His cousin Andrew and Arpad took his throne. He dexterously used the renaissance
paganism, although it was covered over with a veneer of Christianity, and he did not wish for permanent warfare with his greater neighbor. Apologetic envoys gave Henry an excuse for delay, and for two years Hungary was left alone. Then the peace was disturbed by Henry's restless uncle, Gephardt of Ratisbon, who, 1049, made a raid into Hungary. In 1050, following raid and counter-raid, Henry, grieving that Hungary, which formerly, by the plain judgment of God, had owned his sway, was now by most wicked men snatched from him, called the Bavarian princes together at Nuremberg, which ancient city now for the first time appears in history. The defense of the frontiers was urged upon them, and next year the emperor himself invaded Hungary with an army gathered from all his duchies and tributary peoples. Disregarding Andrew's offer, he entered Hungary by the Danube, but when he had to leave his boats, he was entangled in the marshes and fighting had small result. The Altaish analyst dismisses the campaign as difficult and very troublesome. Shortly afterwards, however, Andrew seems to have made some sort of agreement, but in 1052 Henry had again to make an expedition, though of no glory and no utility to the realm. Pressburg was besieged for two months before it fell. Then once more came an agreement, made this time by the Pope's mediation. It was only of short duration. Cuno, the exiled Duke of Bavaria, was in arms against Henry and urged Andrew to war. Carinthia was invaded, 1054, and the Hungarians returned rejoicing with much booty. The Bavarians themselves forced Cuno into quietness. Henry was busy in Flanders. Thus, inconclusively, ends the story of his relations with Hungary. German supremacy, in fact, could not be maintained. The darkness in which the great king died was a shadow cast from the fierce and pagan lands beyond the Elbe and the Oder. The Slavs of the northeast were a welter of fierce peoples, whose hands were of old against all Christians, Dane, German, or Pole. Here and there precarious Christianity had made some slight inroad, but in general attempts at subjugation had bred a savage hatred for the name of Christian. The task of Christian civilization, formerly belonging to the German kings, was now taken up by Pole and Dane as rivals in a day of able rulers and of nations welded together by their new faith. Boleslav the Mighty of Poland, an enthusiastic apostle of Christianity, had subdued the Pomeranians and Prussians. After his death, his nephew, Canute of Denmark, made his power felt along the Baltic as far as, and including, Pomerania. This extension of his sway was rendered easier by the alliance with Conrad in 1025 and resulted in ten years' peace. But 1035, the year of Canute's death, saw a general disturbance in one of the most savage of recorded Slav incursions. Among the many Wendish tribes, it is necessary to distinguish between the Slavs on the Baltic beyond the Lower Elbe, Obotrites and others, and the inland Slavs beyond the Middle Elbe, the Liotizi. The former were more accessible to both Germans and Danes, and as they lived under princes were partly Christianized and partly, though uneasily, subject to Germany. But the Liotizi, wild and free communities living under elected rulers, were a more savage people. They might be useful as allies against the Poles, whom they hated more than they did the Germans under the tolerant Conrad, but there could be for them nothing approaching even semi-subjection. With them, in the years preceding Henry's accession, direct conflict had arisen through the avarice of the Saxons, upon whom Conrad had thrown the responsibility of defense. Repeated raids followed, and Henry's first trial in arms was against them. Then a campaign in 1036, followed by great cruelty on Conrad's part and forced quiet, which lasted until the end of Henry's reign. The other Slavs, those of the Baltic, had dealings with the Dukes of Saxony and the Archbishops of Hamburg-Bremen, rather than with the Emperor. Archbishop Albrand, 1035 to 1045, built in Hamburg a strong church and palace as a refuge from Slav raids. 
Duke Bernard II followed his example with another stronghold in the same city. Duke and Bishop attended to their respective duties, one of exacting tribute and the other of evangelization. But there was frequent restlessness and grumbling at tribute demanded by the Duke and episcopal dues demanded by the Bishop of Oldenburg, which, until 1160, when the See of Lübeck was founded, was the episcopal center for the Obutrites. Also, when Adalbert, 1045, succeeded Albrand, Duke and Archbishop fell into strife. Bernard looked upon Adalbert as a spy in Henry's service. Adalbert strove to free his see from ducal encroachments. He finished the stone fortifications of Bremen as a protection against Bernard rather than against the Slavs. He added to those of Hamburg and as further defense built a fortress on the banks of the Elbe which its garrison made into a robber hold until the outraged inhabitants destroyed it. In spite of large schemes for a province with more suffragans, Adalbert did little for the Slavs. It was neither Archbishop nor Saxon Duke who maintained peace among these Slavs of the Elbe, but Duke Godeskalk. This remarkable noble was studying at Lüneburg when his father, an Obotrite prince, was murdered for his cruelty by a Saxon. Godeskalk at once renounced Christianity and learning alike, and at the head of a horde of Leotizi set out to avenge his father's death. Suddenly his heart smote him for the woe and death he was dealing out. He gave himself up to Duke Bernard, who sent him into Denmark. There he took service with Canute and went with him to England. After the deaths of Canute and his sons, he came home. He found the Obotrites suffering from a heavy defeat at the hands of Magnus of Norway, in which the family of Ratibor, their leading chief, had been all slain. He was able to regain his father's place and the leadership of the Obotrites. He extended his power as far as the country of the Liutizi, and the wide district of the Bremen diocese feared him as a king and paid him tribute. With the neighboring Christian rulers, Scandinavian and German, he kept up a vigorous friendship. It was he who bore the burden of keeping peace, and shortly before Henry's death we find him, the Saxon duke and the Danish king, in allied expedition against the Liutizi. To the church, which stood for civilization, he was also a friend. He established monasteries and canons regular in Lübeck, Oldenburg, and elsewhere. Throughout the land, he built churches, and to their service, he summoned missionary priests who freely did the work of God. Like Oswald in Northumbria, he traveled with them and often acted as interpreter. Had he lived, says the chronicler, he would have brought all the pagans to the Christian faith. He survived Henry some ten years, being murdered in 1066. The peace imposed by Conrad upon the Liutizi was twice broken under Henry. In 1045, he had to lead an expedition against them, but they promptly submitted and returned to tribute. When ten years later they again broke bounds, Henry sent against them William of the Nordmark and Count Dietrich. At Prislava, where a ruined castle still overlooks the confluence of Havel and Elbe, the Margrave was ambushed, and both he and Dietrich fell. These tidings reached Henry before his death and with it the frontier troubles grew more intense. To this great king and emperor, there has sometimes been ascribed a conscious attempt at a restoration of the empire of Charlemagne, limited geographically, but of worldwide importance through its control of the Western Church from its center, Rome. But there is little real trace of such a conception on Henry's part, save in the one feature of that ordered rule which was inseparably bound up with Charlemagne's empire. Too much has been sometimes made of Henry's attitude towards Cluny and of his marriage with Agnes of Poitou and Aquitaine as paving the way for the acquisition of France. But this is a mere conjecture based upon a wish to reconcile later German ideals with the work of one of their greatest kings. He did use the sympathy of the church and especially of Cluny in Burgundy as a help towards the stability of ordered imperial rule, and that was all. It was no new and subtle scheme, but an old established procedure, 
a piece of honest policy, not a cynical design to trap France by means of piety. Henry's mind was, it is true, preoccupied with the Middle Kingdom, but there is no trace of any endeavor to pave the way for an eventual reunion under the scepter of his heirs of the whole Carolingian Empire. There is, however, far stronger basis for the belief that he meant an imperial control over the papacy than that he aimed at an eventual supremacy over France. For it is plain that Henry not only unmade and made popes, but that he accepted the offer of the patriciate in the belief that it meant control over papal elections, and that he secured from the Romans a sworn promise to give to himself and to his heir the chief voice in all future elections. Whatever the exact force of the emperor's control, the promise meant that no one could be pope except with his approval. It put the Roman see almost, if not quite, into the position of a German bishopric, and Henry used the power placed in his hands. Whether the Romans would ever have revolted against Henry's choice, we do not know, for his wisdom never put them to the test. But what worked well under Henry at a time when churchmen and statesmen had roughly the same practical aims, although maybe divergent theories, might not work well under a less high-minded ruler under whom church and state had grown into divergent ideals. Henry did not aim at imperial aggrandizement. He did not wish to lower the papacy any more than he wished to conquer France. He was a lover not of power but of order. In order, he meant to guard. Moreover, he was a man of fact and actuality. He respected law. He respected custom. They must, however, be law and custom that had worked and would work well. He showed this in his dealings with the papacy. He showed it in his dealings with the tribal duchies in Germany. When it is a case of giving a duke to Bavaria, although custom was absolutely on the side of Bavaria in electing its duke, he ignored custom and nominated. He flouted the Bavarians' right of election, not because he thought little of law and custom, but because he was concerned with the practical enforcement of order. It was so, too, with abbots and monasteries. Sometimes he allowed free election. Sometimes he simply nominated. He was guided by the circumstances and by the state of the monastery. He always aimed at a worthy choice, but cared little how it came about and corrupt monks were little likely to elect a reforming abbot. In Germany, with its tribal duchies, he had no settled policy. A few months after Conrad's death, Henry himself was Duke of Swabia, Bavaria, and Carinthia, as well as king. He followed his father's policy in uniting the duchies with a crown, unless he saw good reason for the contrary. Hence, he gave away one great duchy after another when it seemed good. He gave Bavaria to Henry of Luxembourg when it was threatened by Obo of Hungary, Swabia to the Lorraine or Otto when Godfrey was troubling the neighboring Lorraine, and he did not fear to raise houses that might become rivals in the empire if they served the present use. It was so with his patronage of Luxembourgers and of Bobenbergs, and yet it must be confessed that Henry's dealings with the duchies were not happy. Bavaria and Carinthia he left largely hostile to the crown. Lorraine was torn by rebellion because in the case of Godfrey, Henry had misjudged his man. Personal genius was lacking, too, in his dealings with the borderland states, although with Bohemia and Hungary he could claim success. And in Burgundy, if anywhere, he did succeed. Upon internal order, he had set his heart. We recall his declarations of indulgence and the peace undreamt of through the ages which followed. Yet the peace was itself precarious, though his example was fruitfully followed afterwards. In Germany, breathing a while more peacefully during recurring Landfrieden, had caused to bless the day at Constance. In himself, he seems to have lacked breadth and geniality. With humble fidelity, he took up the task of his inheritance. His single-mindedness and purity of character are testified to by all. There were great men whom he chose out or who trusted him. Hermann of Cologne, Bruno of Toul, Leo IX, Peter Damiani. Yet he could fail with great men as with smaller. 
Leo the Ninth towards the end, and Wazo of Liege he misjudged, the difficult Godfrey of Lorraine, whom he failed to understand, well nigh wrecked his empire. It was this personal weakness that made him, in his last years, fall below his own high standard, unable to cope with the many difficulties of his empire. He seems weary when he comes to die. Germany looked back to him, not for the good that he had done, but for the evil which came so swiftly when his day was over. In Germany, he did not build to stand. One great thing he did to change history, and in doing it, he raised up the power that was to cast down his son and destroy his empire. His tomb and his monument should be in Rome. End of section 43. Section 44 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Booker. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire, Section 44. The Vikings, Part One, by Alan Mulwer. Chapter Thirteen: The Vikings. The term Viking is a derivative of the Old Norse vik, a creek, bay, or fjord, and means one who haunts such an opening and uses it as a base whence raids may be made on the surrounding country. The word is now commonly applied to those Norsemen, Danes, and Swedes who harried Europe from the 8th to the 11th centuries, and in such phrases as the Viking Age, Viking Civilization, is used in a still wider sense as a convenient term for Scandinavian civilization at a particular stage in its development. It is in this larger sense that the term is used in the present chapter covering the activities of the Northmen in peace as well as in war. The term Viking in its narrower sense is no more descriptive of this age than buccaneering would be of the age of Elizabeth. Except along the narrow line of the Eider, Scandinavia has no land boundaries of importance and is naturally severed from the rest of Europe. Though known to Greek and Roman geographers and historians, it was almost entirely unaffected by Roman civilization. It was not till the Scandinavian peoples were driven by stress of circumstance to find fresh homes that they found that the sea, instead of dividing them from the rest of Europe, really furnished them with a ready and easy path of attack against those nations of northwest Europe who had either neglected or forgotten the art of seamanship. The history of the Teutonic North from the middle of the 6th to the end of the 8th century is almost a blank, at least in so far as history concerns itself with the record of definite events. During the first half of the 6th century, there had been considerable activity in Denmark and southern Sweden. About the year 520, Chocolaicus, king of the Danes, or, according to another authority, of the Gete, i.e. Gotar, in South Sweden, made a raid on the territory of the Franks on the Lower Rhine, but was defeated and slain by Theodebert, son of the Frankish king Theodoric, as he was withdrawing from Frisia with extensive plunder. This expedition finds poetic record in the exploits of Higelac, king of the Geats, in Beowulf. Some forty years later, there is mention of them in Venantius Fortunatus' eulogy of Duke Lupus of Champagne. They were now in union with the Saxons and made a raid on western Frisia, but were soon driven back by the Franks. From this time until the first landings of Vikings near Dorchester, circa 787, the earliest attacks on the coast of France against which Charles the Great made defense in 800, and the first encounters between the Danes and Franks on the borders of southern Denmark in 808, we know almost nothing of the history of Scandinavia. 
at least in so far as we look for information in the annals or histories of the time. The story of these two hundred years has to some extent been pieced together from scraps of historical, philological, and archaeological evidence. Professor Zimmer showed that it was possible that the attacks of unknown pirates on the island of Aig in the Hebrides and on Tory Island off Donegal, described in certain Irish annals of the 7th century, were really the work of early Viking invaders, and the witness of Irish legends and sagas tend to prove that already, by the end of the 7th century, Irish missionaries were settled in the Shetlands and Faroes, where they soon came into contact with the Northmen. Evidence for the advance from the other side, of the Northmen toward the west and south, has been found by Dr. Jacobson in his work on the place names of the Shetlands. He has shown that many of these names must be due to Norse settlements from a period long before the recognized Viking movements of the ninth century. Archaeological evidence can also be adduced in support of this belief in early intercourse between Scandinavia and the islands of the West. Sculptured stones found in the island of Gotland show already by 700 clear evidence of Celtic art influence. Indeed, archaeologists are now agreed that in the 8th century and even earlier, there were trade connections between Scandinavia and the West. Long before English or Irish, Franks or Frisians knew the Northmen as Viking raiders, they had been familiar with them in peaceful mercantile intercourse, and it is probable that in the 8th century there were a good number of Scandinavian merchants settled in Western Europe. Their influence on the trade of the West was only exceeded by that of the Frisians, who were the chief trading and naval power of the 7th and 8th centuries, and it is most probable that it was the crushing of Frisian power by Charles Martel in 734, and their final subjection by Charles the Great toward the close of the 8th century, which helped prepare the way for the great Viking advance. About the year 800, the relations between the North and West Germanic peoples underwent a great change both in character and extent. We find the coasts of England, Ireland, Frisia, and France attacked by Viking raiders, while on the southern borders of Denmark there was constant friction between the kings of that country and the forces of the empire. The question has often been asked, what were the causes of this sudden outburst of hostile activity on the part of the Northmen? Monkish chroniclers said they were sent by God in punishment for the sins of the age. Norman tradition, as preserved by Dudo and William of Jumiege, attributed the raids to the necessity for expansion consequent on overpopulation. Polygamy had led to a rapid increase of population, and many of the youth of the country were driven forth to gain fresh lands for themselves elsewhere. Polygamy does not necessarily lead to overpopulation, but polygamy among the ruling classes, as it prevailed in the North, means a large number of younger sons for whom provision must be made, and it is quite possible that stress of circumstances caused many such to visit foreign lands on Viking raids. Of the political condition of the Scandinavian countries, we know very little at this time. We hear, however, in Denmark, in the early years of the ninth century, of long disputes as to the succession, and it is probable that difficulties of this kind may have prompted many to go on foreign expeditions. In Norway, we know that the growth of the power of Harold Fairhair in the middle portion of the ninth century led to the adoption of a Viking life by many of the more independent spirits, and it is quite possible that earlier efforts toward consolidation among the petty Norwegian kings may have produced similar effects. Social and political conditions may thus have worked together, preparing the ground for Scandinavian activity in the ninth century, 
and it was perhaps, as suggested above, the destruction of Frisian power which removed the last check on the energy of the populous nations of the North. Subheading Early Raids on England and Ireland The first definite record of Viking invasion is probably that found in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, SA 787, which tells of the coming of Danish ships to England in the days of Beortric, king of Wessex. They landed in the neighborhood of Dorchester and slew the king's reeve. Certain versions of the chronicle call them ships of the Northmen and tell us they came from Herethaland. There can be little doubt that this is the West Norwegian district of Herthaland, and that Northmen here, as elsewhere in the chronicle, means Norwegians. Footnote. Attempts have been made to identify Herethaland with the district of Hardesisil in Jutland, and to prove that these Northmen were Danes, but the weight of evidence seems to the present writer to be all in favor of the identification with Hertheland. The name Hiruath, commonly given to Norway by Gaelic writers, is another version of the same name. The term Danish is probably generic for Scandinavian, the chronicler using the name of the nationality best known to him. In June 793, the church at Lindisfarne was destroyed, and a year later the monastery of St. Paul at Jero. In 795, Vikings landed in Skye and visited Lambay Island off Dublin, and in 798, the Isle of Man. These invaders were certainly Norse, for the Irish analysts mention expressly the first arrival of the Danes in Ireland in 849 and draw a rigid distinction between the Norwegian or white foreigners and the Danish or black ones. England was not troubled again by Viking raiders until 835 but the attacks on Ireland continued almost without cessation. Iona was destroyed in 802. By 807, the invaders had penetrated inland as far as Roscommon, and four years later they had made their way round the west coast of Ireland as far as Cork. In 821, the Hoth Peninsula was plundered, and during the next few years, the rich monasteries of North Ireland were destroyed. By the year 834, the Northmen had visited nearly the whole of the island, and no place was safe from their raids. About this time there came a change in the character of the attacks in that large fleets began to anchor in the lochs and harbors and estuaries with which the coast of Ireland abounds. Thence they made lengthy raids on the surrounding country, often staying the whole winter through, instead of paying summer visits only as they had done hitherto. At the same time they often strengthened their base by the erection of forts on the shores of the waters in which they had established themselves. Subheading The Danish Kingdom When the Viking raids were resumed in England in 835, it is fairly certain that they were the work of Danish and not of Norwegian invaders. The Norsemen had found other fields of activity in Ireland, while the Danes, who had already visited the chief estuaries of the Frankish coast, now crossed to England. At first their attacks were directed toward the southern shores of Britain, but by 841 they had penetrated into Lindsay and East Anglia. London and Rochester were sacked in 842. In 851 the Danes wintered in Thanet, and four years later they stayed in Sheppey. The Danish fleet in this year numbered some 350 ships. It was probably this same fleet, somewhat reduced in numbers, which in 852 sailed around Britain and captured Dublin. With the winterings in Thanet and Sheppey, the Viking invasions of England had reached the same stage of development as in Ireland. We have passed from the period of isolated raids to that of persistent attacks with a view to permanent conquest.
The mainland of Western Europe was also exposed during these years to attacks of a twofold character. In the first place, trouble arose on the boundary between southern Denmark and Frankish territory, owing to the desire of the Danish kings to extend their authority southward. In the second, constant raids were made along the whole of the shores of Europe from Frisia to Aquitaine. The friction between the Danes and their neighbors on the south was continuous through the last years of the 8th and the greater part of the ninth century. Charles the Great, by his campaigns against the Saxons and Nordlbingians, had advanced toward the Danish boundary on the Eider, and the Danes first gave offense in 777, when their king Sigifridus, Old Norse Sigoth, gave shelter to the Saxon patriot Widukind. Gradually the Frankish power advanced, and in 809 a fort was established at Itzehoe, Essesfeld, on the Stor, north of the Elba. The Danes also made advances on their side, and in 804 their king Godfridus, Guthoth in Old Norse, collected a fleet and army at Schleswig. Schleswig. In 808, after a successful campaign against the Obotrites, a Slavonic people in modern Mecklenburg, he constructed a boundary wall for his kingdom, stretching from the Baltic to the Eider. He received tribute not only from the Obotrites, but also from the Nordlbingians and Frisians. He was preparing to attack Charles the Great himself, when he died suddenly by the hand of a retainer in 810. There can be little doubt that this Godfridus is to be identified with the Gotricus of Saxo Grammaticus and Guthroth the Ingling of Scandinavian tradition. If that is so, Guthroth Godfridus was slain in Stifle Sound, probably on the coast of Vestfold, and was king not only of Denmark but also of much of southern Norway, including Vestfold, Vingulmork, and perhaps Agthir, as well as of Vermland in Sweden. Later events confirm the evidence for the existence of a Dano-Norwegian kingdom of this kind. In 812, a dispute as to the succession arose between Sigifridus, Nepos to King Guthoth, and Anulo. Old Norse Oli, Nepos to a former king, Herioldus, Old Norse Heraldr, or Harold, probably the famous Harold Huldetan, slain at the Battle of Bravala. Both claimants were slain in fight, but the party of Anulo were victorious. Anulo's brothers, Harold and Regenfredus, Old Norse Ragenfrother, became joint kings and soon after we hear of them going to Westfold, quote, the extreme district of their realm, whose people and chiefs were refusing to be made subject to them, close quote. Fortune fluctuated between Harold and the sons of Godfridus during the next few years, but Harold secured the support of the emperor when he accepted baptism at Mayence in 826 with his wife, son, and nephew. After his baptism he returned to Denmark through Frisia, where the emperor had granted him Reustigen as a retreat in case of necessity. An attempt to regain Denmark was frustrated, and Harold probably availed himself of his Frisian grant during the next few years. The next incident belongs to the year 836, when Horik, Old Norse Harakar, one of the sons of Godfridus, sent an embassy to Louis the Pious denying complicity in the Viking raids made on Frisia at that time, and these denials continued during the next few years. In 837, Hemingus, Old Norse Heminger, probably a brother of Harold and himself a Christian, was slain while defending the island of Valkyren against pirates. These two incidents are important as they tend to show that the Viking raids were rather individual than national enterprises, and that there was an extensive peaceful settlement of Danes in Frisia. In addition to the grant of Reustringen, 
the emperor had assigned, 826, another part of Frisia to Rorik, Old Norse Hororiker, a brother of Harold, on condition that he should ward off piratical attacks. Subhead Preaching of Christianity It was during these years that the influence of Christianity first made itself felt in Scandinavia. The earliest knowledge of Christianity probably came, as is so often the case, with the extension of trade. Danes and Swedes settled in Friesland and elsewhere for the purposes of trade, and either they or their emissaries must have made the white Christ known to their heathen countrymen. The first definite mission to the north was undertaken by St. Villebrard at the beginning of the 8th century. He was favorably received by the Danish king Ongendus, Old Norse Angentur, but his mission was without fruit. In 822, Pope Paschal appointed Ebbo, Archbishop of Aram, as his legate among the northern peoples. He undertook a mission to Denmark in 823 and made a few converts, but it was in 826, when King Harold was baptized and prepared to return to Denmark, that the first opportunity of preaching Christianity in Denmark really came. Subheading, St. Anskar. With the opportunity came the man, and Harold was accompanied on his return by Anskar, who more than any other deserves to be called Apostle of the Scandinavian North. Leaving his monastery at Corvi, Corby in Saxony, and filled with zeal to preach the gospel to the heathen, Anskar made many converts, but Harold's ill success in regaining the sovereignty injured his mission in Denmark, and two years later, at the request of the Swedes themselves, he preached the gospel in Sweden, receiving a welcome at Birka, or Bjorko, from the Swedish king Bern, Old Norse Bjorn. After a year and a half's mission in Sweden, Anskar was recalled and made Archbishop of Hamburg, and given, jointly with Ebbo, jurisdiction over the whole of the northern realms. Gautbert was made first Bishop of Sweden, and founded a church at Sigtuna, but after a few years' work he was expelled in a popular rising. Little progress was made in Denmark. No churches were established, but Anskar did a good deal in training Danish youths in Christian principles at his school in Hamburg. Anskar's position became a very difficult one when the lands from which his income was derived passed to Charles the Bald, and still more so, when the seat of his jurisdiction was destroyed by the Danes in 845. Louis the German made amends by appointing him to the bishopric of Bremen, afterwards united to a restored archbishopric of Hamburg. Anskar now set himself to the task of gaining influence first with King Horik, and later with his successor, Horik the Younger. He was so far successful that the first Christian church in Denmark was established at Schleswig, followed soon after by one at Reba. He also concerned himself with Sweden once more, gaining authority for his mission by undertaking embassies from both Horik and Louis. He obtained permission for the preaching of Christianity and continued his activities to the day of his death in 865. Anskar had done much for Christianity in the north. His own fiery zeal had, however, been ill-supported even by his chosen followers, and the tangible results were few. Christianity had found a hearing in Denmark and Sweden, but Norway was as yet untouched. A few churches had been built in the southern part of both countries, a certain number of adherents had been gained among the nobles and trading classes, but the mass of the people remained untouched. The first introduction of Christianity was too closely bound up with the political and diplomatic relations of Northern Europe for it to be otherwise, and the Episcopal organization was far more elaborate than was required. Subheading 
Viking Raids on Frankish Territory With the death of Louis the Pious in 840, a change took place in the relations between Danes and Franks. In the quarrels over the division of the empire, Lothar encouraged attacks on the territory of his rivals. Harold was bribed by a grant of the island of Valkyren and neighboring district, so that in 842 we find him as far south as the Moselle, while Horik himself took part in an expedition up the Elba against Louis the German. In 847, when the brothers had for the time being patched up their quarrels, they stultified themselves by sending embassies to Horik, asking him to restrain his subjects from attacking the Christians. Horik had not the power, even if he had the desire, but, fortunately for the empire, Denmark was now crippled by internal dissensions. This prevented any attack on the part of the Danish nation as a whole, but Viking raids continued without intermission. The first sign of dissension in Denmark appeared in 850, when Horik was attacked by his two nephews and compelled to share his kingdom with them. In 852, Harold, the long-exiled king of Denmark, was slain for his treachery to Lothar and two years later a revolution took place. We are told that after twenty years ravaging in Frankish territory, the Vikings made their way back to their fatherland, and there a dispute arose between Horik and his nephew Godurm, Old Norse Guthormer. A disastrous battle was fought, and so great was the slaughter that only one boy of the royal line remained. He became king as Horik the Younger. Encouraged by these dissensions, Rorik and Godifridus, brother and son respectively to Harold, attempted in 855 to win the Danish kingdom, but were compelled to retire again to Frisia. Rorik was more successful in 857 when he received permission from Horik to settle in the part of his kingdom lying between the sea and the Eider, i.e. perhaps in North Frisia, a district consisting of a strip of coastline between the town of Reba and the mouth of the Eider, with the islands adjacent. We have now carried the story of the relations between Denmark and her continental neighbors down to the middle of the ninth century the same period to which we have traced the story of the Viking raids in England and Ireland. Before we tell the story of the transformation which those raids underwent just at this time, we must say something of the Viking attacks on the maritime borders of the continent. The first mention of raids on the coast of Western Europe is in 800, when Charles the Great visited the coastline from the Somme to the Seine and arranged for a fleet and coast guard to protect it against Viking attacks. In 810, probably under direct instruction from the Danish king Godfridus, a fleet of some 200 vessels ravaged Frisia and its islands. Once more Charles the Great strengthened his fleet and the guarding of the shores, but raids continued to be a matter of almost yearly occurrence. The Emperor Louis pursued the same policy as his father. Nevertheless, by 821, the Vikings had sailed round Brittany and sacked the monasteries in the islands of Noirmoutier and Ri. From 814 to 833, attacks were almost entirely confined to these districts and it is possible that these Vikings had their winter quarters in Ireland, where they were specially active at this time. At any rate, it was to Wexford that one of these fleets returned in 820. The later years of Louis's reign, from 834, were troubled ones. The empire was weakened by the emperor's differences with his sons, and the Vikings had laid a firm hold on Frisia. They were attracted by its rich trade, and more especially by the wealth of Dorostad, one of the most important trading cities of the empire. Before the death of the emperor in 840, 
Dorostad had been four times ravaged, and the Vikings had sailed up the chief rivers, burning both Utrecht and Antwerp. Their success was the more rapid owing to the disloyalty of the Frisians themselves, and possibly to help given them by Harold and his brother Rorik. But the exact attitude of these princes, and of the Danish king himself toward the raiders, it is difficult to determine. There are rather too many protests of innocence on the part of Horik for us to believe in their entire genuineness. After 840, the quarrels between the heirs of Louis the Pious laid Western Europe open to attack even more than it had been hitherto. In that year the Vikings sailed up the Seine for the first time as far as Rouen, while in 843 they appeared for the first time on the Loire. Here they were helped by the quarrels over the Aquitanian succession, and it is said that pilots, lent by Count Lambert, steered them up the Loire. They then took up their winter quarters on the island of Noirmoutier, where they seemed determined to make a permanent settlement. The invasions in France had reached the same stage of development to which we have already traced them in England and Ireland. It is in connection with this expedition that we have one of the rare indications of the actual home of the invaders. They are called Vestfaldingi, and must therefore have come from the Norwegian district of Vestfold, which, as we have seen, formed part of the Danish kingdom about this time. Subheading The Vikings in Spain in 843, the Northmen advanced a stage further south. Sailing past Bordeaux, they ravaged the upper basin of the Garonne. In the next year, they visited Spain. Repelled by the bold defense of the Asturians, they sailed down the west coast of the peninsula and in September appeared before Lisbon. The Moors offered a stout resistance, and the Vikings moved on to Cadiz, whence they ravaged the province of Sidonia in southern Andalusia. Penetrating as far as Seville, they captured that city, with the exception of its citadel, and raided Cordova. In the end, they were outgeneraled by the Muslims and forced to retreat with heavy loss. Taking to their ships once more, they ravaged the coast as far as Lisbon and returned to the Gironde before the end of the year. It was probably on this expedition that some of the Vikings made a raid on Arsila in Morocco. After the expedition, embassies were exchanged between the Viking king and the Emir Abd al-Rahman II. The Moorish embassy would seem to have found the king in Ireland, and it is possible that he was the great Viking chief Turgish, of whom we must now speak. End of section 44. Read by Tom Booker, Knoxville, Tennessee, April 28, 2024. Section 45 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Booker. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire, The Vikings, Part 2, by Alan Mulwer. We have traced the development of Viking activity in Ireland and England, for Ireland down to the year 834. It was just at this time that the great leader Turgish, Old Norse Turgister, made his appearance in North Ireland and attempted to establish sovereignty over all the foreigners in Erin and gain the overlordship of the whole country. He conquered North Ireland and raided Meath and Connacht, while his wife Ota, Old Norse Arthur, gave audience upon the altar of Clonmacnoise. His power culminated in 841 when he usurped the abbacy of Armagh. In 845 he was captured by the Irish, 
and drowned in Loch Owel. By this time, so numerous were the invading hosts that the chroniclers tell us, quote, After this there came great sea-cast floods of foreigners into Erin, so that there was not a point without a fleet. Close quote. In 849, the invasions developed a new phase. Hitherto, while the Irish had been weakened by much internecine warfare, their enemies had worked with one mind and heart. Now we read, quote, A naval expedition of seven score of the foreigners came to exercise power over the foreigners who were before them, so that they disturbed all Ireland afterwards. Close quote. This means that the Danes were now taking an active part in the Scandinavian invasions of Ireland and we soon find them disputing supremacy with the earlier Norwegian settlers. At the same time, we have the first mention of intrigues between Irish factions and the foreign invaders, intrigues which were destined to play an important part in the Irish wars of the next fifty years. For a time Dublin was in the hands of the Danes, but in 853 one Auli, i.e. Olaf, son of the king of Lochlan, i.e. Norway, came to Ireland and received the submission of Danes and Norsemen alike, while tribute was given him by the native Irish. Henceforward, Dublin was the chief stronghold of Norse power in Ireland. Subhead, Olaf the White. This Auli was Olaf the White of Norse tradition, the representative of that branch of the Ingling family who, according to Ari Frothi, settled in Ireland. Affairs were now further complicated by the fact that many Irish forsook Christianity and joined the Norsemen in their plunderings. These recreant Irish, who probably intermarried with the Norsemen, were known as the Gaul Goyle, i.e. the foreign Irish, and played an important part in the wars of the next few years. One of their leaders was Caetil Find, i.e. Caetil the White, a Norseman with an Irish nickname. Usually they fought on the side of the Norsemen, but at times they played for their own hand. Olaf was assisted by his brothers Imhar, Old Norse Ivar, and Ausle, Old Norse Althgis and married the daughter of Et Finliath, MacNeil, king of all Ireland. Dublin, Waterford, Limerick, and occasionally Cork were the centers of Norse activity at this time, but there seems to have been no unity of action among their forces. In 866, Olaf and Authgis made a successful expedition to Pictland, and again in 870-1, Olaf and Ivar made a raid on Scotland. Olaf now returned to Norway to assist his father Gofrith, Old Norse Guthfrith, and possibly to take part with him in the great fight at Hafsfjord against Harold Fairhair. We hear nothing more of Olaf, and two years later Ivar, quote, king of the Norsemen of all Ireland and Britain, close quote, ended his life. Subheading, Ragnar Lothbrok. There now appear on the scene Viking leaders of a different family, which seems to have overshadowed that of Olaf. They were the sons of one Ragnar, who had been expelled from his sovereignty in Norway. Ragnar had remained in the Orkneys, but his elder sons came to the British Isles, quote, being desirous of attacking the Franks and Saxons, close quote. Not content with this, they pushed on from Ireland across the Cantabrian Sea until they reached Spain. After a successful campaign against the Moors in Africa, they returned to Ireland and settled in Dublin. So runs the story in the Fragments of Irish Annals, edited by Dugald MacFirbis, and there can be little doubt of its substratum of truth, or of the identification of this Ragnall and his sons with the well-known figures 
of Ragnar Lothbrok and his sons. In 877, Ragnar's son Albdan, Old Norse Halfdan, was killed on Strangford Loch while fighting against the North champion Bereda, Old Norse Bartha, who was attached to the house of Olaf. At this point, the wars of the Goyal with the Gowl notes a period of rest for the men of Erin, lasting some forty years and ending in 916. This statement is substantially true. We do not hear of any large fleets coming to Ireland, and during these years, Viking activity seems chiefly to have centered in Britain. Trouble was only renewed when the success of the campaigns of Edward the Elder in England once more drove the Vikings westward. We have traced the history of the Vikings in England down to the first settlement in 851 and 855. During the years which followed, there were raids on the south made by Vikings from Frankish territory, but the great development took place in 866, when a large Danish army took up its quarters in East Anglia, whence they advanced to York in 867. Northumbria was weakened by dissension, and the Danes captured York without much trouble. This city was henceforward the stronghold of Scandinavian power in northern England, and the Saxon Jeforwick soon became the Norse Jorvik, or York. The Danes set up a puppet king Ecbert in Northumbria north of the Tyne and reduced Mercia to submission. Thence they marched into East Anglia as far as Thetford and engaged the forces of Edmund, king of East Anglia, defeating and slaying him. But whether in actual battle or, as popular tradition would have it, in later martyrdom is uncertain. The death of St. Edmund soon became an event of European fame, and no event in the Danish invasions was more widely known and no Danish leader more heartily execrated than Ivar, their commander on this occasion. After their victory in East Anglia, the Danes attacked Wessex. Their struggle with Ethelred and his brother Alfred was long and fierce. Subheading Settlement of the Dane Law in the end, Danes and English came to terms by the Peace of Wedmore, 878, and the ensuing, quote, Peace of Alfred and Guthrum, close quote, 885, defined the boundary between Alfred's kingdom and the Danish realm in East Anglia. It ran by the Thames estuary to the mouth of the Lee, a few miles east of London, then up the Lee to its source near Leighton Buzzard then eastwards along the Ouse to Watling Street, somewhere near Fenny or Stony Stratford. The northern half of Mercia was also in Danish hands, their authority centering in the five boroughs of Lincoln, Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, and Stamford. Northumbria was at the same time under Viking rule, its king until 877 being that Halfdan, Halfdena, who was killed on Strangford Loch. There can be little doubt that the chief Viking leaders during these years, Halfdana, Ivar, and Ubi, were the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, the greatest of Viking heroes in Scandinavian tradition. But it is impossible to say how much truth there may be in the story which makes their attacks part of a scheme of vengeance for the torture and death of Ragnar at the hands of Alla, king of Northumbria. One incident is perhaps of interest in connection with the family of Lothbrok. When Ubi was fighting in Devonshire in 878, the English captured from him a raven banner which, say the annals of St. Neot, was woven for the sons of Lothbrok by their sisters. Though Alfred had secured an enlarged and independent kingdom, his troubles were not at an end, and during the years from 880 to 896, England suffered from attacks made by raiders issuing from their quarters on the Seine, the Somme, and other continental rivers. The Northumbrian 
and East Anglian settlers remained neutral on the whole, but they must have been much unsettled by the events of these years. And when they commenced raiding once more, Alfred built a fleet of vessels to meet them, which were both swifter and steadier than the Danish ships. After 896, the struggle between English and Danes was confined almost entirely to those already settled in the island, no fresh raiders being mentioned until 921. Subheading The Vikings in France, Spain, and Italy. During all this time, the Vikings were almost continuously active on the continent. Raids on Frankish territory continued without cessation, and it was only on the Eider boundary that a permanent peace was established by a treaty between Louis the German and King Horik. In 845, a Danish fleet of some 120 vessels sailed up the Seine under the leadership of Regen Harris, i.e., probably Ragnar Lothbrok himself. Paris was destroyed, and the Viking attack was only bought off by the payment of a large Dane gelb. The years from 850 to 878 have been said, not without justice, to mark the high tide of Viking invasion in western Frankish territory. We find Danish armies taking up more or less permanent quarters on the Rhine, the Scheldt, the Somme, the Seine, the Loire, and the Garonne, prominent among their leaders being one Berno, or Bjorna Jarnsitha, Ironside, another son of Ragnar Lothbrok. Curious light is thrown on the effect of these raids upon the peasantry by an incident in 859 when we hear of a rising of the populace between the Seine and the Loire in the hope of expelling the Danes. The annals are not quite clear as to whether it was the Frankish nobles or the Danes who crushed the rising, but the outbreak indicates dissatisfaction with the half-hearted defense of the country by the nobility. In the years 859 to 862, a second great expedition to Spain and the Mediterranean took place. Sailing from the Seine under the leadership of Bjorn Jarnsitha and Hasting, Old North Hastein, they made an unsuccessful attack on Galicia and sailed round the coast through the Straits of Gibraltar. They attacked Nacor on the coast of Morocco. There was fierce fighting with the Moors, but in the end the Vikings were victorious, and many of the, quote, blue men, close quote, as they called the Moors, were ultimately carried off prisoners to Ireland, where we hear of their fate in the fragments of Irish annals. Returning to Spain, they landed at Murcia and proceeded thence to the Balearic Islands. Ravaging these, they made their way north to the French border, landed in Roussillon, and advanced inland as far as arles sur tec Taking to their ships, they sailed north along the coast to the mouth of the Rhône and spent the winter on the island of Camargue in the Rhône Delta. Plundering the old Roman cities of Provence, they went up the Rhône as far as Valence. In the spring they sailed to Italy, where they captured several towns including Pisa and Luna, at the mouth of the Magra, south of the Bay of Spezia. The conquest of Luna was famed both in Norman and Scandinavian tradition. It is represented as the crowning feat of the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, who captured it under the delusion that they had reached Rome itself. From Luna, they sailed back through the Straits of Gibraltar and finally returned to Brittany in the spring of 862. The Vikings had now all but encircled Europe with their raids, for it was in the year 865 that the Swedish Rus, Russians, laid siege to Constantinople. Subheading, the Vikings in France and England. In France itself, the tide began to turn by the end of 865. 
In November of that year, the Vikings finally abandoned Aquitaine, and in the next year the Seine was for a time left free. The tide had now set towards England, and at the same time the Franks commenced fortifying their towns against Viking attack, a policy which was pursued a little later by Edward the Elder in England. For our knowledge of this period, we have to rely almost entirely upon the chronicles of various monastic writers compiling their records in isolation from one another, so that it is almost impossible to trace any definite or general design in Viking attacks. The leaders change continually, and almost the only constant figure is that Rorik, brother of Harold, who was settled in Friesland. For some forty years he remained there, now in friendly, now in hostile relations, with both Charles the Bald and Louis the German, and he does not disappear from our records until after 873. About the same time, Horik the Younger must have died, for we find two new kings reigning simultaneously in Denmark, the brothers Sigifridus and Haldenus. Both were probably sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, the former being the famous Sigurd Snake Eye, and the latter the already mentioned Halfdan. In the year 879, the tide of invasion turned once more toward France, chiefly owing to two causes. The great attack on England had failed, or at least had led to a peaceful settlement, which furnished no outlet for Viking energy while at the same time affairs in France were once more unsettled. Charles the Bald died in 877, followed eighteen months later by his son Louis the Stammerer, who left two youthful children, Louis and Carloman, and posthumous son Charles. Factions arose, and the Vikings were never slow to hear and take advantage of them. When a great fleet which had wintered at Fulham found no opening in England, it crossed to France. There the young Louis won a decisive victory over it at Saucourt on the Somme, and the victory finds its record in the well-known Ludwigslied. An attack by the Northmen on Saxony and the Lower Rhine was more successful. In a great fight which took place somewhere on the Lüneberg Heath to February 880, there fell Duke Bruno of Saxony, together with two bishops, eleven counts, and eighteen royal vassals. In 882, the Emperor Charles the Fat came to terms with the Viking leaders, Sigifrid and Guthruth. King Guthruth, who was probably a son of the Herald of Mayence, himself accepted Christianity and was granted lands on the Lower Rhine and at the same time undertook to defend Charles' territory from attack. King Sigifrid retired with a heavy payment of money. Guthruth received his lands on much the same conditions as Charles the Simple granted Normandy to Rollo, but intriguing with the enemies of Charles, he aroused hostility and was slain in 885. He had thrown away the chance of establishing a Normandy in the Low Countries. Viking rule was now brought to an end in Frisia, and henceforward we hear only of sporadic attacks which continued into the 10th century. So also from 885, Saxony was free from attack, and when trouble was renewed in the 10th century, the attack was not made by sea, but across the Eider boundary. The West Frankish kingdom was still in the midst of the storm. Louis III and Carloman and the local magnates offered a stout resistance, but it seemed impossible to throw off the yoke of the Heer, which ravaged the whole country between the Rhine and the Loire. The contest culminated in the great siege of Paris by King Sigifrid in 885-7. The Viking army numbered some 40,000 men with 700 vessels, and it was only through the stout resistance of Count Odo and Bishop Josselin and the withdrawal of the Vikings to Burgundy by an arrangement with Charles the Fat that the siege was raised. With the overthrow of Charles in 887, 
the West Frankish realm fell into anarchy, and the Vikings ravaged Burgundy and eastern France almost without a check, while Brittany and the Contentan fared no better. Finally, the great Heer concentrated its attack on the valley of the Scheldt. In the autumn of 891, they were defeated on the banks of the Dila in Brabant by the new King Arnulf, and after more desultory fighting, they sailed for England in the autumn of 892. They had been in France some thirteen years, ravaging and plundering, and now for the first time since 840, France was free of the Northmen. In England, after three years' hard fighting, the greater number settled down to a peaceful existence in East Anglia and Northumbria, but a few, in whom the spirit of roving was still strong, returned to the Seine in 896. Twenty-five years earlier, the Vikings had seemed in a fair way to conquer Europe, but now the Battle of Eddington in England, 878, the Siege of Paris in France, 885-7, and the Battle of the Dila in Germany, 891, were significant of failure in these three kingdoms alike. The West Frankish realm was weakened by the dissensions of the rival kings Odo and Charles the Simple, and soon all the old troubles were renewed. Unfortunately, the annals provide us with very meager information about events during the next fifteen years, and we know almost nothing about the critical period immediately preceding the cession of Normandy to the Northmen. The Vikings would seem to have settled themselves in the lower basin of the Seine, with Rouen as their center, and by 910 they appear under the leadership of the famous Rollo, Old Norse Rolliger. This Viking was probably of Norse origin. The Heimskringla describes him as one Rolfa, son of Rongvalder, Earl of Mura though the main body of the settlers were certainly Danes, and he had already made himself a name in England, where he was closely associated with Guthrum of East Anglia. He probably came to France soon after 896, and gradually became the chief person among that band of equals. For some time he carried on a hard struggle with Charles the Simple, and then, toward the end of 911, each party frankly recognized the other's strength. Charles could not oust the Northmen from the Seine Valley, while they were unable permanently to extend their settlement, so at St. Clair sur Epta it was agreed that the part of the Seine Basin, which includes the counties of Rouen, Lisieux, and Evreux, together with the country lying between the rivers Brel and Epta and the sea, should be left in the hands of the Northmen, on condition that they defended the kingdom against attack, received baptism, and did homage to Charles for their lands. To these were added in 924 the districts of Bayou and Saez, and in 933 those of Avranche and Coutances, thus bringing the Normans right up to the Breton border. With the establishment of Normandy, Viking activity was practically at an end in the Frankish kingdom. There were still Northmen on the Loire, who ravaged far inland, while the settlers in Normandy freely raided Brittany. But no fresh settlements were made, and the Viking Hira had become a recognized part of the Frankish Ost. Subheading Scandinavian Kings in Northumbria we must now turn our attention to the Danish settlements in England. We have seen that already by the year 880 they had attained the same measure of independence which was granted to Normandy in 911, but their later fortunes were by no means so peaceful or uneventful. The Danes in East Anglia, Mercia, and Northumbria were not willing to confine themselves to their settlements, and soon Edward the Elder and his sister Etelfleda, the, quote, Lady of the Mercians, close quote, established a line of fortified towns in southern Mercia preparatory to an advance on Danish territory. 
by the year 917, all was ready. Darby fell in that year, and Leicester in 918, before the advance of Ethelfleda, while in the same years Northampton, Stamford, and Nottingham were captured by Edward, and East Anglia made its submission. By the end of his reign, Edward was master of the whole realm, including English, Danes, and Norwegians. These last were settled chiefly in Northumbria, where we find towards the close of the ninth and in the early years of the tenth century a line of kings closely associated with the Norse kingdom of Dublin. The Norsemen were often in alliance with the Scots, and matters came to a crisis in 937 when a great confederation of Scots, Strathclyde Welsh, and Norsemen was formed against Ethelstan. The confederates were defeated in the famous Battle of Brunanber, parenthesis, perhaps the modern Burnswark in Dumfriesshire, close parenthesis, and England was freed from its greatest danger since the days of King Alfred and his struggle with Guthrum, Old Norse Guthrumer, and the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. The Norse leaders retired for a time, but trouble was renewed in 940 by an Anluf, parenthesis, question mark, Olaf Guthrithson, close parenthesis. Footnote. These Anlufs are variously identified, but C.F. Infra, page 368, end footnote. Next year, the famous Anluf Citrixen, Old Norse Olaf Sigtrygsson, nicknamed Guaran, is found at York. He marched south and endeavored to conquer the district of the five boroughs. King Edmund advanced to their help and soon drove Anluf out of northern Mercia and relieved the Danish boroughs from Norse oppression. During the next twelve years, Northumbria was in a state of anarchy. At times, Anluf was acknowledged as king. At others, English sovereignty was recognized. Twice during this period, Eric Bloodaxe, son of Harold Fairhair, appeared as king, but was finally expelled in 954. Later Scandinavian tradition tells us that Ethelstan was on friendly terms with Harold Fairhair and that when Eric was expelled from Norway in 934, he was welcomed to England by Ethelstan and given charge of Northumbria, where he ruled at York. Edmund was less favorably disposed toward Norwegians and appointed one Olaf in his stead. Ultimately, Eric was defeated and killed by his rival. Eric may have been appointed to rule Northumbria after the defeat of Anlaf Olaf at Brunanberg, while the appointment of Olaf as ruler of Northumbria may refer to the partition of England between Olaf and Edmund in 942. With the expulsion of Eric in 954, parenthesis, Olaf had already retired to Dublin, close parenthesis. Norse rule in Northumbria was at an end. Henceforward, that district was directly under the rule of the English king, and earls were appointed in his name. Subheading, the battles of Clontarf and Malden. We have seen that during these years there was an intimate connection between the Norsemen in Ireland and Northumbria, and that the kings of Northumbria often ruled in Dublin at the same time. Viking rule in Ireland was in a state of flux. The chief centers of influence were Dublin and Limerick, but their rulers were often at variance with one another and a succession of great Irish leaders, Niall Glundov, Murkatek, and Brian Boruha, parenthesis, Boru, close parenthesis, made bold and often successful attacks on the Viking stronghold. Brian was the greatest and most famous of these leaders, and when he became chief king of all Ireland, he built a great fleet and received tribute from Northmen and Irish alike. His power was threatened by the treachery of his wife Gormla, who intrigued with her brother Melmorda, 
king of Leinster, and Sigtrigger of the Silken Beard, king of Dublin, against Brian. A great confederacy of the Western Vikings was formed, including Sigurth, the Earl of the Orkneys, and men from the Shetlands, the Western Islands, Man, and Scandinavian settlements on the continent. Dublin was the rendezvous, and thither the great army gathered by Palm Sunday 1014. Brian had collected a vast army, including Vikings from Limerick, and on Good Friday the two forces met in the decisive battle of Clonturf, just north of Dublin. For some time the fortune of battle wavered. Both Brian and Sigurth fell, but in the end the Irish were completely victorious, and the Vikings had lost their last and greatest fight in Ireland. They were not expelled from their settlements, but henceforward they led a peaceful existence under Irish authority, and the Norse kingdoms of Dublin, Limerick, and other cities either lost all power or ceased to exist. After the fall of the Northumbrian kingdom in 954, England had peace for some five and twenty years, especially under the strong rule of Edgar. But with the weak Ethelred II, troubles were renewed, and from 980 onwards, the whole of the English coast was open to attack. These raids were the result of a fresh outburst of Viking activity over the whole of the British Isles. Danes and Norsemen united under one banner, and their leader was the famous Olaf Tryggvason. In 991, after ravaging the east coast, Olaf engaged Britnoff, the Elderman of East Anglia, near Malden. The struggle was heroic and gave occasion to one of the finest of old English poems. But Britnoff fell, and an ignominious peace was made whereby for the first time since the days of Alfred, Danegeld was paid to buy off Viking attacks. Svein Forkbeard now united forces with Olaf, and together they besieged London in 994. The siege was a failure, but all southern England was harried, and once more a heavy Danegeld had to be paid. In 995, Olaf went to Norway, hoping to gain the kingdom by the overthrow of the tyranny of Earl Haakon, while Svein returned to Denmark. The raids continued, but England saw nothing more of King Svein until he returned in 1003 to avenge the ill-advised massacre of St. Bryce's Day. Subheading, King Svein and King Knut. Year after year the kingdom was ravaged, Danegeld after Danegeld was paid, until in 1013, Ethelred fled to Normandy, and Svein became king of all England. A few months later he died suddenly at Gainsborough in Lincolnshire, parenthesis, February 1014, close parenthesis. His English realm went to his younger son, Knut. On the death of Ethelred in 1016, his son Edmund Ironside offered so stout a resistance that for a few months, until his death by treachery, he compelled Canute to share the realm with him. Canute then ruled alone, firmly and well until his death in 1035, having succeeded to the Danish throne also in 1018. On his death the succession was not settled, but... After some difficulty, Harold Harefoot succeeded his father in England. He was succeeded in 1040 by his brother Harthacnut, Old Norse Harthacnutra, but neither king was of the same stamp as their father, and they were both overshadowed by the great Godwin, Earl of Wessex. When Harthacnut died in 1042, the male line in descent from Canute was extinct, and, though some of the Danes were in favor of choosing Canute's sister's son, Svein, Godwin secured the election of Edward the Confessor, 
who had been recalled from Normandy and highly honored by Harthacanute himself. With the accession of Edward, Danish rule in England was at an end, and never afterwards was there any serious question of a Scandinavian kingship either in or over England. End of section 45 Read by Tom Booker, Knoxville, Tennessee, May 17, 2024section 46 of the cambridge medieval history volume 3 germany and the western empire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by tom booker the cambridge medieval history volume 3 germany and the western empire the Vikings, Part Three, by Alan Mauler. We have now traced the story of Viking activity to its chief centers in the British Isles and the mainland of Europe. A word remains to be said about other settlements in Western Europe, in the Orkneys, the Shetlands, the Western Islands (parentheses) or as the Norsemen called them, Suthriar, i.e., Sodor, the Southern Islands close parenthesis, and man, and the Scottish mainland, and then we must turn our attention to Eastern Europe, to the famous Jomsviking settlement in North Germany, and to the important but little-known movements of the Vikings through Russia down to the shores of the Mediterranean. Subheading, the Orkneys, the Shetlands, Western Islands, and man. We have seen how early the Shetlands were settled, and there is no doubt that it was not long before the Vikings made their way by the Orkneys round the coast of Scotland to the Hebrides. From the Orkneys settlements were made in Sutherland and Caithness, while Galloway, parenthesis, possibly the land of the Gaul Goyle, the foreign Irish, close parenthesis, was settled from the Hebrides. In the ninth century, the Norse element in the Hebrides was already so strong that the Irish called the islands Inshigaul, parentheses, i.e., the islands of the foreigners, close parentheses, and their inhabitants were known as the Gaulgoil. Olaf the White and Ivar made more than one expedition from Ireland to the lowlands of Scotland, and the former was married to Althra the daughter of Ketil Flatnose, who had made himself the greatest chieftain in the Western Islands. When Harold Fairhair won his victory at Hafsfjord, he felt that his power would still be insecure unless he gained the submission of these Vikings who belonged to the great families in rivalry with him. He made, therefore, a mighty expedition to the Shetlands, the Orkneys, and the west coast of Scotland, received their submission, and gave the northern islands to Sigurd, brother of Rungwalder, Earl of Mura, as his vassal. Sigurd's successor, Einar, known as Turf Einar, because he first taught the islanders to cut peat for fuel, founded a long line of Orkney earls. Warrior and scold, he came into collision with Harold Fairhair, but made his peace on promise of a heavy fine. When the peasants declared themselves unable to pay it, Einar paid it himself and received in return all the otal, parenthesis, the holdings of the freeholders, close parenthesis, as his own property. The most famous of the Orkney earls was Sigurd Lothvesson, who succeeded circa 980. Though he acknowledged the overlordship of Earl Hakon, he ruled with almost independent power and made himself popular by the return of the Otal. After a reign of thirty years, he fell fighting for the Viking cause at Clontarf in 1014. Of the Vikings in the western islands, from Lewis to the Isle of Man, we have less definite and continuous record. There was a line of kings in the tenth century, of whom the most famous were Marcus or Magnus and Guthrutha, the son of one herald. 
they are found ruling with certain officers known as, quote, lawmen, close quote, by their side. The Isle of Man, which had kings of its own, was at times under their authority, at others under that of the kingdom of Dublin. It was probably from the Isle of Man that the extensive Norse settlements in Cumberland and Westmoreland were made, and either from here or from Ireland came the various Viking raiders who throughout the 10th century made attacks on Wales. There they founded no permanent kingdom, but left a mark in place nomenclature along the coast from Anglesey to Pembrokeshire and in some districts of South Wales. Subheading the Yom's Vikings. From the days of Guthrother in the beginning of the ninth century to those of Harold Gormson, parenthesis, Bluetooth, close parenthesis, in the middle of the tenth, Denmark had paid little heed to her Slavonic neighbors, but the rivalry between Harold Gormson and the Emperor Otto probably turned the Danish king's attention eastwards and it was in his days that the great Viking settlement of Jomsborg was established at the mouth of the Oder. For many years there had been an important trading center at Julin, on the island of Volin, where merchants from Scandinavia, Saxony, and Russia were settled. Large finds of Byzantine and Arabic coins belonging to the 10th century have been made both in Denmark and in Volin, bearing witness to the extensive trade which passed through Yulin between Denmark and the Orient, using as its high road the broad stream of the Oder and the great Russian rivers. To secure to Denmark its full share in the products of the rich land south of the Baltic and in the trade with the east, Harold built the fortified town of Jomsborg, close to Yulin, and established there a famous Viking community. He gave them certain laws, and we probably find their substance in the laws given by Palnatukki to his followers in the unhistorical account of the founding of Jomsborg, given in Jomsviking Saga. No one under eighteen or over fifty was admitted into their fellowship. No woman was allowed in their town, and none of the warriors might be absent for more than three days. They were bound by oaths of fidelity to one another, and each must avenge the fall of any of his companions. No word of fear was allowed, and all outside news must in the first place be told to their leader. All plunder was divided by lot among the community. The harbor of Jomsborg could shelter a fleet of three hundred vessels and was protected by a mole with twelve iron gates. The Jomsvikings played an important part in the affairs of Denmark and Norway in the late tenth and early eleventh centuries and made many Viking expeditions both in Baltic lands and in the west. In 1043, their stronghold was destroyed by Magnus the Good of Norway. Other Vikings from Denmark made raids still further east than Jomsborg, but the true Viking conquest of those districts was due not to the Danes, but to the Swedes. Subheading, the Swedes in Russia. In the Chronicle of the Russian Monk Nestor, parenthesis, circa 1100, Close parenthesis. We read how, in the middle of the ninth century, certain Varangians came from beyond the sea, and that one band of them, the Rus, was soon invited to rule among the Slavs and put an end to their mutual quarrels. Their leader Rurik, parenthesis, Old Norse Roriker, close parenthesis, settled in Novgorod, while two of his men, Askold, parenthesis, Old Norse. Uskulder, close parenthesis, and Dir, parenthesis, Old Norse Dury, close parenthesis, sailed down the Dnieper and settled in Kiev. These events probably took place in the half century preceding 862. Twenty years later, Kiev was conquered by Rurik's successor, Aleg, parenthesis, Old Norse Helgi, close parenthesis, and Kiev the mother of all Russian towns, was henceforward the capital of the Russian state. From Kiev, 
the Rus advanced down the Dnieper and in 865 ravaged the shores of the Black Sea, parenthesis, soon to be known as the Russian Sea, close parenthesis, and the Sea of Marmara. They appeared with a fleet of 200 vessels before Constantinople, but the city was saved by a sudden storm and the greater part of the fleet of the, quote, Rus, close quote, as Byzantine historians call them, was destroyed. Aleg made a more successful attack in 907 with a fleet of 2,000 vessels, and the Greeks were forced to pay a heavy ransom. Attacks of this kind continued down to the middle of the 11th century. At the same time, the Rus secured valuable trading privileges from the eastern emperors and exchanged furs, slaves, and honey for the luxuries of the east. From Arab writers we hear of these Rus in districts still further east, on the banks of the Volga and the shores of the Caspian. Though the point has been hotly contested by Slavonic patriots, there can be no doubt that these Rus, or Rus, are really Swedish Vikings. Some of them accompanied a Greek embassy to the Emperor Louis the Pious in 839 and, though they called themselves Rus, Louis made inquiries and found that they were really of Swedish nationality. They were detained for some time under the suspicion of being spies. The emperor no doubt feared some fresh design against the empire on the part of the Northmen. A few years later, when the Vikings attacked Sevilla, parenthesis, 844, close parenthesis, an Arab writer calls them Rus, using probably a name for the Vikings which was already well known in the East. The descriptions of the life of the ancient Rus, which we find in Greek and Arabic writers, tally in remarkable fashion with those of the Vikings in the West, and archaeological and philological evidence tends to strengthen the belief that their original home was in Scandinavia. Certain types of fibulae found in western Russia are derived from Scandinavia, and the hordes of Anglo-Saxon pennies and sheats found there are probably our Danegeld. One runic inscription, belonging to the 11th century and showing evidence of connection with Gotland, has been found in a burial mound in Berezan, an island at the mouth of the Dnieper. Professor Brown says that no others have been found because of the rarity of suitable stone. The names of the Dnieper rapids as given in their Russian form, parenthesis, side by side with the Slavonic, close parenthesis, by Constantine Porphyrogenitus, parenthesis, circa 950, close parenthesis, are undoubtedly Scandinavian in origin. Exactly how the term Rus came to be applied to the Swedish nation, parenthesis, or a part of it, close parenthesis, has been much disputed. Footnote. The form Rus is probably the Slavonic version of the Finnish Ruotsi, the name given by the Finns to the Swedes generally, and taken from the district of Uppland, known as Rothr, with which they were most familiar. End footnote. Still more difficult is the question of the origin of the term Varangian or Bariag, to use the Russian form. We have seen that it is applied to the whole of the nation of whom the Rus formed part. It is also given to the guard of the Byzantine emperors. It is probable that the term Varangians was first applied to the whole of the Scandinavian peoples, but more especially to the Swedes with whom the Slavs had chiefly to deal, and later to the emperor's guard recruited from these hardy northerners. Most famous of such Varangians was the great Harold Hardrada, who after a career of adventure in the east ultimately fell at Stamford Bridge in 1066. Of the later history of the Scandinavians in Russia we know little, but it is probable that by the year 1000 they were largely Slavized, and by the end of the 11th century they were entirely absorbed by the native element. Subheading Viking Civilization
We have now traced the main outlines of Viking activity in Eastern and Western Europe. It remains to say something of their civilization and its influence on the development of the various countries in which they formed settlements. During the years of Viking activity, the Scandinavian peoples stood at a critical period in the history of their civilization. Side by side with a large element of primitive barbarism, we find certain well-developed forms of civilization while throughout their activity the Vikings showed an eager understanding and appreciation of the culture of the older civilizations then prevailing in Western Europe. This strange blend of barbarism and culture finds its clearest illustration in their daily life and in the slow and halting passage from heathendom to Christianity. Dr. Alexander Buga has pointed out for us how many characteristic features of Viking life find their closest parallel among uncivilized peoples of the ancient or of the modern world. Their cruelty in warfare finds illustration in their custom of exposing the heads of their enemies outside their camps and towns, or in the strange picture given us in some Irish annals of Danes cooking their food on the field of battle on spits stuck in the bodies of their fallen foes. The custom of human sacrifice was fairly common, while that of cutting the blood eagle in the back of the fallen foe is well known from the vengeance for their father taken by the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. Children were not spared in warfare and were often tossed on the spears of their foes. A curious survival of primitive habit is found in the famous Berserk Fury, when men in the heat of battle were seized with sudden madness and, according to the popular belief, received a double portion of strength and lost all sense of bodily pain. There is, of course, much that is superstitious in this idea, but it finds its parallel in the, quote, running amok, close quote, of the races of the Malay Peninsula. Side by side with these traits of primitive barbarism, we find certain well-developed forms of culture, an extensive commerce, a mastery of the whole art of shipbuilding, and great artistic skill, shown not only in articles of personal adornment, but also in the sculptured memorial stones to be found from Gotland in the east to man in the west. In warfare their cavalry were skilled, and they understood the construction of siege engines with the whole art of fortification. Above all, the Northmen had a genius for law, and few early communities show their aptitude in the making of laws or such strictness in their observance. Subheading Christianity and Heathendom the passage from heathendom to Christianity at this critical period is in some ways even more interesting. We have already seen how in the middle years of the ninth century Christianity was preached in Denmark and Sweden, but it had little effect on the main body of the nations concerned. The best evidence of this is to be found, perhaps, in the fact that it is in all probability to the ninth and tenth centuries that we owe the poems of the elder Edda, the main source of our knowledge of Old Norse mythology and cosmogony. It is true, no doubt, that in some of these poems we find a note of detachment, touches of irony, and even of burlesque, which remind us that the belief in the old gods is passing away, but in the great body of those which deal with the world of the Aesir, there is no question of fading beliefs or of insincere statement. The greater number of the Vikings were undoubted heathen, and like the impious Onlufbald, when defying the power of St. Cuthbert, would have sworn by their great gods Tor and Othin. When the Danes made peace with Alfred in 876, they swore an oath on the Holy Ring, which would be found on the altar of every heathen temple. Such a ring sacred to Tor was taken by the Irish from a temple in Dublin in 996. There was a grove sacred to Tor just north of Dublin, and place names throughout the British Isles and in Normandy bear witness to the worship of this god. 
At the same time, in religion as in everything else, the Vikings showed themselves very ready to seize new ideas and, more especially, to avail themselves of any advantages which adhesion to the Christian religion might give. Scandinavian merchants settled in the various European countries were often, quote, prime signed, close quote i.e., received the sign of the cross, preliminary to baptism, which raised them to the rank of catechumens and enabled them to live in trading and social intercourse with Christians, while they did not necessarily proceed to the full renunciation of their heathen faith. Even in the ninth century, when the Danes were fighting the Norsemen in Ireland, we hear how they invoked the aid of St. Patrick, thinking that he must take vengeance on those who had done him such injury. When victorious, they gave him large offerings for, quote, the Danes were a people with a certain piety, whereby they could refrain from flesh and from women for a time, close quote. As was to be expected in a time of transition from one faith to another, superstition was rife, and more than once the Viking hosts fell prey to it. When the army of Ragnar Lothbrok was besieging Paris in 845, his followers were attacked by a mysterious sickness. Prayer to the heathen gods was unsuccessful, but when, on the advice of a Christian prisoner, they prayed to his god, wisely abstaining at the same time from flesh and mead, the plague was removed. The blending of the old and new is happily illustrated in the sepulchral stones of the Isle of Man and Gotland. Here we have stones in the shape of a cross, or with the sign of the cross on them, decorated with scenes from Valhalla, or with an inscription praying at the same time for the repose of the dead man's soul, and that God may betray those who betrayed him. More than once do we hear of men who believed neither in the heathen gods nor in Christ, and had faith in naught but their own strength. The nickname Quote, the godless, close quote, is by no means unfrequent among the settlers in Iceland. Throughout the period, however, Christianity made steady advance. By the year 921, we find the Vikings sparing hospitals and churches when sacking Armagh. The great king Olaf Kuaren, who died in 981, spent his old age as a monk in Iona. At one time in the 10th century, the primates of York and Canterbury were both of Scandinavian family, and in the later 10th and early 11th centuries, the Roman Church had no more faithful sons than the Normans. Subheading Ideals of Life and Material Civilization their general philosophy of life was that every man must rely on himself and his own wisdom. He must place no reliance on others, least of all upon women. The great aim in life is to attain fame and fair speech from men after death. Though their beliefs were strongly tinged with fatalism, this brought no weakening of character or gloom of outlook. Quote, Joyous and happy must every man be until death comes upon him. Close quote, is the counsel of Habamal, and the highest ideal of the end of life for the hero is found in the picture of Ragnar Lothbrok, who, when tortured in the snake pit, goes laughing to his death. With their enemies, the Vikings had an evil reputation for cunning and deceit, but the incidents cited in illustration, parentheses, such as the feigned desire for baptism on the part of a dying leader, which led to the capture of Luna, and the frequent mention of feigned retreats, close parenthesis, hardly support this. The enemy were outwitted rather than deceived. Two common but widely different aspects of Viking character are reflected in the portraiture of their two chief gods. On the one side, Othin, parenthesis, Odin, close parenthesis, whose common epithets are, quote, the wise, the prudent, the sagacious, close quotes. On the other, Thor, endowed with mighty strength, but less polished and refined. 
The besetting sins of the Vikings were too great love of wine and women. The rich vinelands of the Rhine were ceded to the Vikings at their special request in 885, and one of the best-known examples of Viking cruelty is the murder of Archbishop Alfhea, parenthesis, Alfege, close parenthesis, at a drunken orgy in 1012, where he was pelted to death with the skulls of oxen slaughtered for the feast. Many are the references to their immorality. Wandering from country to country, they often had wives in each, and polygamy prevailed, at least among the leaders. From Ireland in the west to Russia in the east, the same story is told. In Ireland we hear of what would seem to be harems for women, while in Russia we are told of the Grand Duke Vladimir, great-grandson of Rurik the founder of the Russian kingdom, that he had more than eight hundred concubines. Such excesses were unknown in Scandinavia itself. Legitimate wives were esteemed and took part in the national life to an unusual extent. Women at times took part in fighting, and heroic figures are found in the sagas and other historical records. Such are Ota, Parenthesis, Aotra, close parenthesis, the wife of Turgish, who as a vulva, or prophetess, gave audience on the high altar at Clonmacnoise, and Aotra, the deep-minded, wife of Olaf the White, whose figure stands out clear among the early settlers in Iceland. In outward appearance, the Vikings were marked by a love of, quote, purple and fine raiment, close quote. Foreign, and more especially English, clothing was much sought after, and when in 968 the Irish plundered Limerick, we hear how they carried off from the Norsemen, quote, their choicest possessions, their beautiful foreign saddles, their gold and silver, their woven cloths of every kind and color, their silk and satin raiment, beauteous and variegated, both scarlet and green, close quote. From John of Wallingford, we learn how much attention the Vikings paid to the care of the body, indulging in Sabbath baths and daily hair combing. The graves of the period have often yielded rich finds of ornaments in silver and bronze, and the geographic distribution of the famous Viking brooches, oval and convex in shape, can be used as an index of the extent of the conquests of the Northmen. The style of decoration is that derived from the interweaving of heads and limbs of animals which is found in northern Europe in the preceding age, but the influence of Irish art is now often discernible, more especially in the use of spiral and interlacing designs. English and Carolingian influences are also to be traced. The same style of ornamentation is to be found in the memorial stones, as for example in the famous Jelinga stone at the tomb of Gorm the Old in Jutland. Their houses were wooden but often richly decorated with carvings and tapestries. In the latter half of the 10th century, we hear how the house of Olaf the Peacock in Iceland was decorated with scenes from the legends of gods and heroes, such as the fight of Loki with Heimdallr, Thor's fishing, and Baldr's funeral. Traces of tapestry hangings are found in grave chambers. The dead chief was often buried in his ship, and ship graves have been found not only in Norway, but also at Groet in Brittany. In Denmark, grave chambers of wood seem to take the place of ship graves. Subheading Ships Of their ships we know a good deal, both from the sagas and from archaeological finds. The Oseberg ship is a vessel for time of peace and coast navigation only, but in the Gokstad ship we have an example of the ordinary war vessel. It dates from about 900, is of oak, clinker-built, with seats for 16 pairs of rowers, 78 feet long and 16 feet broad amidships, with the rudder at the side. The gunwale was decorated with shields painted alternately black and gold, 
and there was a single sail. In the course of the Viking period their size was greatly increased, and in the famous dragon and snake boats of Olaf Tryggvason and Knut the Great we hear of thirty-four and even sixty pairs of oars. The trading vessels probably differed very little from those of war, just as the line of division between merchant and Viking was often a very thin one. Time and again we read how, when merchants visited a foreign land, they arranged a definite time for the conclusion of their business, and agreed after that to treat each other as enemies. The most remarkable feature about the Vikings as sailors was the fearless way in which they crossed the open sea, going boldly on such stormy journeys as those to the Hebrides and Ireland, to Greenland, and even to Vinland or America. Hitherto, seamen both in peace and war had confined themselves as much as possible to coasting voyages. The sea was indeed their element, and the phrase which William of Malmesbury uses, parenthesis, quoting probably from an old poem, close parenthesis, when describing the failure, parenthesis, after four days' trial, close parenthesis, on the part of Guthrith of Northumbria to settle down at the court of King Ethelstan, quote, he returned to piracy as a fish to the sea, close quote, is probably as true as it is picturesque. Subheading. Trade and Social Organization. The chief trading centers in Scandinavia itself were Skiringsalar on the Vik in Norway, Hilvi Schleswig in Denmark, Bjorka, Sigtuna, and Lund in Sweden, besides a great market in Bohusan on the Jota Elv, where the three kingdoms met. The chief articles of export were furs, horses, wool, and flesh. Those of import would consist chiefly in articles of luxury, whether for clothing or ornament. The slave trade was also of the highest importance. One incident may be mentioned for the vivid light which it sheds on the international character of Viking trade. Once, in the market on the Jota Elv, the Icelander Hostulder bought a female slave from the merchant Gilja, parenthesis, a Celtic name, close parenthesis, surnamed the Russian, parenthesis, because of his journeys to that country, close parenthesis. The slave proved to be an Irish king's daughter made captive by Viking raiders. The Scandinavian countries, like Rome, are very rich in Anglo-Saxon coins, and though many of these must represent our Danegeld, the fact that they are most frequent in eastern Sweden, on the shores of Lake Malar, and in the neighborhood of the great waterways connecting Sweden and the Baltic, but above all on the islands of Oland and Gotland, whence, in all probability, very few of the Viking raiders came, would seem to show that there was extensive peaceful intercourse with England in Viking days. Yet more interesting are the frequent finds of Oriental coins. They first made their way to Scandinavia about the end of the ninth century, and are most common in Sweden. There can be no doubt that the vast majority of these coins reached Sweden overland through Russia, where extensive finds of Arabian coins mark the route along which trade at that time traveled from Asia to the north. The greater number of these coins were minted at Samarkand and Baghdad. End of section 46 Read by Tom Booker, Knoxville, Tennessee May 26, 2024. Section 47 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Booker. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. The Vikings, Part 4, by Alan Mawler. In social organization, the Viking communities were aristocratic. 
the famous answer of the followers of Rollo when asked who was their lord, quote, we have no lord, we are all equal, close quote, was essentially true, but with their practical genius, the Vikings realized that leadership was necessary if any military success was to be gained and we find throughout their history a series of able leaders, sometimes holding the title of Jarl, but, if of royal birth, commonly known as kings. That the title did not have its full modern connotation is evident from their numbers and from the frequency with which they changed. When, however, the Vikings established permanent settlements, hereditary kingship became common, and royal houses bore sway in Dublin and other Irish towns. Thence a hereditary line of kings was introduced into Northumbria. The rulership of Normandy was hereditary, and so possibly was the kingship in East Anglia. But in the districts grouped around the five boroughs, the organization was of a different kind, the chief authority resting with the lawmen. We find frequent mention of these lawmen both in Scandinavia itself and in those countries where Scandinavian influence prevailed originally men skilled in the law, who could state and interpret it when required, they often presided in the thing, or popular assembly, and represented the local or provincial community as against the king or his officers, though they do not themselves seem to have exercised judicial functions. They are usually mentioned in the plural number, and probably acted as a collective body. In England and the Western Islands, they attained a position of yet greater importance. In Man and the Hebrides, they became actual chieftains and are mentioned side by side with the kings, while it is probable that they were the chief judicial authorities in the aristocratic organization of the five boroughs and other parts of the Dane law. They were usually twelve in number, and their presence may be definitely traced in Cambridge, Stamford, Lincoln, York, and Chester. The office would seem, as a rule, to have been hereditary. Subheading Influence in Ireland The influence of the Vikings varied from country to country, not only according to the political and social conditions of the lands in which they settled, but also to some extent according to the nation from which they came. In Ireland, the settlements were chiefly Norse, though there is some evidence for the presence of Danes in Cork and Limerick. Here their influence was concentrated in certain important towns on the coast, parenthesis, Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, and the two already mentioned, close parenthesis, and the districts immediately surrounding them. Scandinavian influence on Irish place names is confined almost entirely to these localities and to the harbors and islands which must from time to time have given shelter to their fleets. Intermarriage between the Irish and the Norse settlers began at a very early date, and interesting evidence of it is found in the large numbers of Irish names in the genealogies of the chief Icelandic families preserved in Lannaumabok. Such intermarriage was frequent, but the strength of the clan system would seem to have enabled the races to continue distinct. Norse words are very rare in Irish, and even when the old Norse kingdoms were shorn of their glory and reduced to dependence, the, quote, Ustman, close quote, as they were called, remained an entirely distinct element in the community, and frequent mention is made of them in the records of the great towns. They still survived at the time of the English conquest, and often both claimed and received privileges entirely different from those accorded to the natives or to the English settlers. In Ireland, as in other countries, there is no doubt that the Vikings did much harm to religion and to learning, but at the same time they strengthened town life and developed trade. For many years, the trade of Ireland was largely in Scandinavian hands. Subheading Influence in Scotland, Man, and the Isles Norse influence in Scotland was great, but varied much from place to place. 
The Orkneys and the Shetlands are thoroughly Norse. They formed part of the Norwegian kingdom till 1468, and Norse speech lingered on until the close of the 18th century. Place names are almost entirely of Norse origin, and the dialect is full of Norse words. In the system of landholding, the Udalers are an interesting survival of the old Norse freeholders, whose Ottal was held on precisely the same free tenure as the Scotch Udal. The Hebrides were also largely influenced by the Vikings, and it was not till 1266 that Magnus Hawkinson renounced all claims of Norway to the islands and to man. Place nomenclature both in the names of the islands themselves and of their physical features shows a strong Norse element, and there are many Norse words in the Gaelic of the islands and of the mainland. These words have undergone such extensive changes and corruption in a language so different from their original source that their recognition is a difficult problem. There is at present perhaps a danger of exaggerating this element, the existence of which was long overlooked. Similarly, affinities have been traced between Scandinavian and Gaelic popular tales and folklore, but this evidence is of doubtful value to the student of history. As was to be expected, the chief traces of Viking influence on the mainland are to be found in the modern counties of Sutherland, parenthesis, the district south of the Orkneys was so called by the Norsemen, close parenthesis, Caithness, Ross, and Cromarty, which were for a long time under the authority of the Orkney earls, and in Galloway, which was naturally exposed to attacks from the powerful Norse settlements in Man. The name of this district, parenthesis, perhaps derived from Gaul Goyle, close parenthesis, possibly bears witness, as we have seen, to the mixed race resulting from their presence, and the evidence of place names confirms it. In the history of Scotland as a whole, it is to be remembered that it was the weakening of Pictish power under Norse attack which paved the way for the unification of the land under the rule of Kenneth MacAlpin. The Isle of Man bears many and deep marks of its Norse occupation. Here, as in the Hebrides, the occupation was long and continuous. Attacked by Vikings from the early years of the ninth century, it came first under the rule of the Kingdom of Dublin, and then of the Earls of Orkney. The successors of Godred Crovan, who conquered the island in 1079, took the title of king, and were kings both of Man and the Isles, parenthesis, i.e. the Hebrides, close parenthesis. The chief witnesses to Norse rule are the Manx legal system and the sculptured stones scattered about the island. The highest executive and legislative authority in the island, parenthesis, after the governor, close parenthesis, is still the Tinwald court, whose name goes back to the old Norse Tingvallr, parenthesis, the open plain where the popular assembly met, close parenthesis, and the House of Keys, which is the oldest division of the court, consisted originally of twenty-four members, parenthesis, a duodecimal notation which constantly recurs in Scandinavian law and polity, close parenthesis, chosen by co-option and for life, the office being generally, as a matter of fact, hereditary. These men who have the, quote, keys of the law, close quote, in their bosom resemble closely the lawmen, of whom mention has already been made. All laws to be valid must still be announced from the Tinwald Hill, which corresponds to the Lugberg, or Law Hill, in the Icelandic Althing. When the assembly is held, the coroner, quote, fences the court, close quote, against all disturbance or disorder, just as in the old Norwegian Gulating we hear of vebund, or sanctuary ropes, drawn around the assembly. Of the sculptured stones we have already spoken more than once. 
Suffice it to say here that in addition to runic inscriptions, they often give us pictorial representations of the great scenes in myth and legend, such as the fight of Odin with Fenrir's wolf and the slaying of the serpent Fafnir by Sigurd. In many ways, Man is the district of the British Isles in which we can get closest to the life of the old Viking days. Cumberland and Westmoreland stand somewhat apart from the rest of England in the matter of Viking influence, for they were fairly certainly colonized by Norsemen from Man and the Islands. The greater number of the place names are purely Scandinavian, and the local dialects are full of terms of similar origin. It is probable that such parts of Lancashire as show Viking influence, viz. Furness and Lancashire north of the Ripple, should be grouped with these districts. South of that river, their influence on place nomenclature is slight, except on the coast, where we have evidence of a series of Viking settlements extending to and including the Wirral in Cheshire. A 12th century runic inscription survives at Loppergarth in Furness, and the Gosforth cross in Cumberland bears heathen as well as Christian sculptures. The parallel existence of Hundred and Wapentake and the Caracal assessment in Doomsday warn us that we must not underrate the importance of Norse influence. Subheading Influence in Northumbria and the Five Boroughs the Scandinavian kingdom of Northumbria must have been much smaller than the earlier realm of that name. Northumberland shows but few traces of Viking influence, and it is not till we reach Teesdale that it becomes strongly marked. From here to the Humber, place nomenclature and dialect, ridings and wapentakes, caricates and duodecimal notation in the doomsday assessments bear witness to their presence from the shores of the North Sea right up to the Pennines. For the extent and character of the Viking settlements in the district of the five boroughs, we have not only the usual parentheses and often somewhat unsatisfactory close parentheses tests of place names and dialects, ancient and modern, but also a far more accurate index in the facts recorded in the Doomsday Assessment of the 11th century. For the northern counties, this is largely non-existent or too scanty to be of any great value, but here it has its usual fullness of detail. The chief tests derived from this source with their respective applications are as follows. Parenthesis, one, close parenthesis, the use of the Danish, quote, wapentake, close quote, as the chief division of the county in place of the English, quote, hundred, close quote. This is found in Derbyshire, parenthesis, with one exception on its southern border, close parenthesis, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, parenthesis, with certain exceptions along the sea coast, which have a curious and unexplained parallel in the doomsday divisions of Yorkshire, close parenthesis, Leicestershire, Rutland, and one district of Northamptonshire now included in Rutland, parenthesis, two, close parenthesis. The assessment by caricates in multiples and submultiples of twelve, which is characteristic of the Dane law, as opposed to that by hides arranged on a decimal system. This we find in the shires of Derby, Nottingham, Lincoln, Leicester, and Rutland, parenthesis, with the above exception, close parenthesis. In the two N-E hundreds of Northamptonshire, there are also traces of a duodecimal assessment. Parenthesis 3. Close parenthesis. The use of the aura of 16 pence instead of that of 20 pence is found in Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, and Lancashire. In Leicestershire, we are told, on the other hand, that the ore was of 20 pence. Parenthesis 4. Close parenthesis. In Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, parenthesis, and Yorkshire, close parenthesis, we have traces of the use of the Danish, quote, long, close quote, hundred, parenthesis, equals 120, close parenthesis. 
e.g. the fine for breaking the king's peace is eight pounds, parenthesis, i.e. 120 ores, close parenthesis. These tests establish Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, parenthesis, Lincoln and Stamford, close parenthesis, Leicestershire, and, parenthesis, probably, close parenthesis, the whole of Rutland, parenthesis, Stamford, close parenthesis, as belonging to the five boroughs, and place names confirm this evidence. The counties to the west and south answer none of the tests, and there is only a slight sprinkling of Danish names in Staffordshire and Warwickshire on their eastern borders. Northamptonshire furnishes a difficulty. Except in the extreme northeast, it fails to pass our tests, but Danish place nomenclature is strongly evident, though it shades off somewhat to the S.W. It resembles Danish East Anglia rather than the district of the five boroughs, and it is possible that the boundary of Guthrum's kingdom, which is only carried as far as Stony Stratford in the peace of Alfred and Guthrum, really ran along Watling Street for a few miles, giving two-thirds of that county to the East Anglian realm. Footnote. The Welland is so natural a border that it is very unlikely English authority really came north of it. The Hydes must remain an unexplained difficulty. End footnote. While the judicial authority was in the hands of the lawmen in the five boroughs, we hear at the same time of jarls in these towns, and in Northampton and other places, who lead their forces to war and sign royal charters and documents. Probably to the Danes we owe the organization of the modern counties of Derby, Leicester, Nottingham, Lincoln, parenthesis, and Stamford, close parenthesis, Northampton, Bedford, Cambridge, and Hartford. Subheading Influence in East Anglia. In East Anglia, the tests which we used for the five boroughs fail, and we are left with the boundaries of Guthrum's kingdom, certain evidence from place names, and other miscellaneous facts. A few Holmes in Bedfordshire, some Holmes, Biggins, and Tofts in Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, and Huntingdonshire, a, quote, Danish, close quote, hundred in Hertfordshire, are almost all the evidence from place names. Essex shows a few, Suffolk more traces of Danes on the coast, and the latter county has some traces inland, especially in the north. Norfolk is strongly Danish, even if we overlook the doubtful, quote, Thorpes, close quote, which are so abundant here. The Historia Eliensis and other documents tend to show the presence of a strong Danish element in the population and social organization of the district around Cambridge. As a whole, however, the Viking impress on East Anglia is much less deep than on Mercia. The difference rests probably on a difference of original organization, but it is impossible now to define it. Subheading Influence on Law and Society Other features of interest in our social system due to Viking influence may be observed from a study of Doomsday and other authorities. Attention has often been called to the number of freeholders in the Dane law and it would seem that Lincolnshire, Leicestershire, and Norfolk more especially had not been feudalized to any great extent before the Norman conquest. In other counties, the influence of southern custom is more apparent. The, quote, holds, close quote, of Northumbria, who rank next after the earls, and the, quote, drengs, close quote, of Cumberland, Westmoreland, Northumberland, and Durham, are undoubtedly of Scandinavian origin. The, quote, Sockman, close quote, a class of free peasants, are most numerous in the five boroughs and East Anglia, and are only found sporadically in other places. Our legal system shows again and again the influence of Scandinavian law and custom. The word, quote, law, close quote, itself is a Scandinavian term in contrast to the English, quote, 
doom, close quote. We have already mentioned the lawmen. Still more interesting are the, quote, twelve senior thanes, close quote, of Ethelred's laws for the five boroughs enacted at Wantage in 997. They have to come forward in the court of every wapentake and to swear that they will not accuse any innocent man or conceal any guilty one. The exact force of this enactment has been a matter of dispute, but there can be little doubt that, parenthesis, in the words of Vinogradov, close parenthesis, such a custom, quote, prepared the way for the indictment jury of the 12th century, close quote. In criminal law, the Danes introduced a new conception of crime. The idea of honor in the relationship of members of a military society to one another led to the appearance of a group of crimes whose perpetrators are branded as nithings, men unworthy of comradeship with others and, more especially, with their fellow warriors. In the general life of the nation, the Danes placed an effective check on learning and literature, except during the heroic activities of Alfred the Great. But on the other hand, we probably owe to them an extensive development of town life and of trade, and the revival of English naval power. Disastrous as were the Danish wars, there can be little doubt that the Danish settlements were for the ultimate good of the nation. Subheading The Northmen in Europe generally. In the Frankish Empire, the only permanent settlement was in Normandy. Scandinavian influence was strong in Frisia and the lower basin of the Rhine. Parenthesis. Dorestad was the center of their commercial activity. Close parenthesis. But there is no question of influence on law, social organization, or government. In Normandy, on the other hand, we have a powerful and almost independent state with a full Viking organization. The history of the Normans does not belong to this chapter. Suffice it to say here that perhaps more than any other of the Vikings, they showed themselves readily able to assimilate themselves to their surroundings, and they were soon gallicized. Nevertheless, law and custom, dialect and place names still show their presence clearly. Of Scandinavian influence in Eastern Europe, little can be said owing to our lack of knowledge. Attempts have been made to distinguish Scandinavian elements in the old Russian law and language, but without any very definite results, and we must confine ourselves to the points mentioned earlier. Nothing has been said of Iceland, which was one great field of Scandinavian activity in the ninth and 10th centuries. It was discovered in the middle of the ninth century and soon settled, first by some Norsemen who left their native land under stress of the same conditions, as drove others to find fresh homes for themselves in the British Isles and elsewhere, and secondly by other Norsemen, parenthesis, with a considerable admixture of Irish blood, close parenthesis, from the Western Islands, who left their settlements there when Harold Fairhair forced them into submission after the Battle of Hofsfjord. In Iceland, Scandinavian law and custom had fullest and freest play for their own development, and we must draw freely on the rich treasures of later Icelandic poetry and prose for our knowledge of the history and civilization of the Viking Age. But Iceland itself lies on the extreme confines of Europe and plays practically no part in the development of Scandinavian influence in Europe in the 10th and 11th centuries. Iceland, however, points for us the moral of Viking civilization that when left to develop on its own lines, it ended too often only in social and political anarchy. It is seen at its best when it came into contact with older and richer civilizations. From them it gained stability and strength of purpose, while to them it gave life and vigor when they were fast becoming effete. End of section 47. Read by Tom Booker, Knoxville, Tennessee, May 28, 2024.
Section 48 of The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. Section 48. The Foundation of the Kingdom of England. Part 1. By William John Corbett. When Offa died in 796, the consolidation of central and southeastern England into an orderly state under a stable dynasty had continued long enough to make it seem improbable that the work would have to be done a second time. The Mercian kingdom was still far from comprising all England. Wessex and Northumbria were still independent, but in both states the rulers had accepted Mercian brides, and neither seemed sufficiently strong to thwart Mercia's further expansion. Nor was internal faction apparently to be feared. Offa's death brought the crown to Ecfrith, his only son, but though this prince died within a few months of his accession, leaving no heir, no struggle arose over the vacant throne. The Mercy and Witan arranged the succession peaceably among themselves, their choice falling on the Etheling Coenwulf, a member of the royal kindred who seems to have been only distantly related to Offa. This orderly election, if compared with the faction fights, which regularly disgraced Northumbria under similar circumstances, is in itself good evidence of the political progress made by Mercia in the 8th century, and Coenwulf's subjects may fairly have looked forward to a further expansion taking place under his leadership. At Coenwulf's accession, the ruler of Wessex was Beordrig, a weak man who had married Eber, Offa's third daughter, and who was almost a Mercian vassal. Of his reign, 786 to 802, Little of note is recorded except that it was disturbed one summer by the landing of rovers coming from Hortaland in Norway on the coast of Dorset. This is the first recorded appearance in England of the so-called Vikings, a most ominous event as the future was to prove. In the Norse sagas, the word Vikinger means a free buccaneer of any nationality, and the phrase to go in Viking denotes freebooting as opposed to trading voyages, both being regarded as equally honorable activities. Not only England, but all Western Europe was soon to rue their advent. One other event of Beordric's days had far-reaching consequences. In conjunction with Offa, he drove into exile an Etheling called Egbert, whose father, Eelmund, had for a time been under king in Kent, 784 to 786. This Egbert was destined to return and become the ancestor of England's future kings. In Northumbria, in Offa's closing years, we also hear of piratical raids. In June 793, heathen men, whether Danish or Norse cannot be decided, ravaged the church at Lindisfarne and captured many of the monks to sell as slaves. Next summer they came again and attacked Wearmouth and Jarrow, where Bede had spent his days. These inroads, however, did not continue, nor can they have disturbed the Northumbrians very much, for the magnates of Bernicia and Dara, for many years past, had been flying at each other's throats with wearisome monotony. Harryings and burnings had become the rule, and king after king met with deposition or a violent death. Ethelred, son of Maul, held the throne when the heathen ships appeared. He had married Offa's second daughter, and, like Beordrig, may be regarded as almost Offa's vassal, but the alliance had brought him little strength. In 796 he was murdered at Corbridge on Tyne. His immediate successor reigned for only twenty-seven days, and then fled, making way for Eardwulf, a prince whose reign of ten years, 796 to 806, is merely a chronicle of plunderings and executions ending in his deposition. Clearly, it is useless to peer into the gloom and turmoil of the North in these days. 
One event only seems of importance, as it affected the ultimate position of the boundary of England. It was in these years that the Galloway bishopric of Withern, Candida Casa, hitherto subject to York, came to an end, the Picts of this district throwing off their subjection to the English and uniting with the British kingdom of Strathclyde. Cohenwulf ruled over Mercia for a full quarter of a century, 796 to 821. On the whole, he showed himself a man of resource and energy, but his reign was not without its difficulties, and he seems to have been unable to reap any advantage either from the want of enterprise of the West Saxons or from the chaos which reigned among the Northumbrians. In his days, nothing occurred to alter the balance of power in England. Mercia remained the leading state, nor is there any record of attacks on its coasts by sea rovers. The king's first recorded activity is a war against the North Welsh, which led to a battle at Rudlin. We learn this from the Annals Cambria. As this campaign was followed up later in his reign by another against the South Welsh, it may be useful at this point to say a few words about the general condition of Wales in the years that followed the building of Offa's celebrated boundary dike. Our information is scanty, but sufficient to prove that the land was subdivided into many chieftaincies, or so-called kingdoms. The most important tribal units, counting from north to south, were 1. Gwynedd or North Wales, in Latin, Venedotia, 2. Powys, 3. Ceredigion, Cardigan, 4. The Promontory of David, in Latin, Demetia, 5. Estrad Ty, the Vale of the Toei, 6. Brecanog, Brecknock, 7. Morganog, Glamorgan, and 8. Gwent, Monmouthshire. The traditional primacy or overlordship over these and many other smaller units lay with the kings of Gwynedd, whose territories comprised the Vales of the Cluid and Conway, the Promontory of Lyne, the fastnesses of Snowdon and Cater Idris, and the comparatively fertile plains of the Isle of Moan, not yet known as Anglesey. Their principal seat being at Aberfrau, a small port near Hollyhead, whose history goes back to the days of Cadwallader, the contemporary of Oswy. But the superiority of the house of Cunetta, from whom Cadwallader descended, was often merely honorary, and it had long been challenged by the princes of South Wales, the Dextralis Pars Britannia, as the Welsh termed it. In this, the more spacious and less mountainous half of Wales, a fairly strong principality, later to be known as de Hybarth, was emerging out of conquests made by Seacil of Ceredigion at the expense of David, Estrad Ty, and Brecanyog. The larger part of these districts, in the course of the 8th century, were tending to unite under one chief, and already in Offa's day, men regarded de Nefer on the Toei, some fifteen miles east of Carmarthen, as a principal seat or capital, the possession of which carried with it the primacy of South Wales. For judicial and fiscal purposes, most of the tribal units were subdivided into cantrefs of very varying sizes, but on the average rather larger than the English hundreds, each of which, in theory, was built up of a hundred trefs or hamlets. For ecclesiastical purposes, there were yet other divisions. Out of the many monastic churches founded in the 6th century, four had come to stand out as the most important and had become centers of Episcopal organization. These were Bangor and Lanelwy, otherwise St. Asaph in northern Wales, Landaf in Morganug, and Manu in Latin Menevia, otherwise St. David's, in David. The Welsh church, too, no longer held aloof from Rome, as in earlier days. About 768, it had adopted the Roman Easter, led by Elbodug, a monk of Sargibi, or Hollyhead, and a student of Bede's works. 
To Wales, this peaceful revolution meant as much as the decision come to at Whitby had meant for England a hundred years earlier. With the acceptance of the Roman date for Easter, Wales threw itself open to the influence of the continent, and not only so, but also to greatly increased intercourse of a non-military character with the English kingdoms. At the date of the fight at Rudlin, Elbowdug was still living. He died about 809, chief bishop in the land of Gwynedd. Among his disciples was Ninius, famed as the editor of the Historia Britonum, from which come so many of the folk tales concerning Arthur and the first coming of the Saxons into Britain. Ninius seems to have lived in Dehybarth, probably near the borders of Brecaniog. He was writing just about the time that Coenwulf ascended the Mercian throne, and his book soon acquired a considerable popularity, not only in Wales but also in England, Ireland, and Brittany. Ninius wrote shocking Latin, and complains that incessant wars and pestilence had dulled the senses of the Britons. But his work, puzzle-headed as it is, shows that the monasteries of Wales still had some learning. He himself refers to Isidore, Jerome, Prosper, and Eusebius, and there are also other indications that some of the Welsh monks of his day were acquainted with parts of the writings of Ovid and Cicero, with Eutychius the Grammarian, and Martianus Capella. The Mercian attack on Wales in 796 was not pressed very far, as Coenwulf soon had other work to do in repressing a rebellion which broke out in Kent. The leader of this revolt was Edbert Preen, presumably a descendant of the old Kentish kings. For two years he had some success, and then Coenwulf captured and blinded him, and set up his own brother, Cuthred, instead as underking of Kent. But this was not all. During the revolt, Archbishop Ethelherd had remained loyal to the Mercian cause, in spite of the affront that Offa had put upon the Sea of Canterbury in 786. Rather than yield to the rebels, he had gone into exile, and there exists a letter to the Kentish leaders in which Alcuin pleads for his restoration. In return for this loyal conduct, Coenwulf not only restored him to his rights, but agreed with him to undo Offa's work and suppress the recently erected Mercian archbishopric. Ethelherd, accordingly, journeyed to Rome to lay the matter before Pope Leo III, and, having obtained his approval, called a synod together at Clove Show in 803, which promulgated the deprivation of Archbishop Higbert and the restoration of the old metropolitan rites of Canterbury. It might have been expected that, after this, the old alliance between Tamworth and Canterbury would have been effectively restored, but it was not so. Archbishop Ethelherd died in 805 and was succeeded by a Kentish man named Wolfred, an ambitious prelate who resented mercy and control and desired independence for Kent. He soon quarreled with Coenwulf over questions of property, especially over the nunnery of Minster in Thanet and over the important estate of Harrow in Middlesex. The trouble is said to have extended over six years and to have led to appeals to the papacy, while it is certain that the archbishop showed his independence by coining money which does not bear any king's name. These turmoils and Welsh campaigns take up the remainder of Coenwulf's reign, but it must not be supposed that he was altogether unmindful of the claims of the church. Existing land books show that he was a benefactor to Worcester, and he is also credited with the foundation of Winchcombe Abbey. There is also some evidence that, about 813, Wolfred was attempting monastic reforms at Canterbury. Coenwulf died in 821. It is said at Basingwork in Flint, still occupied with plans for extending the Mercian frontier westwards from Chester to the Conway. His successor was his brother, Seelwulf, who continued the Welsh policy with success, capturing the fort of Dagenwy near Ladudno and overrunning Powys. Seelwulf's accession, however, was not unchallenged, and two years later we find him deposed in favor of a duke called Bjornwulf. We are quite in the dark as to Bjornwulf's origin and the reasons for his elevation to the throne, 
but we may suspect the hand of Archbishop Wolfred in the background, for shortly afterwards we find Bjornwolf making grants to Wolfred, and the abbess Quinthrith, Cohenwolf's daughter, compelled to resign Harrow to the See of Canterbury. The dispute about the succession between Seelwolf and Bjornwolf marks the beginning of evil days for Mercia. The unity and solidity which had appeared so well established under Offa disappears. The Mercian magnates fall a prey to faction, and almost as it were in the twinkling of an eye, the supremacy of Mercia is wrecked forever. It is time now to turn again to the affairs of Wessex. When Beordrig died in 802, poisoned, so the tale goes, by his wife, the West Saxon Witan saluted as their king that Eckbert whom Offa and Beordrig had driven out of England. The choice was most happy, for Eckbert was a man of experience, who had spent some time in Franklin, and possibly witnessed Charlemagne's Saxon campaigns. He had returned to Wessex about 799, but not before he had marked how the great Frank administered his kingdom. His elevation to the throne clearly meant a less dependent Wessex, and so was distasteful to the Mercians. At any rate, on the very day of Egbert's election, the men of Hawichi took horse and crossed the Upper Thames at Kempsford near Sirencester, led by Ethelmund, a Gloucestershire magnate whose estates lay at Deerhurst and Berkeley. They were met by a West Saxon alderman named Weoxton with the levies of Wiltshire. In the fight which ensued, both leaders were killed, but the Mercians had to retreat, after which Egbert had several years of peace for organizing his kingdom. We know nothing of his acts as an administrator, but in 814 we find him imitating Cohenwolf and engaged in expanding his borders westwards at the expense of the Welsh of Cornwall. As the Chronicle puts it, quote, he laid waste West Wales from eastward to westward, unquote, and thenceforth apparently held it as a ducatus or dukedom annexed to his regnum or kingdom of Wessex, but not wholly incorporated with it. Thus arose that Welsh-speaking duchy or earldom of Cornwall, which almost ever since has formed a quasi-royal appanage in the hands of Egbert's successors, and which maintained its distinct nationality to the 18th century. The exact stages of its reduction to submission cannot be followed. We only know that in 825, the West Welsh were once more in arms, and that Egbert again put them down, and as a later document phrases it, quote, disposed of their territory as it seemed fit to him, giving a tenth part of it to God, unquote. In other words, he incorporated Cornwall ecclesiastically with the West Saxon Diocese of Sherborne, and endowed Eelstan, his fighting bishop, who took part in the campaign, with an extensive Cornish estate consisting of Callington and Lawitton, both in the Tamar Valley, and Potton near Padstow. One is naturally led to ask, were these three properties really equivalent to a tenth of all Cornwall? For if so, it is very noteworthy to find such large estate units already evolved as early as 825. All that can be said in answer is that the evidence of the Domesday Book, written 260 years later, does not altogether bear out this conclusion, but yet is more in harmony with it than might have been expected. For that survey credits these three properties with 130 plowlands, which is about an 18th part of the total plowlands recorded for all Cornwall. At any rate, then, we may regard this gift as transferring a very considerable stretch of land, and its effect would be to open up West Wales not a little to English influences. Little, however, seems actually to have been done in the way of settling West Saxon colonists in the country, if we may judge from the sparsity of the English type of place name everywhere but in the Tamar Valley. The rest of Cornwall remains to this day a land of trefts, that is to say, of petty hamlets, bearing such names as Trenants, Tregony, and Trevelyan, of which quite a handful are required to form a parish, 
although this is not called after any one of them, but by the name of the saint to whom the church is dedicated. Nor would it seem were new local divisions introduced by the conquerors. The so-called Cornish shires, such as Pidershire or Wivelshire, seem to really be the old Welsh cantrefs. The term shire must, however, have been applied to them almost from the first conquest, for King Alfred's will, only sixty years later, has an allusion to, quote, street net on Trichenshire, that is to say, to Stratton, near Bude in Trickshire. The settlement of Cornwall was hardly effected when news came that the Mercians had again invaded Wiltshire. Egbert thereupon led his army eastwards and came up with Bjornwolf's forces at Ellenden, a village near Swindon, now called Nether Rotten, but as late as the 14th century known as Ellenton. A pitched battle ensued, in which the Mercians were completely routed. This victory must be regarded as a turning point in England's development, for it led to a permanent alteration of the balance of power in England in favor of the West Saxons. To follow up his advantage, Egbert at once dispatched his son, Ethelwolf, accompanied by Bishop Eelstan, against Kent, a district which he could claim with some show of reason, as he was the son of Eelmund. Ethelwolf's march was as successful as his father's. Baldred, the Kentish underking appointed by Mercia, soon fled northwards over the Thames, and thereupon, as the chronicle has it, the men of Kent and Surrey submitted to Wessex, admitting that, quote, they had been wrongly forced from Egbert's kin, unquote. Sussex and Essex a few weeks later followed suit, and finally the East Anglians also rose and re-established their independence of Mercia by attacking Bjornwolf from the east and slaying him in battle. No series of events could well be more dramatic than the success of disasters which brought about the collapse of Mercia in 825. Wessex and Mercia, as it were, changed parts. Within a year, the Mercian kingdom dwindled to half its former size, while Wessex expanded so that it may be regarded henceforth as including all England south of the Thames. Kent, it is true, still retained its individuality in the hands of Egbert's son, as an underkingdom enjoying its own special customs and as the chief seat of church government, but its affairs were nevertheless directed from Winchester, and the archbishops of Canterbury could no longer look to Tamworth for protection, but were brought much more under West Saxon influences. For the Mercians, the immediate question after 825 was, could they maintain their independence, or must they accept Egbert as an overlord? They evidently went on with the struggle, but their new king, Ludica, fared no better than Bjornwolf. He fell in battle in 827, with five of his dukes. Wiglaf then succeeded, but likewise made no headway, and soon fled into exile. Meantime, Eckbert, with the help of the East Anglians, overran the Midlands at will, and for the moment was acclaimed lord of all men south of the Humber. In 829, he even projected an attack on Northumbria, and led his army to Dor, a frontier village in the Peak District. The Northumbrian king at this time was Enred, 808 to 840. He came to Dor and apparently bought off Egbert's hostility with offers of homage and perhaps of tribute. Too much has sometimes been made of these episodes. They have even been treated as marking the unification of England under a single overlord, but certainly they had no such result. Egbert's position in Mercia was really precarious, and the very next year we find Wiglaf restored to his kingdom. Patriotic West Saxon tradition in later days liked to picture Egbert as a Bretwalda, worthy to be classed with Edwin and Oswy and the other ancient heroes who, in Bede's pages, stood preeminent as wielding an imperium before the rise of Mercia but eulogy must not be mistaken for sober history. It would seem, on the contrary, that Egbert's power soon waned, and that Wiglaf's restoration was due to a Mercian revival. The Wessex Chronicle gives no hint that Egbert was active in Mercia after 830, 
nor do any Mercian notables attest his land books. It has indeed been suggested that the Ethelstan, who ruled East Anglia in Egbert's later years, was one of his sons, but this is a guess incapable of proof and hardly in harmony with the independence admittedly enjoyed by the East Anglians shortly afterwards. Egbert's last years are of interest not because of any growth of unity in England, but because they witnessed the reappearance of the Vikings and the consequent rise of a new and grave danger for all the English kingdoms. All through the first quarter of the ninth century, Scandinavian longships had been harrying western Scotland and Ireland, coming by way of the Faroe Islands and the Orkneys. Beginning in 795 with attacks on Skye, they had in 802 come south to Iona and Donegal, and thence spread east and west along the coasts of Ulster and Connemara. By 825 they had fairly encircled Ireland and plundered most of its shrines, in England, on the other hand, no raids are heard of for 40 years after the attacks on Lindisfarne and Jarrow in Offa's days, and it was not till 834 that the danger reappeared as the result of the establishment of Danish exiled chieftains in Frisia, as the Netherlands were then called, by Louis the Pious. In that year, considerable fleets set out from Denmark and the north to attack the Frankish Empire, and coming to the mouths of the Rhine, burnt the important Frisian trading ports of Doristad and Utrecht. The general situation on the continent is dealt with in other chapters. Here we have only to note that a detachment of this force also came to England, and entering the Thames, ravaged the island of Sheppey. Two years later, the Frisian provinces were again attacked and the town of Antwerp sacked. Again, a small detachment came across to England. This time, the raiders landed in Dorset, and Eckbert himself met them at Charmouth, not far from Lyme Regis. The Vikings had only 35 ships with crews about 1,200 strong, but the fight nonetheless went against the king, and the victors gained the impression that Wessex was worth attacking. At any rate, in 838, there arrived a larger fleet which came to land in Cornwall. Once more, Egbert marched to meet the raiders to find that the Cornish had risen to join them. Victory, however, lay with the English, the allied Danes and Welsh being put to flight at Hingston Down, a moor on the west bank of the Tamar near Callington. As a result, it would appear that a bishop, definitely subject to Canterbury, was shortly afterwards appointed for Cornwall in the person of one Kinsteck, whose see was placed in the monastery of Denurin. This was Eckbert's last achievement. He died in the summer of 839. The accession of his son Ethelwolf, which almost corresponds in point of time with the death of Louis the Pious and the breakup of the Carolingian Empire on the continent, introduces a new phase into English affairs. Hitherto, the main thread of English history has been concerned with the rivalries between the English kingdoms and with the gradual growth of civilization and a tendency to union under the auspices of the church. But for the next 40 years, internal progress ceased, and as in Franklin, so in England, the one constant feature of the times was the ceaseless struggle which every province in turn had to wage against Danish invaders. In 839, the Viking raids could still be regarded as merely a passing inconvenience, and the English people hardly realized the full extent of the danger which threatened them. But from that date, the raids grew more persistent and better organized year by year, and it soon became apparent that the object of the invaders was not merely plunder, but the complete conquest of the country. Before Ethelwolf died, the heathen fleets had already taken to wintering in England, and in the days of his sons, the struggle reached its climax. The Viking armies then penetrated into all parts of the island, ravaging and burning unmercifully, and three of the four English kingdoms, Northumbria, Mercia, and East Anglia, one after another succumbed to their onslaughts. At times, it even looked as if Wessex, the strongest kingdom of them all, would also go under. Many battles went against its armies, and more than once, 
All the shires south of the Thames were overrun. In their hour of trial, however, the West Saxons found a savior in the famous Alfred, Ethelwolf's youngest son. Under his leadership, they again took courage and at last beat back the invaders and compelled them to confine their settlements to the northern and eastern portions of the country. The England which emerged from the struggle was an entirely changed England. The four kingdoms of Egbert's day had been replaced by a division of the country into two well-marked spheres, one of which was English and Christian, while the other was Danish in law and custom and, in part, heathen. The Danish portion, subsequently known as the Danelaw, Danalagu, had, however, little political cohesion, being composed of a large number of petty communities under a variety of independent rulers, some styled kings and others jarls, who were mutually distrustful of each other, whereas the English portion formed a comparatively compact state looking for guidance and defense to the house of Egbert, which alone survived of the four older royal houses. In the hard-fought struggle, much had been lost. Letters and the arts had practically perished. Christianity had received a severe shock, and monastic life had either disappeared or become degraded. But in spite of this partial lapse into barbarism, much had also been gained, the new settlers being men of vigorous physique and character and eager to develop trade and industry. Their language, too, and their social and legal institutions were not so different from those of the English as to preclude the hope of amalgamation, and so a situation arose much more favorable than might have been expected for the ultimate unification of the country into a single state, provided that the West Saxon dynasty could retain its vigor and prestige. End of section 48. Section 49 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. Section 49, The Foundation of the Kingdom of England, Part 2, by William John Corbett. The change from Eckbert to Ethelwolf, just as the period of turmoil began, was by no means a gain for Wessex. The best that can be said for the new king is that he was well-meaning and devout, but he was not the man to intimidate invaders or enlarge his patrimony. He was content to regard Beortwulf and Burrad, the kings who ruled in Mercia in his days, as his equals, and so far as we know, he only once led an army across the Thames, and then not to coerce the Mercians, but to assist them in a campaign against the Welsh. Ethelwolf's real bent was towards works of piety, and in later days he was best remembered for his donation to the church. Land books refer to this transaction as a decimatio agorum, and some have connected it with the institution of tithe, but clearly it had quite a different character. The chronicler Asser, who places the gift in 855, says that the king freed a tenth part of his land from royal dues and dedicated it to God for the redemption of his soul. This must mean that he gave very considerable properties to the monastic houses of Wessex, but we are left in the dark whether the king was dealing only with his private booklands, which he had power to dispose of by will, or with all the crown lands in Wessex. It is noticeable, however, that Ethelwolf is found creating bookland in favor of himself, perhaps with his donation in view. Ethelwolf also maintained close relations with Rome, sending his youngest son Alfred on a visit to Pope Leo IV in 853, and himself undertaking a journey thither two years later. Considering the progress made by the Vikings, the time chosen for his pilgrimage seems most ill-advised. In all parts of England, ever since Egbert's death, the Viking raids had been growing in audacity. For example, in 841, 
one force had overrun Lindsay, while in 844 another had slain the king of Northumbria. In 851, a fleet of no less than 350 ships appeared in the Thames, whose crews burnt Canterbury and then stormed London, and put Beortwulf of Mercia to flight. A gleam of success gained this year may perhaps account for Ethelwulf's false confidence, his troops winning a victory at a place called Oakley, Aclea, over a contingent of the Danes which had recrossed the Thames to raid in Surrey. This victory, however, meant little, for the enemy, after their defeat, only retreated to East Kent and remained in Thanet over the winter. This wintering in 851 marks the end of the period of mere raids. In 855, the outlook became even darker. Some heathen bands that year harried the province of Rio Cinciate along the upper Severn, and others wintered in Sheppey. Ethelwulf, however, was quite blind to the signs of the times. Instead of returning from Rome as quickly as possible, he remained out of England over a year, and on his way back turned aside to visit the West Frankish king, Charles the Bald. At his court, he committed a further folly, marrying Charles's daughter, Judith, a girl of 13. This high alliance flattered the elderly king's vanity, but the news of it greatly offended his grown-up sons and drove Ethelbald, the eldest, who was acting as regent, to rebel and claim the western parts of Wessex for himself. Ethelwulf, on his return, had perforce to acquiesce in this, and for the remainder of his life, Wessex was in reality partitioned, and Eckbert's work, to a large extent, undone. During the middle years of the century, while the English kingdoms seemed to be going downhill, it is interesting to observe the development of an opposite tendency in Wales and Scotland. In both these Celtic districts, rulers of ability appeared and effected some advance in the direction of national unity. In Wales, the movement first attracts attention about the time of the Battle of Ellendon, when Murfin the Freckled established a new dynasty in Gwynedd in the place of the ancient house of Cadwallon. Murfin, however, was completely eclipsed in energy by his son, the celebrated Rodri Mar, 844-878, who won undying fame among his countrymen by conquering Powys and the greater part of Dehybarth. The unity thus achieved did not, it is true, long endure, but considering that it was attained in the face of constant Viking raids, the feat was undoubtedly a memorable one. In Scotland, a similar task, but on a much larger scale, was undertaken by Kenneth MacAlpin, 844-860. This prince, beginning merely as king of the Dalriad Scots, in a reign of sixteen years, not only added the realm of the Picts to his dominions, but also made himself a terror in northern Bernicia, advancing in his raids into Lothian as far south as Dunbar and Melrose. He may, in fact, be reckoned the true founder of the Scottish kingdom as it was to be known to history, and the first Scot to advance the claim that the frontier of England should be set back from the Forth to the Tweed. It was in 858, while these events were in progress in the north, that Ethelwulf died, leaving a will, no longer extant, in which it appears that he unwisely recognized the partition of Wessex. This mistake was fortunately remedied in 860, when events enabled his second son Ethelbert to regain Ethelbald's share of the kingdom, and five years later the realm passed entire to yet another brother, Ethelred. The short reigns of Ethelbald and Ethelbert were not without their disasters. In 861, the Vikings sacked Winchester, and in 865, so ravaged East Kent that Archbishop Sealnoth had to allow clerks to fill the places of monks at Canterbury, while in the rest of the country, learning had so decayed that scarcely a scholar remained who could read the Mass in Latin. Worse, however, was yet to come. With Ethelred's accession, we enter the most stormy period of the ninth century. Fresh swarms of allied sea kings then arrived determined to find homes in England. Our primary authority, the West Saxon Chronicle, is silent as to the names of the leaders, but according to later traditions they were Ingwar, Ubba, and Halfdene, three brothers who are regarded by the Scandinavian saga writers 
as sons of the half-mythical Ragnar Lothbrok in legendary song The Greatest of All Sea Rovers. These chiefs landed first in East Anglia, then ruled by a prince called Edmund. Their immediate object, however, was not to overthrow this king, but to obtain horses. In this they succeeded, and then, either in 866 or 867, rode round the Fens and north across Lindsay to attack Dara, where the usual civil war was in progress between Ayla and Osbjort, two rival claimants for the Northumbrian throne. Legend tells us that they came to avenge the death of Ragnar Lothbrok, who is said to have been killed in an earlier raid in Northumbria, but probably they chose Northumbria for attack because its dissensions made it an easy prey. York was quickly taken, and in 867 both Ayla and Osbjort were killed in a joint attempt to regain it. With their deaths, the independence of Dara came to an end, but it would appear that the comparatively unfertile districts of Bernicia did not much attract the invaders, with the result that the country from the Tees northwards to the Scotch boundary remained subject to English princes seated at Bamborough. These rulers retained for their diminished territories the name of Northumberland, which after this gradually ceases to be applied to the Yorkshire districts actually adjoining the Humber. Their small principality, however, could hardly be regarded as a kingdom, and so they soon dropped the title of king and came to be styled either dukes or, later still, High Reeves of Bamborough. Having secured their footing in the Vale of York, the Danes next marched south along the Trent to Nottingham to see whether they could not also establish themselves in the ancient Mercian homeland. Attacked thus in the very heart of his kingdom, Burred invoked help from the West Saxons, but though Ethelred, who was Burred's brother-in-law, willingly came to his aid, the Allied kings apparently dared not risk a pitched battle, and in 868 the Mercians were reduced to buying a truce by offers of tribute. For the moment, this satisfied the Vikings, who withdrew once more to Dara. There they stayed quiet for a year, but in the autumn of 869 they again rode south, perhaps to meet fresh reinforcements, and, after harrying eastern Mercia from the Humber to the Ouse, determined to try their luck against Edmund of East Anglia, whose territories they had spared on landing. Details of their march southwards are missing, but it was doubtless then that the Finland monasteries of Bardney, Meachamstead, Crowland, and Ely, after Worcester, the chief centers of mercy and learning and civilization, were destroyed and much of Lindsay and Middle Anglia given over again to heathendom. Burred made no efforts, it would seem, to organize defensive measures for these districts, but a much stouter resistance awaited the Viking forces at Thetford, where they proposed to take up their winter quarters. Again, details are very confused and scanty, but it is clear that the English forces were decisively beaten and we are told that Edmund himself was captured by Ingwar and Ubba and put to death on November 20th at Hoxen in Suffolk by their orders because he refused to abjure Christianity. In the spring of 870, all East Anglia submitted, and there too heathendom and the worship of Tor and Woden was partially reintroduced, but their fallen king's memory was so cherished by the vanquished East Anglians that he soon came to be regarded as a saint and martyr and a generation later the site of his tomb at Beatrice's Worth had grown to be a new Christian center, which in a short time became famous under the name of St. Edmund's Bury. What became of Ingwar after Edmund's death is not known. It is possible that he returned to Dara to secure his first conquests, and went thence to Scotland to assist the Irish Vikings, who, led by Olaf the White, the Norse king of Dublin, were about this time attacking the Strathclyde Britons. He may even be the Ivar whose death is reported in the Annals of Ulster as occurring in 872. In England, at any rate, he ceases to be heard of, and his place as leader of the Danish army fell to Halfdene, represented as his brother, and to another sea king called Bagsiog. These chiefs, by no means satisfied with the territories and booty already won, determined next to invade Wessex, and surprise its king by a winter attack. They accordingly set out in the autumn to march by land into the Thames Valley, and, neglecting London, 
descended late in December on Reading in Berkshire. Here they set up a fortified camp at the point where the river Kennet joins the Thames. In describing the measures taken to repel this invasion, the West Saxon Chronicle suddenly becomes much more detailed, and so it is possible to follow the numerous engagements of the next few weeks with considerable minuteness, and even to gain some idea of the tactics employed. The most favorable encounter to the West Saxons was a fight which took place in January 871 to the west of Reading, on the slopes of Ashdown. In this, Ethelred fought in person, and, with the aid of his brother Alfred, slew Bagsiog and several other Danish leaders. But this success was counterbalanced by a defeat at Basing, in Hampshire, only a fortnight later, and by yet another disaster in March at a hamlet called Martin on the outskirts of Sabernag Forest in Wiltshire. Amid all this gloom, Ethelred's reign terminated. He died about Easter, leaving only infant children, and was buried at Wimborne, one of Ein's foundations in Dorset. Ethelred's death was no real disaster for the West Saxons, for it opened the succession to his brother Alfred, who, in a reign of twenty-eight and a half years, 871 to 899, was destined to prove himself one of the most remarkable characters known to history. Born at Wantage in Berkshire, the youngest of Ethelwolf's sons by his first wife, Osber, Alfred was a married man just turned twenty-three when he was acclaimed king by the West Saxon magnates. His wife was Eelswith, daughter of Ethelred Musil, a leading Mercian duke, who witnesses many of Berhred's land books. Before his election, Alfred was already known as a prince of courage and energy, who, according to his biographer Asser, had shown in boyhood a taste for learning, which unfortunately had not been gratified, as he could get no proper masters. His health, however, had never been robust, and he must have taken up his task with many misgivings, having the disasters of eastern England before his eyes. The fate of central Wessex, indeed, seemed hanging by a thread a month later, when the Danes gained another well-contested battle at Wilton, but, as it turned out, Alfred was to have a four years' respite. After nine costly encounters, none of which had been at all decisive, the Danes began to think that the conquest of Wessex was too difficult, and that Mercia would prove a more remunerative prey. Both sides, therefore, as at Nottingham three years before, found themselves anxious to treat, and a peace was patched up on the understanding that the Viking army should abandon its hold on Berkshire and withdraw across the Thames. This peace shows well the complete want of national feeling in ninth-century England. It was now the turn of the Midlands to feel the fury of the army, but just as Berhred, entangled, it would appear, in a conflict with the Welsh, had not come forward to help his brother-in-law Ethelred in his peril, so now Alfred pledged himself to inactivity while the Vikings laid their plans for the final ruin of Mercia. Their first move was from Reading to London, where they spent the spring of 872, watched by the West Saxons from across the Thames, until Berhred agreed to ransom the town and its dependent districts by the payment of a heavy tribute. Worcestershire documents which allude to this levy, or geld, as the Saxons called it, still exist, and also pennies minted by Halfdene at London. The promise to evacuate southeastern Mercia was redeemed by the army transferring itself once again to Dara, but it soon came back to Lindsay and encamped for the winter at Torxey on Trent in the immediate vicinity of Lincoln. From this base, it could ravage at leisure all the country watered by the tributaries of the Middle Trent, and by the end of 873, it had pushed so far into Mercia that it was able to winter at Repton, revered as the burying place of the Mercian dynasty, only a few miles from Tamworth and Lichfield. One would like to know the details of this campaign and hear more of the fate that overtook Leicester and Nottingham, but unfortunately no native chronicle exists to give vividness to the death struggle of Mercia. All we know comes from the West Saxon account, which merely states that Berhred's spirit was so entirely broken that in 874 he abandoned his kingdom and fled abroad, dying at Rome shortly afterwards. 
His vacant throne was promptly filled by one seal wolf, an unwise king's thane, but this ruler was little more than a puppet set up with Halfdene's connivance, a semivir, as William of Malmesbury terms him, who was forced by the Danes to swear that he would hold his kingdom for the behoof of the army and deliver it up whenever required. This transaction is pretty good evidence that the Danes had overrun more territory than they could hope to hold, but that their leaders were expecting reinforcements and anticipated in the near future a need for additional settlements. The army accordingly retired from Repton and, not being united on a common plan, broke up into two sections, one of which withdrew to Dara under Halfdene, while the other under Guthrum, Oskidal, and Anwind, sea kings not hitherto mentioned, went to Cambridge. Halfdene's plan was apparently to regain for York its former dependencies. He established his base for the winter on the Tyne, and from thence in 875 organized savage raids into every corner of Bernicia, then ruled by Rixig, and also into the territories of the Picts and Strathclyde Britons. Nothing permanent was achieved by these devastations, but they have some importance in church history, because they led Bishop Eardolf, who had charge of the shrines of St. Aidan and St. Cuthbert, to abandon his see at Lindisfarne, so long the spiritual capital of the north, and to set out on an eight years pilgrimage through the moors of Cumberland and the coasts of Solway in search of a more secure asylum. And now at last we reach the stage of real colonization. In 876, Halfdene returned to York and dealt out Dara to his followers, who thenceforward continued plowing and tilling it, no Danish domesday book tells how the allotment of estates was carried out, or what proportion of the English owners preserved their lands, but it must in the main have been a process of imposing Danish warriors on English cultivators, very similar to the settlement of Normans carried out 200 years later by William the Conqueror, except that the Danish armies contained a large class of freedmen, the so-called leasings, or men loosened from bondage, to whom no exact counterpart can be found in the later invasion. This half-free class had to be accommodated with land as well as the fully free classes, the holds and bond who formed the upper and middle grades of Viking society, but they were not of sufficient social standing to become independent landowners, being often of alien race and descended from prisoners of war, slaves, and bankrupts. How exactly they were dealt with can only be guessed, but it seems not unlikely that they received holdings in the villages similar to those of the English Cheorls, only that they held them by a distinctly freer tenure as members of the conquering armies. Nor is it fanciful to recognize their descendants later on in the peasant class known as Sochimani, who held a position in the society of the 11th century just above the Villani, or ordinary cultivators, and who are found in very considerable numbers in just those parts of England where the Danes are known to have settled, but not at all or only in trifling numbers elsewhere. A year later, portions of Mercia were similarly colonized. After harvest, so runs a laconic entry in the Wessex Chronicle, the army went into Mercia, and some part of it they apportioned, and some they delivered to Sealwolf. No clue is vouchsafed as to the identity of the army concerned, and no names are mentioned, either of the leaders or the districts implicated. It is clear, however, from subsequent events, that the districts left to Sealwolf comprised all western Mercia, from the Mersey to the Thames, and that the boundary fixed upon ran north and south from near the Peak in Derbyshire to a point just east of Tamworth on the Watling Street, and then along that highway southeastwards to the headwaters of the Worcestershire Avon and the Welland, and perhaps even further, past Toaster to Stony Stratford on the Ouse. To the east of this boundary, Danish customs and law were imposed upon the Mercian villages, and Danish political terminology introduced instead of English. Politically, also, there was a considerable reorganization, the land being divided into five districts, each with its own army under an independent jarl, and each having for its center a fortified camp which the settlers could garrison in times of stress. 
The five centers selected were Lincoln, Stamford, Nottingham, Darby, and Leicester, and as the term burr at this date still had the meaning of a fortified place, they soon came to be specially known as the five boroughs. Meantime, in East Anglia and Southeast Mercia, affairs did not progress so swiftly towards a settlement. The rank and file of the army, which encamped in Cambridge in 875, would doubtless have been well content to form borough districts between the Thames and the Welland, similar to those which were being set up between the Welland and the Humber, but their leader, Guthrum, coveted Alfred's dominions as well, and when he heard that fresh fleets were in the English Channel attacking the southern coasts of Wessex, he could not resist joining in the enterprise. Already in 875, there is mention of Alfred fighting the Vikings at sea. The next year, a fleet appeared off the coast of Dorset over a hundred strong. The chronicler Ethelward alludes to it as a western army. The bulk of it, therefore, doubtless came from Ireland, but help reached it from Guthrum. Landing near Pool Harbor, the Allied Vikings proceeded to harry the surrounding districts, and then seized Wareham after outmaneuvering Alfred's forces. When winter approached, Alfred thought it best to offer terms. The Vikings, however, treacherously deceived him, and, having accepted a sum of money on the condition that they would decamp, slipped out of Wareham suddenly and made a dash for Exeter, with the intention of using it as a base from which to ravage Devon. In 877, the luck turned. While Alfred kept the Viking land force shut up in Exeter, their fleet came to grief in a storm off Swanage. This disaster placed the marauders in a precarious position. Before the end of the year, they had to capitulate, and if Ethelward's account is to be believed, retired to Gloucester. Once more, Wessex appeared to be saved. In reality, the worst crisis of all was at hand. About midwinter, Guthrum threw his whole army unexpectedly upon Wessex and almost surprised Alfred at Chippenham, where he was keeping Christmas. At the same moment, Halfdene's brother Ubba, sailing from Dovid, invaded North Devon. The brunt of Guthrum's invasion fell upon Wiltshire, but other shires also suffered severely, and so great was the general terror that many of the West Saxon leaders fled over sea. Alfred, however, never despaired. Getting away with difficulty from Chippenham, he retired into the marshlands of Somerset and stockaded himself with Ethelnoth, the alderman of the district, in the island of Athelney at the junction of the Tone and Parrot. There he remained on the defensive till the news came that the men of Devon, led by their alderman Otta, had defeated Halfdene's brother. The king then put himself once more at the head of the levies of central Wessex, his men meeting him early in May 878 on the borders of Wiltshire, just to the east of Selwood Forest. Two days later, he fell upon Guthrum's army at Edington, Ethenden, near Westbury, and so utterly defeated it that a fortnight later at Chippenham a peace was agreed to. The terms arranged were remarkable, for Guthrum not only promised that he would withdraw his army from Wessex, but also that he would accept baptism. The ceremony was accordingly performed in June at Aller, near Athelney, the chrism loosing taking place at Wedmore, a village near Glastonbury. The departure of the Danes from Wessex was carried out before long. In 879, we find them at Cirencester, and from that time forward, the West Saxons were never again in any serious danger of being conquered by the Northmen. To the Mercians, in the yet unravaged valley of the Severn, the peace made at Chippenham, often inaccurately called the Peace of Wedmore, only meant an increase of danger. The move to Cirencester seemed clearly to portend that Guthrum hoped to find satisfaction in Gloucestershire and Worcestershire for his failure in Wessex, and the danger seemed all the greater when it became known, in the summer of 879, that a new fleet of Vikings had arrived in the Thames and landed at Fulham. In this predicament, the magnates of the Hoichi decided to take an important step. To depend on the puppet king Seelwolf for defense was clearly useless. They accordingly turned to the victor of Edington, 
and led by Ethelred of Gloucester, their foremost duke, and by Warfrith, the Bishop of Worcester, offered Alfred their allegiance. How many of the leading Mercians supported Ethelred in his submission to Wessex is not recorded. All that can be said is that we find Ethelred after this treated by Alfred to some extent as a vassal, and given in charters the title of Duke of the Mercians. Thus ended the independent kingdom of Mercia. On the Danes, the effect of this politic stroke was immediate. In 880, the province of the Hoichi was evacuated without any fighting, and Guthrum withdrew from Cirencester and marched his army back into East Anglia, while the Fulham fleet returned to Flanders. Next there followed the apportionment of Hendrika, Essex, and East Anglia among Guthrum's followers, while in Middle Anglia a second series of boroughs were set up at Northampton, Huntington, Cambridge, and Bedford, each ruled by a more or less independent jarl, and each with its dependent territory defended by its own army. Guthrum's own sphere was large enough to be regarded as a kingdom. It had Norwich, Thetford, Ipswich, Colchester, and London for head centers, and when first established, stretched westwards over half the district of the Siltern seat. We may guess, in fact, that it was the creation of Guthrum's new Danish kingdom which first brought about the division of this old province into the two portions known to us today as Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire. For the former, when we get information about it in the 11th century, shows no signs of Danish colonization and was regarded as subject to Mercian law, whereas the latter was then peopled to a considerable extent by Sochimani and was held to be a portion of the Dane law. End of section 49. Section 50 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. Section 50. The Foundation of the Kingdom of England, Part 3, by William John Corbett. The followers of Halfdene and Guthrum, when once settled, proved fairly peaceable neighbors to Wessex and her Mercian ally, and in the next two decades only gave trouble on one or two occasions, when roused by the appearance of fresh fleets from abroad. This furnished Alfred with a much-needed opportunity for reorganizing his realm, and it is his great glory that he not only took up the task with patient doggedness, but showed himself, if possible, even more capable as a reformer in peace than as a leader in war. It is impossible, for want of space, to follow his reforms in detail. But a few of the more noteworthy developments due to his constructive statesmanship may be glanced at. First, we may take his military reforms. These comprised the improvement of his naval force by the enlistment of Frisians and the division of the feared, or national levy, into two parts, the one to be available as a relief to the other at convenient intervals, so that the peasant soldiers might have proper opportunities of attending to the needs of their farms and therefore less excuse for deserting in the middle of a campaign. But more important than either of these was the gradual creation in all parts of his kingdom of fortified strongholds defended by earthworks and palisades of timber in imitation of the Danish boroughs and the subdivision of the ancient West Saxon shires into smaller districts of varying size, each charged with the upkeep of one or more forts. The evidence for this is found in the many references to the men of the boroughs that begin to appear in the chronicle as the reign proceeds and even in the land books, such as the Worcester Charter, which sets forth how Ethelred, with Alfred's consent, worked a borough at Worcester for the protection of the bishop and monks and granted them the right to take a scot, Burwheel's Skeeting, for its maintenance. This, of course, is a Mercian instance, but a list of the boroughs of Wessex and of the heidages assessed on their appendant districts 
has also chanced to be preserved, which cannot be of a date much after Alfred's death. And this mentions some 25 strongholds scattered up and down his kingdom. Of these, the more important along the south coast were Hastings, Lewis, Chichester, Porchester, Southampton, Wareham, Bridport, and Exeter, and along the north frontier, Barnstaple, Watchet, Axbridge, Bath, Malmesbury, Cricklade, Wallingford, and Southwark, Southringa Jowirk. It seems also likely that the scheme of hidage recorded in this document was of Alfred's devising, for the figures run smaller than in the 8th century Mercian scheme, though still based on a unit of 1,200 hides, and we know of no other occasion so likely to have required a reform of fiscal arrangements as the creation of the borough districts. Passing to civil reforms, the most arduous of all, perhaps, was the compilation of a fresh edition of the West Saxon laws. For this purpose, Alfred examined and sifted not only Ein's earlier dooms, but also the laws published by Offa, which unfortunately have not survived to us, and those issued by the Kentish kings. From these, he selected what seemed to him to be the most useful, only adding a few new ordinances of his own. There is also good evidence that he took great pains to secure justice for his subjects, and that he was most careful in husbanding and increasing the royal revenue. Most noteworthy, however, of all his reforms was his attempt to revive religion and learning, which had been almost crushed out by the Danish inroads. For this purpose, he not only set to work to educate himself in reading and translating Latin, but collected at his court a band of scholars who should give him advice and act as teachers in the schools which he instituted. Some of these he obtained from West Mercia, which had not suffered so much as Wessex, some from Wales and Ireland, and some from the continent. Among them were Werfeth, the Bishop of Worcester, who had helped to bring about the alliance with Ethelred, Plegmund, a Mercian who in 890 was chosen Archbishop of Canterbury, Grimbald, a Flemish monk from St. Burton's, John the Old Saxon from Corvey, who became abbot of a monastery founded by Alfred at Athelney, and Asser, a Welsh monk from St. David's, who ultimately became Bishop of Sherburn and wrote Alfred's biography. With these men, Alfred was on the most intimate terms, and with their help, he not only set on foot the celebrated Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to record the deeds of his house and nation, but also undertook a notable series of translations from Latin into English in order to place the best authorities on different branches of knowledge within the reach of his subjects. Among the works he selected for this purpose were Bede's Ecclesiastical History, Gregory's Pastoral Care, Erosius's History of the World, and Boethius's De Consolatione Philosophiae. All these, by good fortune, have come down to us though Alfred's own handbook is lost, in which he noted down what pleased him most in his reading. Many glimpses, however, are to be had of the king's own personal views in these works, for the translation is always free, and in them, and the chronicle, we have the real starting point of English prose. Alfred's peaceful reforms were twice interrupted by spells of war. In 885, a Viking force attacked Rochester, and this induced Guthrum to break the peace, whereupon the West Saxon feared proceeded to besiege London. The upshot was the recapture of that important center, and such an overthrow of Guthrum's forces that he had to cede the westernmost portion of his kingdom to the English. The new frontier agreed upon is preserved for us in a document known as Alfred and Guthrum's Peace. It went from the Thames east of London, quote, up the River Lee to its source near Luton, then across country to Bedford, and from there up the River Ouse to the Watling Street. End quote. In other words, the Danes ceded their portion of the Chilterns and the southwest half of Hendrika, including St. Albans, and these Alfred handed over to Duke Ethelred as being parts of Mercia. At the same time, Ethelred married Ethelfleda, Alfred's eldest child who was now about 16, and so still further cemented the bond between Mercia and Wessex. 
A further clause in the treaty, which deserves notice, is the provision for equating the various grades of Englishmen and Danes should legal questions arise in the ceded district involving a determination of their war gelds. As to this, the treaty laid down the rule that the Danish bond, though in his home across the North Sea only the equal of a Cheorl, should in disputes between Saxons and Danes be regarded as the equal of the Mercian twelve hindmen, the Thane, as he had come to be called by Alfred's day, while the Mercian Cheorl, or twy hindmen, was only to be regarded as the equal of the half-free leasing. In the case of the bond and the Thane, the war was to be eight half-marks of gold, equivalent, as the ratio of gold to silver was nine to one, to twenty-four pounds, and this in livestock meant two hundred forty cows, the cow by Mercian law being valued at twenty-four denarius. In the case of the leasing and the Cheorl, on the other hand, the war was to be two hundred Mercian shillings, that is to say, 960 denarius, or four pounds, the hundred in this case being the long hundred of six score, and the mercy in shilling being equivalent to four denarius. The war of the peasant classes, therefore, amounted in livestock to 40 cows, or the sixth part of the war of the Dearborn military class. All this, when properly understood, is of considerable interest, for it enables us to see how greatly Danish society had been modified by the conquest of eastern England, and how seriously in the Dane law the Saxon peasants had been depressed by the national defeat, even after some of their disasters had been retrieved and their prestige partially regained. In 892, a far more dangerous crisis had to be faced when defeats in East Frankland drove another great fleet, led by a chief called Hastings, across the channel to seek lands in England. Over 800 ships, we are told, set sail from Boulogne, and coming to Kent, effected lodgments at Appledore near Romney, and at Milton near Sheppey, and later on at Benfleet in Essex. With all his experience, Alfred could hardly cope with the emergency, and for three years Midland England was in a turmoil. It soon appeared that the aim of the invaders was to get possession of the Severn Valley, still the least ravaged part of England, and in pursuit of this object they over and over again dashed across England from their base on the east coast and ravaged Ethelred's dukedom from end to end, one year wintering at Bridgenorth and another at Chester. In the end, however, Hastings was foiled in all his efforts by the steady cooperation of the West Saxon and Mercian fiords, and, finding in 896 that no real help was to be obtained, either from the North Welsh or from the Northumbrian or Midland Danes, he gave up the contest and went back to Frankland. After this, Alfred had peace for the rest of his days. He lived a few years longer, but died on 26 October 899, when still only 51 years old. The 50 years following the death of Alfred are the time when the Kingdom of England was really established. Alfred's great work had been to save Wessex from foreign invaders, and then to reorganize what he had saved, but he had never aimed at conquests beyond his borders. Even over Mercia he had exercised no real sovereignty, and still less over the chieftains of Glamorgan and Gwent, Brecknock and Dovid, who had sought his protection. And so he was in no sense King of England, or even of half England. When he died, the territories over which he ruled, and where his laws held good, were confined to the shires south of the Thames, and in the rest of England, there were a far greater number of independent principalities than there had been a century earlier. When, therefore, his eldest son, generally called Edward the Elder to distinguish him from later kings of the same name, was elected to succeed him. It was only the West Saxon magnates who took part in the ceremony, and no one could have predicted that a union of the petty English states would soon be brought about by the West Saxon dynasty. Edward, however, unlike his father, within a few years adopted a policy of expansion, in imitation of the earlier Brett Waldas, and fortune so aided him and the three capable sons who afterwards succeeded him in turn, that by 954, 
The house of Eckbert had not merely acquired an overlordship of the old pattern, but had completely ousted all the other ruling families, whether English or Danish, so that formally, at any rate, there was only one recognized king left in all England. The events which produced this far-reaching change are clear enough in their main outlines, but it is very difficult to arrange them in their proper sequence, as no dates in Edward's reign, 899 to 925, can be fixed with any certainty owing to discrepancies in chronology between the English, Welsh, and Irish annals, discrepancies which later historians have attempted to get over by dovetailing the various accounts one into the other and therefore duplicating not a few of the incidents of the story. All the sources, however, agree in stating that Edward's first difficulties arose with his cousin Ethelwald, the younger of the sons of King Ethelred, Alfred's elder brother. This prince, Ethelhelm, his elder brother and a third Etheling called Osforth, had under Alfred's will divided between them the royal booklands in Sussex and Surrey. Ethelwald's share comprised Guildford, Godalming, and Steining, all extensive estates, but this endowment by no means satisfied him, and at the very opening of the new reign, he took forcible possession of the newly built borough of Twynham, now Christchurch in Hampshire, and also of an old British fortress which may still be seen at Badbury Rings near Wimburn. Driven out of these by Edward, he fled to the Yorkshire Danes, who received him as if he were a dispossessed king, and offered him their allegiance, being at the moment themselves without a ruler. This led a little later to an alliance between Ethelwald and Eric, king of East Anglia, who had succeeded Guthrum in 890, and the two together, imitating the strategy of Halfdeen thirty years before, marched their forces across the Chiltern country to Cricklade on the Upper Thames, with the intention of raiding Wiltshire. This invasion met with little effective opposition from Duke Ethelred of Mercia, through whose territories it passed, but Edward replied by a bold counterstroke, sending a force from Kent to join the Mercians of London with orders to attack the Danish districts between the River Lee and the River Ouse. The news that the eldermen of East and West Kent, Sigwulf and Sighelm, were ravaging between the Ouse and the well-known dikes which formed such a feature in East Cambridgeshire, soon compelled Ethelwald and Eric to retrace their steps, and this led to a fierce encounter between the two armies at Holm, a hamlet of Biggleswade in Bedfordshire. Footnote. The site of this battle has not hitherto been identified, though the hamlet of Holm figures in Domesday Book in seven entries and lies just in the required position on the old north road. End footnote. The English accounts admit that the Danes won the day, but their victory was a hollow one. Both Ethelwald and Eric were killed, and another Guthrum became king of East Anglia, who almost immediately afterwards made a peace at Ettingaford, in the township of Linslade in Buckinghamshire, on the terms that the old treaty between Alfred and Guthrum of 886 should be reconfirmed, and that the Danes in the diocese of London and Dorchester should abjure heathendom and pay tithes and other church dues to the bishops. This campaign not only rid Wessex of a dangerous Etheling, but convinced the Danes that Edward and Ethelred were firm in their alliance, and that it was no safe matter to attack them. The result was a period of peace for Wessex, during which Edward showed himself no unworthy follower of Alfred as a civil ruler. His first care was to finish his father's new minster at Winchester, known in later days as the Abbey of Hyde, and organize it as a college of clerks. And thither, as soon as the church was finished, he removed Alfred's tomb. Much more important, however, was a scheme pressed upon him by Archbishop Plegmund for increasing the number of the West Saxon sees. This was ultimately carried through in 909 on the deaths of Dean Wolf and Asser, the bishops of Winchester and Sherburne, Plegmund having journeyed to Rome the year before to obtain the sanction of Pope Sergius III. By it, the two ancient dioceses of Winchester and Sherburne were replaced by five smaller ones, 
the bishop's seats being fixed at Winchester for Surrey and Hampshire, at Ramsbury near Marlborough for Berkshire and North Wiltshire, at Sherburne for South Wiltshire and Dorset, at Wells for Somerset, and at Crediton for Devon and Cornwall. These ecclesiastical reforms would by themselves be noteworthy and a credit to Edward. They stand, however, by no means alone, his efforts to put down theft and to improve justice and trade being equally remarkable. For these, we must turn to his laws, especially to the dooms issued at Exeter, which instructed the Witan to search out better devices for maintaining the peace than had hitherto been employed, and to those ordering the king's reeves to hold moots every four weeks, and to see that every man was worthy of folk right. Footnote. One of these dooms deserves special remark, as it contains the only mention of Folkland to be found in the Anglo-Saxon laws. Elsewhere, the term only occurs twice in two land books, dated 858 and 880, dealing with estates in Kent and Surrey. End footnote. This allusion to the moots held by the king's reeves is the first definite indication in the Anglo-Saxon laws of the existence in Wessex or elsewhere of any comprehensive system of local courts for areas smaller than the shires. It does not follow from this that Edward need be regarded as the inventor of these courts, but it shows at any rate that he was active in developing them, a conclusion further borne out by another of his dooms which directs that all buying and selling must take place before a port reeve in a port. Here also we have a novel provision notable for its ultimate effect, for a port or urban center, practically meant in most cases a borough. And so this rule set going a movement which in the end destroyed the military character of the boroughs and converted them into centers of trade and industry. That Wessex could devote itself for a time to internal reform was largely due to the fact that its boundaries nowhere marched with the Dane law, but for Mercia, as a buffer state, the conditions were just the opposite. There, all round the frontiers, there was chronic unrest, so that its duke was kept constantly busy with defensive measures. In 907, for example, he fortified Chester to guard against the Welsh and raiders from Ireland, while in 910 to 11, he had to meet an invasion of Danes from Yorkshire and the Midlands. These bands seem to have ravaged all over the dukedom, one force penetrating to the Bristol Avon, and another across the Severn into Herefordshire. In this emergency, Ethelred naturally turned to his brother-in-law for help, and there followed a pitched battle near Tettenhall in Staffordshire, in which Edward's forces took a prominent part. The result was a great defeat for the Danes, no fewer than three kings, two jarls, and seven holds being slain. In fact, this victory marks the beginning of the reconquest of the Danelaw. Shortly after, Duke Ethelred died, leaving only a daughter to carry on his line. At the moment, his decease made little difference, for his widow Ethelfleda took up the reins of government without opposition, and for nearly eight years, 912 to 919, led the Mercian forces with a skill and energy which few women rulers have ever equaled. In the scanty annals of these years, which speak of her regularly as the Lady of the Mercians, she is always described as the directing mind, and we are not told the names of the men who assisted her. But one cannot help suspecting that at her right hand there really stood her nephew Ethelstan, the heir to the throne of Wessex, who is known to have been fostered and trained in the arts of ruling by Ethelred. For if this supposition may be hazarded, it will account for the ease with which the Mercian heiress was set aside after Ethelfleda's death, and also for the fact that, when Ethelstan came to be king, he seems to have been as much at home in Mercia as in his ancestral dominions. At any rate, throughout Ethelfleda's period of power, there was complete accord between herself and her brother, and her first step was to arrange that Edward should take over the defense of the districts that owed obedience to London and Oxford, these being much more easily protected from Wessex than from the Severn Valley. And then began a long, sustained campaign, carried on over several years by the sister and brother in conjunction, 
with the avowed object of expanding their territories, Edward acting against the Danes from the south and Ethelfleda from the west. Their plan, evidently, was to keep cautiously moving forward on a regular system, erecting boroughs as they went along their frontiers, as Alfred had done in Wessex, to secure their base should they at any moment be forced to draw back. In 913, for example, Ethelfleda prepared for an advance in the Trent Valley by erecting boroughs at Stafford and Tamworth, and Edward for an advance in Essex by building two others at Hartford and Whitham. In 914, the Danes retaliated by a raid on Luton and a foray into Mercian Siltern seat as far as Hook Norton, both of which were easily repulsed by Edward, while further north, Ethelfleda fortified Warwick in ancient Mercia and Edisbury in Westerna. In 915, the appearance of a force of Vikings from Brittany in the Severn Mouth caused some diversion, but Buckingham in Danish Siltern seat was fortified nonetheless, and this led next year to the flight of Thurcatel, Jarl of Bedford, and the capture of his borough. During these events, some of Ethelfleda's energy was being expended on her Welsh frontiers. We hear of a borough which she built at Sherbury in Shropshire and of an expedition into Brecknock, but in 917 she returned to the prosecution of the main scheme and got possession of Derby. This meant that the armies of Northampton and Leicester were placed between two fires, and it convinced their jarls that something must be done. Accordingly, they in 918 stirred up the Jarl of Huntingdon to move his army across the Ouse and entrench himself at Timsford, in the neighborhood of Holm, in the hope of regaining Hendrika. At the same time, they organized attacks on two new boroughs which Edward had just erected, one at Toaster in Middle Anglia and the other probably at Wing near Aylesbury. Neither operation was, however, successful and even the arrival of the King of East Anglia, with considerable reinforcements for the men of Huntingdon, failed to make any difference. Guthrum's intervention, on the contrary, proved his ruin, for Edward made an assault on Timsford and there slew Guthrum and two of his jarls called Toglos and Man. This crushing disaster seems to have taken all the fight out of the Danish leaders. We hear of one or two more encounters in Essex in connection with Colchester and Malden, and then the Danish resistance collapsed, and the various armies, as it were, tumbled over each other in their haste to make terms with the victorious English. The first chief to come in was Thurfirth, the Jarl of Northampton, and he was quickly followed by the captains commanding the armies of Huntingdon, Cambridge, and East Anglia. All alike agreed to submit without further fighting, and took Edward for their protector and lord on the condition that they and their men should retain their estates and enjoy their national customs. At the same time, the army of Leicester, without further fighting, submitted to Ethelfleda. Great must have been the rejoicings throughout Wessex and Mercia at the triumphs of 918, but the next year had even greater events in store. It was opened by Edward marching to Stamford and there receiving the submission of the Danes of Castephen and Holland. There, too, in June, he received the news that Ethelfleda had died at Tamworth. At this juncture, a less confident man might have hesitated what step to take. Not so, Edward. Without loss of time, he marched straight to Tamworth, claiming to be his sister's successor and thereupon the Mercians also agreed to take him as their lord. This settled, he set out for Nottingham and took possession of it, and a little later he received the submission of the men of Lindsay. Finally, embassies arrived from the chief princes of Wales, from Idwal of Gwynedd and Highwell of de Hybarth, the grandsons of Rodri Mar, tendering their alliance. Rarely, indeed, have events moved so quickly. At the beginning of 918, Edward was only one among a great number of princes claiming rule in England. At the close of 919, he was unquestioned superior of all men south of the Humber, as well Danish as English. 
It is natural to ask why the resistance of the Danes in central and eastern England broke down so rapidly after 9-11. Many causes may be assigned to account for it, the more obvious being their total lack of cohesion, no Jarl helped another until it was too late, and the softening of their manners as Christianity made headway among them. It seems also clear that few of the rank and file cared much by whom they were ruled, as long as they ran no risk of losing the fertile lands won by their fathers forty years before. Land hunger had brought the Vikings to England, not desire for national expansion, and so their ideal was peace, plenty, and opportunities for trading, and not political independence. It is well also to remember that, at the very moment when Ethelfleda succeeded her husband, the Treaty of St. Clair sur Epte provided a congenial asylum for the more ambitious and wilder spirits, so that from 911 onwards there was a constant drift of English Danes to Normandy, eager to take service under Rollo in the new Frankish Dane law. A noticeable example of this movement is on record in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which tells how Thurcatel, Jarl of Bedford, made peace in 914, but a year or two later with Edward's assistance, quote, fared over sea with such men as would follow him, end quote. This trend of events evidently was not overlooked by Edward, and fairly accounts for the confident way in which he kept pushing forward. Having reached the Humber and Mersey, he might well have paused for a year or two to consolidate what he had won. On the contrary, in the next year he is found advancing as steadily as ever, bent on regaining for Mercia the northern half of the ancient Westerna, the land betwixt the Mercy and the Ribble, and, in order to control the road from Chester to York, building a fort at Manchester, well within the borders of the Danes of Yorkshire. These Danes had long been a prey to internal dissensions, the old curse of Northumbria, as it were, resting upon them, but they had recently accepted a new king in the person of Regnald of Waterford, an Irish Viking, who had first got a footing in Cumberland, and then spent most of his time in ravaging the territories of Ildred, the High Reeve of Bamborough, and of Constantine the Third, King of Scots, 900-942. Edward's bold advance justified itself more rapidly than he could have hoped. In 920, while building a burrow at Bakewell in Peakland, he received the homage of all who dwelt in Northumbria, both English and Danes, that is to say, of both Regnald and Ildred of Bamborough. Nor was this all. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there also appeared an embassy from Donald of Strathclyde and from Constantine, saying that the whole nation of the Scots was prepared to take the West Saxon for their father and lord. Patriotic Scots have mostly challenged the credibility of the annal which makes this assertion, especially as it later became the basis of the claim put forward by the Plantagenet kings of England to suzerainty over Scotland. It seems probable, however, that the embassy really did come to Bakewell, but meant no more than that Constantine and his neighbors wished to offer Edward their congratulations and pave the way for an alliance. It is quite gratuitous to suppose that they held themselves to be in any way submitting to him as vassals in the feudal sense. In fact, even as regards the Yorkshire Danes, it need not be held that more was meant than that Regnald for the moment wished for peace, and so things remained as long as Edward lived. He died on 17 July, 925, having reigned 26 years. End of section 50section 51 of the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 3, Germany and the Western Empire. Section 51, The Foundation of the Kingdom of England, Part 4, by William John Corbett. Edward was succeeded by his son Ethelstan, 
an equally great organizer and soldier, who ruled for 14 years, 925 to 939. The most striking military achievements of his reign were the actual annexation of the Kingdom of York in 926 on the death of Citric, Regnald's brother, an expedition beyond the Forth in 933 to chastise King Constantine for taking up the cause of Anlof Kuaren, Citric's son, and the crowning battle of Brunenburg in 937, to be located, it would seem, at Burrenswark, an old Roman camp in Annandale, nine miles north of the Solway. By this latter victory, he broke up a great league of Scots, Strathclyde Britons, Irish Vikings, and Danes from Cumberland and Yorkshire, which Constantine had laboriously built up in order to avenge his own wrongs and re-establish a buffer state at York. These triumphs completely cowed Ethelstan's enemies, and for the moment justified him in assuming the vaunting title of Rex Totius Britanniae, which is found on his coinage. They also brought him very great renown on the continent, so that contemporary sovereigns eagerly sought the hands of his sisters, one of them having married Charles the Simple, King of the West Franks, another marrying Hugh the Great, Count of Paris, the father of Hugh Capet, and a third Otto the Saxon, son of Henry the Fowler, who in due time was to found a new line of Roman emperors. Meager as are the annals devoted to Ethelstan's reign in the Chronicle, we can also detect that he applied himself with energy to the work of adapting the institutions which had hitherto served for the government of Wessex and Mercia to the conditions of his greatly enlarged realm. In particular, he set about establishing new local machinery in the districts between the Thames and Welland, which had longest resisted his father's arms. Here, he adopted the borough system invented by the Danes as the basis of a number of new shires, which are marked off from the older West Saxon shires by being named from a central fortress. He also, in all probability, planned a new scheme of hideage for these shires, and further subdivided them for purposes of taxation, police, and justice into a number of smaller divisions of varying size called hundreds, which continued in use till the 19th century. No absolute proof can be given of this inference, but if the hundreds are counted shire by shire, it will be found that they are artificially arranged so as to form a neatly balanced scheme, in all containing 120 hundreds, and this is only likely to have been introduced in some period of resettlement after a crisis such as followed on Ethelstan's accession. The term hundred, moreover, soon afterwards appears in the laws. A table will best show how the hundreds were distributed, that is to say, Oxfordshire, 22 hundreds, was grouped with Buckinghamshire, 18 hundreds, Bedfordshire, 12 hundreds, was grouped with Huntingdonshire, 8 hundreds. These four shires were further grouped together into a division of 60 hundreds. Hertfordshire, 9 and a half hundreds, was grouped with Middlesex, 5 and a half hundreds, and these two shires were in turn grouped with Northamptonshire, 30 hundreds, and Cambridgeshire, excluding the Isle of Ely, 15 hundreds, for a second division of 60 hundreds. These two divisions together comprised 120 hundreds. Similar reorganization was also carried through further east, for in East Anglia and Essex, we can also trace artificial hundred schemes, Essex in 1066 having 20 hundreds and East Anglia 60, distributed in the proportion of 36 to 24 between Norfolk and Suffolk. In Essex, it would seem, there was also a new assessment of hideage, but not in East Anglia, perhaps because that province had not been actually conquered by force. Another side of government to which Ethelstan gave much careful attention was the better maintenance of the peace as inculcated in his father's dooms. His laws on this head, in fact, for their date, are very comprehensive, and it is interesting to find him relying on the feudal relation of lord and man as one means of securing good behavior. He laid it down, for example, that all lordless men were to be compelled by their kinsmen to find themselves lords and that the lords were to be responsible for producing their men if charges were preferred against them. 
As one doom expressed it, every lord was to keep his men in his surety ship, Fide Juicio, to prevent thieving, and if he had a considerable number of vassals, he was ordered to appoint a reeve, Pripositus, in each township to look after their behavior. Another device adopted in Ethelstan's day with the same object was the so-called Frith Guild or Peace Association. This system was set up in the Chilterns and Essex by the advice of the bishops of London and Dorchester and the reeves in those dioceses, but it was also used in other parts. It consisted in grouping men together by tens and hundreds, the members of each group or Frith bore, being mutually responsible for each other's acts and liable to be fined collectively if one of the group committed a wrong and defaulted. The importance of these new expedients is evident, but it must not be supposed that any attempt was made to apply them uniformly all over the realm. One law, indeed, was published prescribing a uniform coinage and fixing the number of moneyers for various towns, but it is clear that in the five boroughs and in the north, Ethelstan, as a rule, let things alone, and was content to act mainly through the leading Danes, who naturally maintained their own customs. For example, in spite of the fact that much of the king's time was devoted to organizing shires and hundreds in the south, the more northern Danish provinces preserved their own analogous organization into ridings, that is, third parts, and wapentakes, their reckoning of money in marks and oars, and their reckoning of land by mantles. The term hundred, indeed, was used in the north, but in quite different ways from its uses in Mercia and Wessex. Beyond the Welland, it either denoted a sum of 120 oars, and was used as an elliptical expression for eight pounds of silver or twelve marks, the oar being a sum of sixteen denarius, or else it was used as a term of land measurement and denoted 120 mantles, the mantle being a unit of cultivation about half the size of the English yardland, ten of them making a plowland, or ten manitow. Similarly, the northern Danes preserved their own tariff of orgelds, which they stated in thrimsus, or units of three denarius, the holes orgeld being 4,000 thrimsus, the jarls 8,000, and an ethelings 15,000. Ethelstan's successor was his half-brother Edmund, a youth of 18, who had fought at Brunenburg. His accession in October 939 was the signal for a tardy attempt to regain independence on the part of the Yorkshire Danes. Led by Wolfston, whom Ethelstan had made Archbishop of York, they set up Onluf Guthfreson, the King of Dublin, as their ruler. By themselves, the men of Yorkshire were perhaps no longer formidable, but the revolt quickly spread to the five boroughs, and this enabled Onluf to cross the Welland and attack Northampton. There he was beaten off, but he soon afterwards stormed Tamworth. He was then himself in turn besieged by Edmund at Leicester. The upshot was a truce by which Edmund acknowledged the Watling Street as his frontier. This was a great loss, but on Onluf meeting his death in Bernicia in 941, Edmund at once fell on Onluf Kuaren, Guthfrithson's cousin and successor, and in 942 he regained the ancient Mercian frontier, which ran from Dor near Sheffield eastwards to Whitwell near Worksop, and so to the Humber. Two years later, Onluf Kuaren fled back to Dublin, and Edmund re-entered York, but feeling himself unequal to maintaining control over the whole of Ethelstan's realm, handed over Cumberland in 945 to Malcolm, King of Scots, 942 to 952, on the condition that he should be his fellow worker by land and sea, and keep in control the unruly colony of Norwegians, who by this time had firmly seated themselves round Carlisle. When not fighting, Edmund seems to have been much under the influence of churchmen, especially of Oda, a remarkable Dane whom he promoted to the see of Canterbury, and of Dunstan, a Somersetshire noble a trifle younger than himself, whom he made abbot of Glastonbury, probably in 943. It is to Oda and other bishops, rather than to the king himself, 
that we must ascribe a measure of considerable importance for the growth of civilization, which is found in Edmund's dooms. This is an ordinance which declared that, for the future, a manslayer's kinsmen, provided they lent the culprit no support after the deed, were not to be held liable to make any amends to the slain man's kin, and conversely that the maith, or kindred of the slain man, were only to take their vengeance on the slayer himself, who was to be treated by everyone as an outlaw and to forfeit all he possessed. Here we have the first recorded attempt in England to put down the time-honored institution of the blood feud and to make each man responsible only for his own acts and to break up the solidarity of the powerful family groups whose feeling of cousinship often reduced the authority of the state to a shadow. Needless to say, the good old custom of following up feuds relentlessly, generation after generation, was at first little abated by this well-meant edict. Its promulgation, however, marks the spread of a civilizing movement which was ultimately to make away with the whole system of private war and war guilds. Another movement which was also making gradual progress at this time, and may perhaps therefore be best mentioned here, though it had begun before Edmund's day and was not completed in his reign, concerns the position and functions of the magnates in charge of the shires. All through the centuries of the Heptarchy and down to Alfred's death, each shire, so far as our information goes, had been ruled by its own shearmen, called indifferently either duke, prefect, or alderman, most of whom were of royal descent. As soon, however, as England began to be unified, a demand for wider jurisdictions arose. A shire apiece had been all that the magnates could expect, so long as their king himself ruled only Wessex or Mercia, but their ambitions naturally expanded in proportion with the growth of the kingdom. As the tenth century advanced, they accordingly pressed Edward the Elder and his sons more and more to abandon the old scheme of one duke to one shire, and gradually succeeded in getting a new system introduced, under which the shires were grouped three or four together with a duke over each group. It must have been a protracted process, changing from one system to the other, but the results as they stood in Edmund's day are clear enough and may be inferred from the lists of magnates who are found attesting his numerous charters. If these be analyzed, it is seen that, apart from Jarls with Danish names, who still ruled districts in the five boroughs and beyond the Humber, the total number of dukes attesting at one time is never more than eight, and these can be distributed with moderate certainty over southern England, in the proportion of three to the counties south of the Thames and five to the Midlands and East Anglia. This change, moreover, carried with it another. The new type of dukes could not always be present to preside in the shire moots. Hence there arose the need for local officials of a lower grade intermediate between the Port Reeves and the dukes, a class who seemed to be referred to for the first time in the laws of Ethelstan and who ultimately came to be entitled Shirgarifan, or Shire Reeves. Footnote. The origin of the sheriffs is by no means clear. The term Shirgarefa is not found in the laws of any of the Anglo-Saxon kings. End footnote. This gradual evolution, it need hardly be pointed out, was not altogether in the best interests of the monarchy, for the new dukes had to be given very considerable estates to support their authority, and this meant that the crown was unable to retain in its own hands sufficient of the newly won territories to guarantee itself the same territorial superiority over the dukes as it had formerly possessed in Wessex. Statistics, of course, cannot be produced to show the precise distribution of territorial influence, but all indications lead to the conclusion that, everywhere north of the Thames, the crown had to content itself with a comparatively weak position, especially in East and Middle Anglia, which, from 930 onwards, were placed in the hands of an Etheling enjoying such a regal endowment that he came to be familiarly known as Ethelstan Half-King. 
Responsibility for this development in the direction of feudalism should probably be laid on Ethelstan's shoulders rather than on Edmund's, for Edmund had little opportunity of reconsidering his brother's policy, his career being cut short by assassination when he was still under twenty-five. He left two sons, Edwig and Edgar, but as these were mere children, the crown was passed on to their uncle Edred, the youngest son of Edward the Elder. This prince was also short-lived, but his reign of nine years, 946 to 955, remains a landmark because it witnessed the last attempt made by the men north of the Humber to reassert their lost independence. In this rising, the Danes were led at first by Anlaf Kuaren, their former king, and finally by a Viking called Eric probably Eric Bloodaxe, son of Harold Fairhair, the unifier of Norway. They also had the support of Archbishop Wolfston, Edmund's shifty opponent, whom the West Saxon house had vainly tried to bind to their cause by a grant of a Munderness, central Lancashire. The chief incidents of the struggle are reported to have been the deposition and imprisonment of Wolfston, the burning of Ripon, and sundry encounters near Tanshelf, now better known as Pontefract, to secure the ford over the river Eyre. In the end, however, Eric abandoned the struggle, and in 954, Edred took final possession of Yorkshire and committed it to Oswulf, the high reeve of Bamborough, to hold as a jarldom. Thus was completed the long process of welding England into a single kingdom, with continuous territories stretching from the Forth to the English Channel. End of section 51